our main aim always to establish an atmosphere of mutual respect through the acknowledgement of our ancestors and the recognition of our right to declare our special place in the pre and post history of the Canberra region. The name Canberra is derived from the name of our people and country, the Yambri, the Canberra. Gazetted on the 22nd of January, 1834, under the New South Wales colonial government. And we've cared for Mother Earth since the dawn of time and evidence of our sovereignty, our ownership and our statehood can be seen everywhere throughout the country. Our signature is in the land. Yinjamara, Yinjamalguju, Yinjamara Boom, Murun Maginya, Yinjamara, Muru Muru, Wirumbira, Nuramango. Living a respectful way of life cares for country. Yinjamara, Wirumbira, Marandu Gobo, Gira Gobo, Yando Gobo, respect is taking responsibility for the now, the past, the present, and the future. It's important that cultural knowledge is passed on from generation to generation and embodies and preserves the relationship with the land. And it's our stories, connections, our language, our songs, uh, that such places as Parliament House uh, and sites as Parliament House uh, protect our story. My great-great-grandfather was a labourer here. My great-great-uncles were labourers here on country as Nyambri, Cambry men. They camped and lived on Currajong Hill, on Russell Hill, uh, our relationship and connection to country is powerful and compelling and governments don't have the right to tell us who we are and where we come from. We determine that. Uh, articles, United Nations rights of Indigenous people uh, need to be acknowledged and respected in this country, especially here in the ACT. Uh, we see our identity being attacked all the time by bureaucracy and government who deny us our own connection to country. We have uh, a long history of fighting for justice and recognition on country. And we can't do that without the help of people, good people, non-Aboriginal people in this country. Respecting language, law, people and country. Respect is in the rivers and the creeks and the breeze quietly moving through country. We want to see our children grow up in a society that acknowledges, respects and honours First Nation people. Uh, we want to see our people entitled to a greater share in the wealth and prosperity of this country. Uh, we were just, uh, we offered uh, 65,000 years of living culture, Nirangil, uh, the importance, Niawe Gunungijil of our identity, uh, our uh, Nina, our focus, our Maramara, our action, and our Wayana, our transformation in this country, which was rejected. The love, respect, the safety, the belonging, the security, uh, the sacrifice, the morals, the values, the nurturing, the shelter, and the caring and sharing were just all rejected by this country. Uh, but we still, we will never stop fighting for justice and equality for our people and country. Uh, so with that, uh, welcome to country. Respect shapes us and lifts up the people. Respect creates people who care for each other. So I invite, I'd just like to invite two people to come up and play a welcome song uh, today uh, on country. So who'd like to come up? Welcome to country. Mandango. Thank you. Right. Oh, two old boyos from yeah, the you, you should have some <laughs> Thank you. 
Right. Well, thank you so much to Paul Giro House uh, for uh, the warmth of that welcome, but also for uh, the leadership that you provide in this community. And I know how grateful we are, particularly at the Australian National University. And uh, I know I could speak for a lot of um, groups, organisations here in Canberra in saying that. Um, I know that uh, Professor Windows has uh, a meeting uh, to go to busy departmental secretary, so I won't um, do my own introduction to the event yet. I'll let Glyn do that, but I will introduce Glyn. Uh, so Professor Glyn Davis is presently secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, um, was previously chief executive officer of the Paul Ramsey Foundation, and before that, of course, vice chancellor of Griffith University and the University of, of, of Melbourne, as well as a leading Australian political scientist. Uh, Professor Davis's books include On Life's Lottery, uh, The Australian Idea of a University, uh, The Australian Policy Handbook, a co-authored book, which is now, I think, is it six editions? Many, many, seven, many, many editions. So a great success. We historians are lucky if we get to the first one. Um, and also The Republic of Learning, Higher Education Transforms Australia, um, which uh, were Glenn's uh, Boyer Lectures of 2010. So thank you, Glenn. Frank, thank you very much. Let me uh, follow Paul in uh, acknowledging the traditional custodians of these unceded lands we meet on, recognise all Aboriginal people uh, with connections to this land in the ACT and region. We are privileged to be on your country uh, and to benefit from the continuing culture and care that you bring to this community. So thank you. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge organisers in Frank Bongiorno um, and Carolyn Hubbock and Stephanie from the Museum of Australian Democracy. I'm really delighted to be invited to speak and also deeply apologetic the traditional way. I then have to leave, but that's how life is. Um, but what better place than this time we are in the history of the government than this time capsule be? Uh, to review. I, I was a doctoral student up the road at the NU. On an election night, I did what any other political science student would do. I travelled out to the Royal Canberra showgrounds uh, to watch the excitement in the tally room. We still had tally rooms then, you remember those perhaps. And I can recall watching the numbers go up on the board and the sort of mounting excitement, the realisation that there was about to be very significant change. And this roar of the crowd when Bob and Hazel walked into the into the tally room. Um, chance of we want Bob bouncing off the walls. Uh, and that was the first of three victories, of course, uh, of three subsequent victories, 84, 87, 1990. By the time he concluded his tenure, Bob Hawke was Australia's then second longest serving prime minister. Now, longevity isn't a prerequisite for significant reform, but it sure helps. Uh, and in nine years in power, Bob Hawke was able to build a policy resume that on his passing in 2019 was acknowledged in a bipartisan way as making one of Australia's great leaders. There were, of course, importantly, the economic reforms, deregulating the economy, floating the dollar. Um, and those reforms, when we look back, gave us a quarter of a century or more of continuous prosperity. They were remarkable. Um, but there was much more to the Hawke government. Medicare superannuation, the Sex Discrimination Act, environmental heritage laws, the unified national system for higher education, the handback of Uluru. And there were some quite high profile failures as well, including the Australia card, an idea whose time came and went very quickly. Uh, and all of those success and failure contain really important lessons. So it's great that this impressive group has come together to reflect on an important period in Australia's political history. Um, I suspect the common theme running through the conversations will be not just what he did, but how Bob Hawke and his colleagues chose to govern, because there was a very interesting and very explicit model about decisiveness, 
but linked to a desire for collaboration and consensus. And this is a complex way of governing, but it's the way they proceeded. A well-run and trusted cabinet was clearly a big part of it. On that memorable night in 1983, um, Bob Bork promised, and I quote, calmness and a sense of assuredness. And soon after, he sought agreement from his colleagues in cabinet on confidentiality, on solidarity, and on collective responsibility. And he confirmed that is how he intended to govern, and it is how he did. He proceeded. It's a discipline that served his government well. Trust was right at the heart of it. Um, he once reflected on this process, and I quote him, uh, that what he wanted to do was allow ministers their heads, not least because they had good heads, but because experience had taught him that talented people work best when they are respected and left alone to do their jobs. It's a really important lesson in, in leadership. Another factor, of course, was a renewed relationship with the public service. Hawke and his ministers recognised the service's important stewardship role. They also saw opportunities for change and they embarked on a very substantial period of Australian public service reform. And the APS of 2023 is still shaped in lots of important ways by the decisions that were made then, including the establishment in 1987 of the Public Service Commission, which continues today. Of course, some of those changes remain contentious. Minister John Dawkins pushed the APS toward a new public management in which the bureaucracy would behave more like a business uh, within the logic of a market. Uh, many services were contracted out, public assets were sold, and departments were slimmed down. And for all the agility and responsiveness that was achieved, there were serious costs to this approach, and they're with us still. Um, and they're lessons that we need to ponder as we think about current APS reform. So it was fascinating as a student to watch all of this from the outside. Well, not entirely from the outside, because back in the early Hawke years, security in this building was rather lax. <laughs> and PhD students like me learned that if we turned up in the evening with a tie and looked purposeful, <laughs> we could walk past the guards at the front and go straight to the non-members bar <laughs> and hang around uh, for evenings. And um, it was enormous fun, basically. <laughs> um, in recent years, it was, it's was it been called the Hoi Poloi restaurant, but it was anything but when back then. Um, it was actually my first experience of talking with ministers about their roles and glimpsing a little of the world of parliamentary politics. Of course, I got a proper grounding years later when I shared an office with Gareth Evans at ANU. Um, but the move up the hill in 1988 meant an end to these encounters. Better security, fewer interlopers, different ways of working when ministers escape this very porous building for the sealed world that is Parliament Hill now where they remain. 40 years on, today is a wonderful opportunity to reflect on an extraordinary period in Australian politics, policy and administration. So I hope like the Hawke government, it proves an extraordinarily rich experience and please enjoy Frank and Carol, thank you very much for the invitation to hear even just a little bit of today's proceedings. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, Ben. Uh, you, you are wearing a tie and looking very purposeful today, too. Well, thank you for that. Um, so, so, I've got just a very brief introduction before we move to our to our keynote. Um, I'm, I'll, you might be wondering where the, um, the title comes from. Um, the title comes from Inside the Hawke Government, the Cabinet Diary by Professor Evans. And I'll read the passage so you can see it in context. The Hawke Keating government is often now seen, even by non Labour people, as the Australian gold standard. As good as it gets in terms of effective leadership, the strength, depth, and diversity of the talent in its ranks, and the quality of its achievements. This is the line I really love. Certainly, it did not always feel that way on the inside, as this diary will make very clear. Um, there were periods during its 13 years in office from 1983 to 1906 when not even its most rusted on supporters could say to swallow it. But from the perspective of distance, it is hard to identify any Australian government before or since that did as well in modernising and liberalising the economy, putting in place major health, education, and welfare reforms, promoting community reconciliation and positioning Australia abroad as a good international citizen. 
Um, there have been previous retrospectives and reappraisals of the Hawke government. There have been many books. There are several biographies of major figures. So you might ask why now? What's well, 40 years? A ruby anniversary, as I reminded myself by Googling this morning. Um, it's reputation and legacy, I guess, and now middle-aged, um, early middle-aged rather than late middle-aged like me. Um, the great difficulties, I think, though, of reform in recent decades have aroused interest in how a government with a reputation for having achieved reform, as Glenn has just said, managed to do that while winning five elections in a row. I recall having a Zoom session with a then rising shadow minister, now a very senior government minister, and her question was how could they have done it? This was the immediate aftermath of the 2019 election, of course. Um, also, I think the pressures on, and some might say decay of democracy, invite us to consider uh, an important era in the country's history of democracy when its institutions showed adaptability, um, they showed resilience, even as they were reformed in ways that have, have I think, bequeathed um, ambiguous legacies, as, as um, Glenn has just hinted. Um, I'd like also to associate myself with the uh, acknowledgements of the traditional owners to again thank Paul, to thank Glenn for those wonderful words we've just heard. Um, I would also just very briefly like to mention, remind people that today is the state funeral for, for Bill Hayden. Um, we've had to do uh, some changes, of course, to the program as, as a result, as a number of people um, are, are there rather than here. Um, but, you know, it's obviously such, uh, I guess, an appropriate time to be remembering that legacy. And I know that um, Gareth will in a moment have a few words to say about that. I, I won't, except to say that I, I think we're all aware of just what a, a major figure he has been in the political history of this country um, and, uh, and, and very much a giant of um, the era that we're reflecting on today. So let me introduce our keynote. Um, Professor Gareth Evans, ACKC, um, following a career as a legal academic at the University of Melbourne, Professor Gareth Evans was elected to the Senate in 1977. He wasn't Professor Gareth Evans then. Um, he held several uh, senior ministries in the Hawke and Keating governments as Attorney General uh, in Resources, Energy, Transport and Communications, and of course, as Foreign Minister. Uh, Professor Evans was centrally involved in detailed transition to government planning, which we'll hear about in a moment, ahead of the election of the Hawke government, and he, he would later lead the government in the Senate. He was elected to the House of Representatives in 1996 and became Deputy Leader. Since retiring from politics, he's had a distinguished career leading the International Crisis Group for about nine years, played a major role in the development and acceptance of the Responsibility to Protect Doctrine, and of course served uh, as Chancellor of the Australian National University for about a decade. His books include Incorrigible Optimist, a political memoir, Inside the Hawke Keating Government, which I've just shown you, The Responsibility to Protect, and with Bruce Grant, Australia's foreign relations. So over to you, Gareth. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Frank, and it's a pleasure to be with you all here today. Uh, as we meet here in Canberra to talk about the achievements of the Hawke government, one of the real architects of its success, Bill Hayden, is being laid to rest in Queensland. And I do think it's appropriate, before we launch into the substance of our discussion, we spend just a few minutes, a few moments rather, recognising, respecting and honouring his incredibly important role. Will emerged from the Whitlam government with a record of really quite heroic accomplishment as Social Security Minister, introducing the single mother's pension and Medibank, which became Medicare. And of course, as Treasurer, doing an enormous amount to restore the kind of financial discipline which had been so conspicuously lacking in his predecessors. He was seen, rightly, as one of the most effective members of the entire Whitlam ministry, certainly the most balanced and some would say the sanest of those who served it throughout. As leader of the opposition in the years leading up to 1983, it was Bill, more than anyone else, who made the ALP electable again. By constructing a visibly highly capable opposition front bench, by overseeing an overhaul of our policy priorities, and by um, supporting a complete rethink 
through a task force on government administration of all the machinery of government issues, including cabinet, outer ministry, caucus, government public service relationships, which desperately needed to be overhauled if we were to avoid in the future the chaotic dysfunction of the Whitlam years. And as foreign minister in the Hawke government from 83 to 88, he was really creative and effective in ways which to which I've often paid tribute um, as his successor. Three big achievements, I think, in particular. He made Australia highly respected uh, and an influential voice in the global peace and disarmament movement, especially in relation to chemical and nuclear weapons. He was accepted as a knowledgeable and constructive voice in Southeast Asia and laid the groundwork, especially in uh, building a close relationship with Vietnam, for what we were able to subsequently achieve in Cambodia. And in our relationship with the United States, while supporting the Alliance, he wasn't quite as willing as some others were to drink the American Kool-Aid, uh, insisting on maintaining our sovereign independent agency in all our policy making. This didn't win him an awful lot of affection in Washington, but it did win Australia respect. Bill was famously quirky, a bit temperamental, and more than a little paranoid, understandably enough, uh, about some of his colleagues. He and I had our differences along the way. But that, I think, comes with the territory in this business. Politics is a bloody and dangerous trade, and ALP politics is probably the roughest of all. I owe Bill a lot, as do all of us in the movement and indeed in the country, and his legacy will be very long lasting. Bill was genuinely great Australian and he'll be very sadly missed. Could I suggest given that this, this is the day of his funeral and burial that we observe just a few moments silence in respectful memory of everything that Bill Hayden achieved. Thanks very much. Well, it's no doubt more than a little presumptuous for someone who's very much part of the action throughout to claim that the Hawke government was as good as it ever gets in Australia. But there are, I think, plenty of objective reasons to support that claim now, as it's already been said and very broadly accepted even by non-Labour people, that the Hawke government of 83 to 91, and indeed the Keating government, which succeeded it until 96, was genuinely gold standard. The Howard-led coalition government, uh, which followed from 96 to 2007, has its supporters for that accolade, but more for its longevity than for any excitement generated by its leadership or for the strength and depth and diversity, the talent in its ranks, or some excellent measures like gun control notwithstanding for the range and quality of its achievements. The Hawke government period was successful on all these fronts not because it lacked the kind of internal tensions uh, between old bulls and younger bulls and multiple strong personalities with competing egos and ambitions uh, that have roiled so many other governments, not least our own Rudd and Gillard Labor successors. It was because these tensions were successfully managed with a high level of mutual respect between cabinet members and commitment to the common cause always operating as a break on self-indulgent personality politics. There are, in my judgment, six main factors which enabled the Hawke government to maintain a strong reformist momentum for as long as it did and deliver as much as it did with as much discipline and coherence as it did. First, and I'll spend longest amount of time on this, there was the quality of its leadership, above all of the prime minister himself. Bob Hawke had, I think, four exceptional strengths. His ability to craft a grand narrative, to connect with people, to operate collegiately, and most unexpectedly, for those who knew only the uh, earlier larrikin, to maintain both personal and institutional discipline. No government survives very long without a clearly communicated philosophy and sense of policy direction. And Hawke understood this from the outset. His initial 1983, reconciliation, recovery, reconstruction, storyline rapidly evolved into a 
more sophisticated narrative built around the themes of dry economic policy, warm and moist social policy, and liberal internationalist foreign policy. Our capacity to sell uh, wage restraint, deregulation, tough economic reforms generally, depended on very much on Hawke's ability, much assisted by Bill Kelty and the ACTU, to persuade both the party and the wider community that our education, health, and superannuation reforms provided a compensating social wage. Hawke's preoccupations um, throughout his leadership were overwhelmingly economic, low foreign defence policy and the environment certainly loomed larger in his later years. As frustrating as um, some of us found the narrowing of narrative focus, as I certainly did as Attorney General, it undoubtedly enabled the Hawke government to present itself throughout as coherently and consistently focused on the main game. Hawke's genuine ability to make others warm to him was a huge strength throughout his career. For someone so often described, not entirely without evidence, as narcissistic, and so willing to tell both opponents and colleagues precisely what he thought of their abilities and arguments, for all that, his capacity to connect, particularly with the broader public, did remain incredible. Partly it was his uncontrived blokiness, empathising with anyone preoccupied with a sport, sex, having a beer, making a buck, which captured an even larger slice of Australia in the 1980s than it probably would now. But that was combined with a genuine intelligence to which less blokey types could also relate. Despite Bob's almost complete lack of interest in less carnal pursuits like art, music, literature, philosophy, or history, on no subject was Hawke anyone's dummy. One attractive feature of his personality was grace in both victory and, as we saw in abundance at the time of his last caucus ballot, defeat. While his battles were always fought with no holds barred, the snarling invective almost always preferred to the verbal rapier, they were, once won those battles, usually followed by great generosity to the losers. The Victorian hard left always accepted. Malcolm Fraser and uh, Bill Hayden were early beneficiaries of that instinct, as were various ministerial colleagues who fell out of favour from time to time. Hawke's consultative and collegiate instincts, which Glenn's already referred, served the government extremely well. Externally, the trademark enthusiasm for summits, gathering all the major interest groups to wrestle with the big national problems, didn't always produce consensus, but did generate respect. Internally, again, as has been said, so long as ministers weren't screwing up or deviating too far from the government's collective storyline, he did let us get on with the job, and make our own running in the media and parliament as we saw fit. And within cabinet, everything was contestable and very often contested. Neither Hawke nor Keating, who followed his example in this respect, always loved the reality of cabinet peer group pressure, but both of them accepted that they were running a Westminster, not a presidential executive system. Hawke acknowledged very early on that unilateral captain's calls um, would never fly. He had many strong ministers in his team, and neither individually nor collectively were we timorous or deferential. Had serious concerns ever arisen about dysfunctional internal process on the scale they did in the first Rudd government, I think it's absolutely inconceivable that we would have been inhibited about confronting the leadership with them. Were our successors to have operated in a similarly robust environment, I think the course of recent Australian political history could well have been very different. The remaining big key to Hawke's success as Prime Minister was the personal and institutional discipline that he brought to the role. If never exactly a candidate for the monastery, um, his lifestyle became almost ascetic, um, certainly by comparison with the exuberance of his boyo days at university and with the ACTU. And he did lead his cabinet colleagues by example, working incredibly long hours, thoroughly reading his briefs and maintaining a disciplined diary. It's true, as Hawke himself was the first to subsequently acknowledge, that he did lose the plot 
for some months in the period leading up to the 1984 election, essentially as a result of his emotional distress over issues associated with his daughter's very publicly known heroin addiction. Most of his colleagues would agree that also that after having set the direction of the government with the storyline that I've already described, he rarely himself generated any of the big new ideas subsequently. But it does defy credibility to suggest, as some have, that he didn't function effectively as leader at any time thereafter, through the long seven years until his departure in 1991. Bob was maintaining close oversight of the whole government agenda. He was keeping the ministry and caucus generally harmonious. He was putting out potentially consuming bushfires and brush fires and being an articulate main face of the government at home and abroad. If he hadn't been all these things, his leadership would have been successfully challenged much earlier than it was. All of us, of course, were well aware of the tensions that were emerging quite early on between Bob and Paul Keating, and I've documented them in my published Cabinet Diary, to which uh, Frank referred. But it was many years before those tensions reached anything like explosion point. Overwhelmingly, the two of them did have a brilliantly complementary relationship, which did indeed end up, although with a few bumps along the way, being mutually and equally gracefully acknowledged. But one can't talk about the leadership quality of the Hawke government without giving almost equal weight uh, to the role of Paul Keating. He played an absolutely central role as treasurer from 83 to 91 in making the Australian economy what it is today, outward looking, highly productive, highly competitive, continually growing, but still more equitably and socially protective than most. True, he did take a few months to fully find his feet in the job, a period during which the early path-breaking announcements like floating the dollar should be seen as very much shared uh, decisions between Hawke and Keating rather than either's property. But thereafter, Keating really was the key driver of all the big economic achievements that follow. National competition policy, which drove growth, trade liberalisation, which drove competitiveness, enterprise bargaining, which drove productivity, and compulsory superannuation, which generated not only improved retirement security, but massive new national savings. There were inevitably more than a few bumps again and disappointments along the way, but the economic record speaks for itself. Throughout his career, Paul was a larger than life, and I suspect rather globally unique combination of statesman, aesthete, showman, and street fighter. What I once described to an American friend in terms to which he could culturally relate is a combination of Franklin Roosevelt, Leonard Bernstein, Benny Bruce, and Mike Tyson. <laughs> he also was and remains a very engaging human being, not remotely as arrogant as his public image, uh, actually in many ways warmer and funnier uh, than Hawke, more genuine in his friendships albeit not without some black Irish darkness and oversensitivity to perceived slights, which in his post-retirement years has occasionally unhappily soured relationships with some previously close colleagues and friends. But working alongside and under Keating in his platinum years was never, ever a dull moment. Paul Keating's two greatest strengths as political leader were a clear sense of strategic direction that underlay everything that he did and said, and above all, his unrivaled capacity to communicate at every relevant level. He could be uproariously earthy uh, with his colleagues, but he could also be solemn, statesmanlike, deeply moving. As with when he finally became prime minister in his own right, he showed with his Redfern speech in 92, and his tribute to the unknown soldier at the Australian War Memorial in 93. But Paul could be uh, passionately persuasive and convincing cabinet or party room or sceptical journalists of the merits of a policy argument. And he could be absolutely scintillating, of course, in using the parliamentary chamber to wear down his opponents, not least because his weapon of choice, uh, not invariably, most of the time, was the stiletto rather than the cudgel. E even some of his cruelest lines 
ones we all remember, they had a certain wit and elegance about them. I'm going to think of his description of Malcolm Fraser in 1982, an Easter Island statue with an ass full of razor blades. <laughs> or the famous response to Andrew Peacock returning as Liberal leader in 89, you know, can a souffle rise twice. Or I think less remembered, but really worth remembering, these dazzling um, extended riff responding to John Howard's claim that the 1950s was a golden age, suggesting that, with Paul suggesting that Howard's and Hewson's proper place was in a museum, alongside the other icons of that age, the Morphe Richards toaster, the Qualcast mower, and the AWA radiogram. In a line which sadly doesn't seem to have been remembered or made its way into the public record at all, I do remember personally Paul also once describing, I think it was John Howard, but it could have been any of a number of other Tories, describing as having, quote, all the charm of a used suppository. <laughs> Paul will be and uh, has been, always will be, uh, a pretty hard act to follow. <laughs> and Paul's partnership with Bob Hawke for all the years it lasted was and remains the most productive partnership in Australian political history, I think. I can be much briefer about the remaining factors which, in my judgment, feed the gold standard narrative, because all five of them really follow, in one way or another, from the first, the, the quality of the leadership that we had. The second factor in my list was that we maintained throughout a clear philosophy, a clear sense of policy direction and narrative. As I've already described, it, its essence was to be very dry in our economic policy, very compassionately moist in our social policy, and very liberal internationalist in our foreign policy with the concept of the social wage delivered mainly through health education and superannuation gains being at the heart of our capacity to sell wage restraint, deregulation and tough economic reform generally to the wider community. We never, almost never, let politics drown good policy, certainly in the crucial area of economic policy, because we were confident of the strength and coherence of the policy we were making the Rudd and Gillard governments really struggled to recreate anything as compelling, torn as I think they pretty obviously were between old industrial labour preoccupations, the new environmentalism and capitulating to popular anxiety on issues like asylum seekers. I think the Albanese government is doing a lot better, but still working on finding its collective voice quite as coherently. Thirdly, we had a very decent governing process, as Glenn has already foreshadowed, and we stuck to it. Hawke was determined to avoid the manifest dysfunction of the Whitlam government and picking up the recommendations of the pre-83 election task force on transition to government, in which I, with Bill Hayden's very strong support then as leader, along with colleagues like John Button and Neil Blewett and Susan Ryan, was very much involved, that uh, task force exercise ensured from the outset was, which was accepted in its entirety, its conclusions by Bob Hawke when he became leader, that ensured from the outset that important ground rules were observed about cabinet, outer ministry, ministry caucus, executive public service, and ministerial office uh, relations. Good cabinet process involving prior consultation with all relevant portfolios and interests was rigorously followed. Outcomes were practically never completely stitched up in advance, albeit not in many cases uh, for want of trying. The contrast, I think, in this respect with, again, the, the Rudd government is really quite instructive. The Rudd administration successfully and indeed brilliantly navigated the fast-moving global financial crisis with the prime minister and a small inner group bypassing traditional cabinet processes to do so. But with the Crisis over, the bypassing continued, increasingly by the Prime Minister alone. Genuinely collective decision-making can be a painfully difficult process, but in governance, as elsewhere, there is wisdom in crowds. I think the Albanese government, to its credit, has started very much with that perspective. I just hope a few early warning signs to the contrary, notwithstanding that it will continue to operate in that way. Fourthly, we operated internally on the basis of argument rather than authority. 
Observing formal process can be meaningless if there's not genuinely free discussion of difficult substantive issues. We genuinely debated everything out, often very fiercely, and in language which reflected the strength of views held, and didn't just succumb passively to the exercise of leadership authority. The Prime Minister may have been first among equals, but only just. One example of that dynamic at work was the Cabinet debate on an expenditure review committee proposal to reduce Medicare payments in order to save $80 million from the forward estimates, which I describe in my Cabinet diary entry for 9th of May 1985, and I think it's worth quoting in full because it will give you the flavour of those internal dynamics. The rationale for the proposal, which blew it a demand to be brought to the full Cabinet, was put by Hawke Keating, Walsh and Dawkins, in terms of the need for there to be a real margin in Tuesday's statement because of the squishiness of a number of the items. Blewett's case against all this was extremely strongly mounted, with him, for the first time that I can recall, barely concealing his anger at the stupidity of it all. Grimes supported him strongly on equity and medical politics grounds. As the debate went on around the room, it became apparent that only Lionel Bowen supported the ERC expenditure review committee position. Ralph Willis put the case strongly on the basis of the negative impact of the proposal on the accord, while West and Howe and Young all focused on the equity issues, and Kieran said it was just politically crazy. Stuart West and I were probably the most vociferous of the opponents, which earned us lots of schoolmasterly displeasure from Hawke. He was, as very often when a debate is going against him, very petulant and snappy, quick to resort to school ground abuse of the you're just wanking yourself variety and extremely crude misrepresentations of opposing arguments. I found the whole thing just crazy beyond words, saying at one point this wasn't a brave proposal, but a crazy brave proposal. Unfortunately, this view was so obviously shared by a majority around the table that eventually Hawke and Keating had to capitulate. In the event, it was agreed that the ERC would go away and try to patch together a number of lesser and less extreme alternative saving options amounting to the same general level. There's just one other very memorable example which I want to share with you of Hawke being first among equals, but only just. An example, I think, quite possibly unique in the annals of the Westminster system. Although Hawke was famously punctilious about starting meetings on time, and famously regular in lambusting Paul Keating for his indifference to that constraint. One way he kept that record intact was by regularly rescheduling uh, cabinet ministers at the last minute when he found himself with something more urgent to do. On the day in question, I've forgotten precisely when it was, it was sometime in the late 80s after I finished that diary, cabinet had been called then postponed in the morning, then called and postponed again in the afternoon, then finally called again for 6.15 p.m. We were all milling around the cabinet ante room when the message came through that the prime minister was still preoccupied and that was it for the day. Although as before, there was no obvious crisis running of the kind that would make that understandable. About six of us then said, more or less in unison, let's go ahead and have the bloody thing anyway, which we duly proceeded to do. With the result that Bob rather sheepishly joined us about 20 minutes later. The rebellion did not extend to dealing with anything particularly contentious in the boss's absence, but the point was made and accepted. As already said, neither Pork nor Keating, who followed his example in this respect, always loved the, the reality of cabinet peer group pressure, but both of them accepted, and this was crucial to the success of this government, both of them accepted that they were running a cabinet, not a presidential imperium. Fifth, we really did listen and consult with the relevant stakeholders on every major policy issue, starting with the famous summits of the early years. I can't help but personally compare and contrast the lengths we went to in order to get up the petroleum resource rent tax and the resource rent royalty, which I negotiated, with the history of the mining tax under our Labor successes. We respected and welcomed the advice of the public service, not just in policy implementation, but in conceptualization and design. And we all had at least as many public servants seconded to our ministerial offices as political and personal staff, an approach which unhappily has not found nearly as much favor 
with later governments of either colour. It's also worth mentioning in this context that most ministers, starting right at the top, were willing to appoint well-weathered advisers, able and willing to remind them as often as necessary of their mortality. Self-confidence uh, bordering on hubris is almost a necessary condition for high political office. And if that is not occasionally punctured, things are bound to end in tears. Sixth and finally, we explained and argued the case for everything we did with Hawke and Keating, both really outstanding communicators, and Paul in particular, absolutely remorseless in his determination to ensure that the major opinion molders knew what we were trying to do, why and how. If the focus groups told us we had a problem, that was the beginning of the public argument, not the end of it. The notion that we didn't have to communicate all that hard because we were given a bipartisan dream ride by an acquiescent coalition and an accommodating Senate is a comforting fantasy. There was, for a start, intense opposition to the major social wage measures, including compulsory superannuation and the introduction of Medicare, which made some of our really tough productivity and competition-boosting measures deliverable, as I've said. And I personally need no reminding at all of just how much coalition hostility we had to overcome to win the argument on big socio-cultural issues like Mabo, native title. It's reasonable to ask whether the Hawke Keating government experience is repeatable today. It's true that we did not have then some of the technology driven 24 seven media pressures that present governments are under. Nor do we have to contend with populist sentiment of the kind that has now exploded in Europe and the United States and is becoming increasingly visible in Australia. Nor do we have to contend with quite so numerous and flighty a set of cross benches. In all sorts of ways, it is clearly now tougher than it's ever been for governments to deliver on good policy outcomes. Whether it's not just difficult, but impossible to do so in the present global and emerging local environment, or whether there are still grounds for optimism that we can do better, is, I guess, the question that we sh should be most preoccupying us as we track back now over the Hawke government legacy. We can't just assume as some of the we can't just assume away some of the profound differences between the current political environment, both domestic and international, today as compared with 40 years ago. New listening is going to be required to understand why people are reacting as they are. New thinking is going to be required to craft new policy approaches to the issues that are really resonating with the disaffected, above all, being seen to seriously address the central concern that no one be left behind. A new acting, new style of acting, I think, is going to be required, bringing a style to the business of politics which is less brazenly confrontational, more cooperative and consultative, but also more courageous. It's a long argument, but my own strong view is that if close attention is paid to all the six reasons that I've identified, which in my judgment at least made the Hawke government the success that it manifestly was, quality leadership, clear philosophy, decent formal governing process, real internal contestability, genuine consultative style, and effective communication. If we can do all that, I think the cause of consolidating a really genuinely functional liberal democracy, of which all Australians can be genuinely proud, is not lost. But then I would say that, wouldn't I? Thank you. Thank you, Gareth, um, for a marvellous paper. We do have some time for questions. So if you have a, a question, please raise your hand and I shall come around with a microphone. Uh, oh, there we go. Carolyn's going to come around with a microphone. Even better. So questions. Yes, it's Mark. Thanks. If you could introduce yourself too, that would be great. Thank you. I don't have an uh, amplification here, so hopefully everyone can hear me. Oh, it's on now. Um, Mark Kenny from ANU, from the Australian Studies Institute, and obviously a political journalist. I'm very interested in many aspects that you raised there, Gareth. It was a particularly uh, uh, entertaining and insightful analysis and really enjoyed it. I think that was the, the mood in the room as well. Um, 
I'm, of course, particularly interested in your assessment about, um, I think you touched on this with, with talking about explanations, the ability to explain, but also the, the media preoccupation of politics now. Yes, there are technological differences, the 24-7 media environment, the, 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 the sort of contemporaneous nature of political coverage, which I think is often overlooked. But in, it's my observation that there, there just aren't the explainers and there is an over, and there has been over a period of, uh, over a succession of governments since then, um, a tendency of governments to be driven by their media strategy rather than the other way around. I wonder if you could... Uh, reflect on that well that's supremely obviously the case i mean one one example of what's gone the way of all flesh is the morning doorstop um which was a lot of fun for everybody involved and occasionally got us into immense amounts of trouble me not least i remember one occasion i said you know john howard's just in the business of bashing blackfellas and you know that exploded because i'd used the the b word which even though i've been talking to blackfellas and about blackfellas all my life um da -da -da. i mean we were capable of running off the rails because we were freelancing a lot of the time rather than working to daily talking points prepared by the media office with nobody allowed to stray one half syllable beyond them. And that has its risks, but it also has its, um, you know, it gives a sense of confidence to the individual ministers. It gives people the capacity to be and be seen to be performing as a total collective rather than just a, a single, you know, presidential focal point and i think it's 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 just very much much healthier uh for the overall environment it's um yeah it's also a lot less boring i think for everyone involved so i don't know whether we can ever get back to it i mean the you know that that particular style of communication discipline uh, seems to be absolutely entrenched on both sides of politics and all around the country now uh and you know the media hasn't particularly helped it by its own preoccupation with gotcha moments and personality politics and you know elevating the trivial over the substantive and you know i think there's a there's a bit of a moat in the eye for, from many sections of the media to contemplate if they're worrying why governments are now behaving as they are but uh, i don't unfortunately see much chance of, of that changing it just you know but if you can get back to that far more willingness to, to freelance it, to articulate, to talk to journalists, to explain, not just to give them a set of talking points, why we're doing something, to background on the basis of the background will be genuinely respected. And it's an exercise not in self-aggrandizement, but in genuinely trying to, you know, explain what something's about, what the dynamics were, what the pressures were, what the counter pressures were, what we we're trying to do. I think all of that makes for a lot healthier democracy. And uh, if we we can if we can recreate even just a little bit of that, it'd be terrific. But don't hold your breath. Nicholas Brown, ANU. Thank you, Gary. Um, I was really struck by those last formulations you gave about what governments might need to do in the future to achieve greater success in terms of new listening. In 1983, who did you feel you most needed to listen to in shaping that message? There's a lot about the reforms you wanted to roll out, but who were you listening to? Who did you feel most needed to be listened to in that reform agenda? That's a very interesting question. I think um, Bob's himself was so attuned, you know, to the wider Australian community, the ordinary run-of-the-mill Joes and the ordinary run-of-the-mill jobs with their preoccupations, their anxieties about you know, social welfare and everything else. But he was also extraordinarily capable of interacting with listening to the top end of town. Uh, the role that he played at the ACTU all those years, formal institutional labour movement and interactions with government. I, I mean, it, it sounds a bit wet to say it, but I think we were, we were, we were really genuinely listening to everybody. I think we were listening to the um, Indigenous community and in the way that um, you know, previous governments had, had been... With Malcolm Fraser, I think, personally, honourably accepted. Um, there was never a racist bone in Malcolm's body, as I've often said publicly. But that's not true of his, uh, many of his colleagues, his generation. Uh, and I think, you know, so those minority voices in the country, the mainstream mainstream community voices and the, um, and the business voices, they, they were all part of the reason why I think we were able to effectively bring things together and stitch together policy, which wasn't just obviously seen as pandering to one particular segment rather than the other. 
Yeah, in that respect, I've already said it in passing, I'll say it again, we owe a huge debt to Bill Kelty and the ACTU because it was the leadership of the ACTU, you know, taking over from Bob himself, that did absolutely understand the necessity to get these you know, sort of cooperative solutions working properly and did very much uh, help us create that concept of the social wage with all the trade-offs that it involves, which, which made things all come together. So, um, yeah. That was it. We're, we're all conscious of the of the need to listen to everybody. Yeah. Of which achievements are you most proud? First, of your government and the side of the policy of the world. Well, of the foreign policy stuff, I suppose a few things sort of speak for themselves. The Cambodia peace settlement, the role that we were able to play with the Chemical Weapons Convention, the role that we were able to play in creating regional dialogue, architecture, APEC, ASEAN Regional Forum, and so on, all that stuff, uh, I think, speak, to which, again, I acknowledge the, the legacy that I enjoyed from, from Bill Hayden. I think that, that posture, that liberal internationalist posture, that degree of total commitment to the region, and the, the fierce sort of independence with which we carved out all that sort of territory, not uh, not rolling over to the blandishments uh, from the United States. There's, there's that stuff. I think uh, domestically, the, the achievements that uh, I'm in many ways proudest of were Native Title Act. That was less Bob Hawke, of course, than, than Paul Keating. Um, Bob was always a little bit wobbly on these issues. He was very sentimentally attached to the Indigenous cause, as Peter, I think, would, would acknowledge, but equally very firmly attached to Brian Burke, WA Inc. and the mining lobby, and uh, we didn't get the results that we would have liked um, in that period. But um, look, the, the, the big economic stuff um, really does you know, speak for itself. I mean, as has been said, the, some of the issues in privatization or you know, deregulation of the economy were highly contested at the time and still subject to a degree of moroseness from, from various um, segments of our movement in particular. But this was really what lifted Australia up into the, the serious ranks of the economically viable and growth players. So, you know, that, that's the stuff that, that matters in, in retrospect, I think. But um, some of the, the big symbolic things do sort of matter. And I mean, just, just the way in which, which Hawke, you know, it was a bit of a cliche that three hours business recovery, reconstruction, whatever it was, um, rehabilitation. Uh, but, you know, just that, that sense, I'm here to find common ground with you rather than to impose our particular view of the world, shove it down your neck. I mean, that that's probably, the, in many ways, the biggest achievement of all, you know, which did survive most of the government years, that, that sense that we were, we were genuinely listening and genuinely trying to produce results that work for everybody in the Australian community. And uh, anyway, we, we can argue about the individual bits and pieces, but that's, that's my take on it. Well, I think we're probably um, out of time, but I would like to thank you guys for um, coming on this way and for a wonderful away. Thank you. Right. Well, thanks. That's the end of that session. Now, we don't have morning tea yet. We have another session. We will need a minute or two just to collect ourselves because we have a Zoom presentation from Troy Brabston, who is at um, at Bill's uh, state funeral today in, in Ipswich. So we'll just need a minute or two. Um, oh, yes, you're quite right, Carolyn. We should present that. Yes. Some clonicilla to Gareth. So thank you very much for being our keynote. Um, there you go. <laughs> Seriously, thanks, you. It was joked when the second lockdown occurred in Canberra in 2021 that the, the city's public servants and academics were all descending on the, the bottle shops to collect their clonicula. So there you go. Um, okay, so we just, yes, uh, Josh will come up as, as chair and we'll just need a minute or two to get ourselves together with Troy and our other presenter is Maria Tafaga. So thanks. Yeah, Troy's Slides here. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Thanks. No slides. No slides. Oh, it's just like the slides. Um, here we go. Maria, she wants it. Um, they're ready to go. Great. So we're all straight in. Okay. Thank you. 
Great. All right. Well, we will begin our second session of the morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joshua Black, and it's a, a privilege to be chairing this session, which is about the art of governing and the art of opposing. Um, so, so let's get straight into things. Uh, our first speaker in this particular session is Troy Bramston, who will be familiar to all of you, I'm sure, uh, as a senior writer and columnist at the Australian newspaper. He's the author and editor of 11 books, including three prime ministerial biographies, one on Paul Keating, one on Robert Menzies, and most recently and very successfully on, on Bob Hawke himself. He's currently working on a biography of Gough Whitlam, and as has been said, he's zooming in very generously from Ipswich, where he's attending the state funeral of Bill Hayden today. Troy will talk about the art of government, and uh, over to you, Troy, if you can hear us. I can hear you. Can everyone hear me there okay? Um, well, thanks very much, uh, Josh, and it's terrific to be part of this conference. I want to acknowledge uh, Frank and Carolyn for putting it together. Um, and as, been, as, as has been mentioned, I'm um, in Ipswich at Bill Hayden's funeral, otherwise I would have been there with you all. Um, let me begin. Um, when Bob Hawke led Labor to power in 1983, his ambition was to unite and reconcile the nation after years of division and confrontation with the promise of consensus. He wanted to end the policy stagnation and transform Australia's economic, social, environmental and foreign policy settings for a new age. And he wanted to lead a Labor government of longevity. <clears throat> so let's consider the achievements briefly. Medicare, the Sex Discrimination Act, doubling high school completion rates, overhauling universities and targeting welfare to those most in need, the float of the dollar, the accord to moderate wages, uh, dismantling the tariff wall, financial sector deregulation, and the first budget surpluses since the 1950s, saving the Daintree, Kakadu and the Franklin River. Hawke also played an important role on the world stage as a mediator between East and West. He developed close relations with Cold War leaders. He strengthened the Australia-US alliance, and he made enmeshment with Asia a priority, as he called it. His personal diplomacy helped to safeguard Antarctica from mining, and he also helped to lead the fight against South African apartheid and initiated the APEC Trade Forum. While this policy legacy continues to shape Australia, and I believe is unmatched by any other recent prime minister or government in recent decades, Hawke also set the gold standard for how a prime minister should lead the nation, their government, and also their party. So this model of governing that Hawke established, I think, is an underrated aspect of his legacy. And so in this paper, I want to examine how Hawke understood and applied the art of power through the institutions in his orbit to support his agenda and leadership. I'm going to focus on the Prime Minister's office, the Prime Minister's department, the Cabinet and the Labor caucus and party organisation. Leadership politics and power and the institution of the Prime Ministership has been a focus of mine since writing my Honours and Masters degree theses. I've written three prime ministerial biographies, as Josh mentioned, and I'm now writing a fourth. I've interviewed 10 prime ministers in or out of office, including Bob Hawke, and so this paper draws on those interviews with him and also my recent biography. Let's begin with the old Bob Hawke. Most of Hawke's parliamentary colleagues thought he would never be prime minister, let alone a highly disciplined one. They knew all too well the 1960s and 70s womanising and serial adultery, the excessive drinking and emotional outbursts, which usually manifested as either anger or tears. The signs were not encouraging. Hawke was flawed, and he acknowledged his failings as a husband and as a father. But he set out to prove that he could be an effective prime minister, which had long been his ambition. And so his life became a redemption story of its own. And when he was elected to parliament in 1980, he had already given up drinking, his emotions were mostly restrained and the womanising was reduced, but not entirely eliminated. Indeed, he continued to have affairs when he was Prime Minister with multiple women. But when he did become Labor leader and Prime Minister in 1983, the old hawk from the 1960s and 70s was almost entirely relegated to history. 
And perhaps it should not be completely surprising because as ACTU president, ALP president, and as a member of the Reserve Bank Board and other inquiries, he had a good grounding in public administration and management. He had learned how to chair a meeting and a conference, work effectively with political and union colleagues, engage with business leaders, deal with financial matters, manage staff, and also prioritise his time. Hawke's academic experience also helped. He earned degrees at UWA and Oxford and studied at ANU. Oxford especially, I think, had a notable impact on Hawke that has also not been fully recognised. It shaped his work ethic, his liberal values, his debating style and how he related to others. While the Labor government between 1983 and 1991 traded on Hawke's popularity, reaching a 78% approval rating in 1984, he had to master the machinery of government to be effective. So he learned from the mistakes of the Whitlam government in administration, in communication, the timing and sequencing of policy and in cabinet and party management. He also had to change the Labor Party by retuning its philosophy for the modern era, transforming its governing culture and making it electorally dominant. He made the party fit for purpose, winning elections and staying in power. Let's talk about the Prime Minister's office. Hawke had a very clear idea about how he wanted his prime ministerial office to function. He'd seen the Whitlam and Fraser prime ministerial offices up close. So he wanted a senior public servant to lead the office with a division between administrative policy, media and political functions. He wanted well-defined responsibilities and also lines of accountability. Hawke told the head of the Prime Minister's Department, Sir Geoffrey Yeand, on the Sunday after his election win in 1983, that he would appoint Graeme Evans from Treasury as his principal private secretary. This came as a bit of a surprise in the public service. But Hawke had met Evans when he was attached to the Australian Embassy in Washington in 1980. Hawke was so impressed with Evans that he canvassed joining his future staff. Hawke was not even in Parliament at this point. And by 1982, Hawke had also sounded out Jeff Walsh, Bob Hogg, Peter Barron and Graham Frudenberg about joining his staff when he became leader and prime minister. But Evans was the essential figure in Hawke's administrative success. He presided over a well-organised and highly efficient office. He set the template for the next nine years. Evans was succeeded by Chris Connie Bear, Sandy Holway and Dennis Richardson as principal private secretary. All of them were senior departmental officers. Policy advisors were almost always drawn from senior ranks of the public service. Media advisors were former journalists. Political advisors had long experience in and around politics and campaigning. Hawke worked long, at, long hours. He was disciplined and focused with his work. He placed a premium on reading every cabinet submission, was across the media and accessible to staff and ministers. He simply devoured the job, balancing it with golf, tennis and horse racing. He would often blaze a cigar and work alone while working on submissions, briefs, cables and reading newspapers for hours on end. He had a clean desk policy. And when they moved up the hill to New Parliament House, Hawke's routine and style did not change. Let's talk about the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Hawke began the transition to government the day after he led Labor back to power. The contrast with the Whitlam government, though, was total. There were no quick ministerial swearings in, no urgent removal of public servants, no rapid changes of policy, no rush of announcements. It was focused, methodical, process-driven, and Hawke trusted the public service and wanted to work with them. And this is what he conveyed to Sir Geoffrey Yeen. It is a cliche, but Hawke did welcome frank and fearless advice from public servants. He believed a cooperative and respectful relationship with public servants was essential for good government. So public servants were valued for their knowledge and advice and they worked seamlessly with his office and other ministerial offices. Hawke also identified a different focus for his department that was less interventionist and more focused on policy and program coordination. This, in fact, reflected his personal approach to the prime ministership. He reduced the department's policymaking role and used it to coordinate work as a lead central agency. He had the department undertake specialist initiatives such as managing women's policy, science, Indigenous reconciliation, and looking after big events such as policy summits, COAG meetings and APEC. He worked closely with Yeend and also Mike Codd as departmental heads. 
Hawke also took an interest in the structure and operations of government. After the 1987 election, Hawke unveiled a major restructure of departments. It was the brainchild of Mike Codd. Cabinet ministers would now be in charge of major departments with junior ministers outside cabinet assisting them. This represented a quite significant change to the machinery of government and was intended to make the public service more responsive and efficient and allow ministers to focus on strategic directions and priorities. Again, this fitted with Hawke's personal governing style. In terms of the cabinet and the ministry, Hawke was regarded by those he served with in cabinet as the chairman of the board. He was a good manager of cabinet and he provided strategic direction. Paul Keating, the dynamic treasurer, described himself to me as the CEO of the government. They were, for the most part, a great duo, but there was a rivalry between Hawke and Keating, which later spectacularly exploded, but there was also a curious mix of respect and affection. Their styles, Hawke more collegiate, Keating more combative, complemented each other. They were almost always united on policy and political strategy. But the success of the government was not only due to its two leading members. Indeed, Liberal leader John Hewson said the Hawke cabinets were the best since Federation. This was Bill Hayden's great gift to Hawke. He had remade Labor's front bench in opposition and improved its management and policy making, which uh, Gareth Evans referred to. So the first cabinet was extraordinarily diverse in their backgrounds, education and work experiences. There were trade unionists such as Hawke, Keating, Ralph Willis and Gordon Scholes, a shearer in Mick Young, a doctor in Don Grimes, a farmer in Peter Walsh, a policeman in Bill Hayden, lawyers such as Lionel Bowen and John Button, a school teacher in Susan Ryan and an academic in Gareth Evans. Several had ministerial experience such as Hawke, sorry, such as Keating, Hayden and Bowen, not Hawke, um, or had served on the backbench in government such as Willis, Scholes, Grimes, Walsh and Young. In time, the ministry would include three Rhodes Scholars, Hawke, Kim Beasley and Neil Blewett. Bowen had served in World War II, Young had been Labor's National Secretary and Scholes had been Speaker of the House of Representatives. Most had working class or middle class backgrounds. And so this diversity of background and experience, I think, helped in developing the government's agenda, considering the impact of policies and how they would be received. Hawke was supremely confident, but he was secure enough in himself that he could share power. He was not interventionist with ministers. He was consultative and collaborative, and he let ministers run their portfolios. He said he would only intervene with ministers if they asked for his involvement or had an issue that had a whole of government impact. It's also worth noting the immense authority of the Expender Review Committee, which became the engine room of government, and its decisions were rarely challenged in Cabinet. In Cabinet, Hawke often let debates run in pursuit of consensus and he allowed ministers to have a say but would intervene on critical issues from time to time. Debates were often robust, but Hawke kept the government largely united. The debate over mining at Coronation Hill in 1991 was a rare example where I think Hawke insisted on getting his way despite not having majority Cabinet or indeed caucus support. There were a few ministerial changes in the first two terms, but Hawke did insist on discipline and he had no qualms about dispensing Stuart West and Mick Young for breaches of solidarity and probity. Two critical changes in Labor's rules and culture assisted Hawke as Prime Minister. First was an outer ministry, unlike the Whitlam government. This meant that decision making was consolidated among a smaller group of ministers in Cabinet. And second, Cabinet ministers were bound by the principle of solidarity, which meant that they could not challenge cabinet decisions in the wider caucus. So this happened much during the Whitlam government. And also later on with faction leaders in cabinet, this helped to quell any caucus dissent or much, much caucus dissent. In terms of the caucus and the party, Hawke had significant authority within the government due to his election victories and his popularity for most of the period which meant that he was rarely challenged by Labor MPs. He was attentive to backbench MPs and he made himself and his staff accessible. He travelled widely and he made the effort to visit electorates with local members alongside him and also to attend party functions when he could. As Hawke's popularity waned, though, and Keating launched a leadership challenge in 1991, relations with caucus became fraught and he eventually was defeated in a second leadership ballot that year, narrowly, though. And I think this was more due to Keating's ambition 
um, than Hawke's inattentiveness to caucus. The faction system in this period also became more formalised and disciplined. So this meant that Hawke could use party leaders initially, such as Lionel Bowen, John Button and Don Grimes, to deal with tricky issues, and later on faction leaders Graham Richardson and Robert Ray, Jerry Hand and Nick Bolkus and Peter Cook. Hawke was in regular contact with party secretaries Bob McMullen and Bob Hogg and Rod Cameron as the party's pollster, along with Margaret Gibbs, who reported on focus group research. During campaigns, they worked seamlessly with the Prime Minister's office. Hawke regularly attended Labor's national executive meetings. He also had to navigate party conferences to an endorsement for key policy initiatives and could rely on a combination of the right and centre-left factions to prevail, sometimes very narrowly, often over the recalcitrant left faction. Hawke had a long history with the party organisation. He knew how to navigate its complex structures. He knew the personnel and how they operated. And so this also helped, I think, to support his leadership in government. So in making some conclusions about the Hawke style, I think how a prime minister uses the institutions within their orbit is elemental in how a government implements its policy, the legacy it leaves and whether it's re-elected. So in short, leadership matters. And I think the personal style that Hawke brought to the prime ministership was critical in how his office, cabinet, the public service, the Labor caucus and the party organisation operated. It's not simply enough to have these operations, have, have these organisations and institutions running. Um, there has to be a combination of that personal style. So the art of politics must run parallel with the art of government to be effective and successful. A couple of other things. Hawke was also a good communicator and often a powerful persuader. He's a very good, he was a very good campaigner. Perhaps the 1984 election was an exception to that rule. He was also charismatic and he could build a connection with with voters, whether meeting them in person or talking on television. Luck also typically ran Hawke's way, such as when he faced a divided opposition for much of the period, but he also showed courage and he took political risks. I think it's often forgotten that he won the 1987 and 1990 elections after being well behind in opinion polls mid-term. He generally put the nation before self-interest and partisanship. Mm. He saw political opponents as adversaries, not enemies, and he eschewed class division. I think Australians accepted Hawke's faults that I mentioned at the outset and appreciated his virtues. He had authenticity and credibility. Voters knew that he loved them and their country, and I think it helps explain why, for most of his prime ministership, he was respected and trusted. And in the end, I think that's always much more important in politics than popularity. So in conclusion, this combination of political skills and administrative capacities I think has been rare in politics in recent decades. The English journalist Walter Badgett described a statesman as someone of common opinions and uncommon abilities, who most felicitously expresses the creed of the moment, who administers it, who embodies it in laws and institutions. Now, Hawke did not get everything right, and no prime minister is perfect. He made mistakes and he had regrets, but I think he had these essential elements identified by Badgett in spades. And so what, how Hawke ran his government, I think, is a major reason why Labor won four elections in a row between 1983 and 1990 and why he is the party's most successful leader and also the third longest serving prime minister. Um, he, led, he achieved a lot in policy, but he also established a, a model for effective leadership, which helped to remake Australia for the modern era. Thank you. And if we can keep you in Zoom land for a little while, um, we'll bring you back in for questions in about 20 minutes or so. Okay. Um, I now have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Maria Teflaga. Uh, Maria is a senior lecturer at the Australian National University, director of the Australian Political Studies Centre, uh, co-host of the Democracy Sausage podcast. She's written and published on a wide range of subjects, including the behaviour behavior of political parties in opposition. So welcome, Maria. that it works hooray great it works it's always very reassuring hi everyone um i'd just like to um 
sort of, I suppose, double down on the welcome to country that happened um, earlier in the morning uh, and pay my respects to the elders past, present uh, and emerging. Uh, so today I'm, I'm sort of the odd one out in this um, in this sort of pantheon of, of speakers we have today. I'm really talking far less about Hawke and his government and far more about um, his opponents or enemies, however you want to construct it. Though, of course, um, the sort of famous dictum is that the opposition is in front of you and the enemy is behind you. Uh, so so, um, so what I'm going to sort of do today is to kind of give a brief overview of, I guess, the main kinds of, I guess, currents that affected uh, the, the opposition and how it sort of attempted to dethrone or depose um, the Hawke government and why it was ultimately unsuccessful. So the first thing I want to sort of talk about is the coalition or the Liberal Party's approach to opposition, which I think is substantively different to Labor's, um, but like a lot of other conservative parties around the world, um, to talk a little bit about um, the sort of policy responses, picking up on some themes that have already been uh, alluded to in some of the other presentations we've already had today, and to talk a little bit about um, the party's internal challenges before reflecting on, you know, the overall legacy. So it's sort of important to think about what is the function of an opposition um, and the sort of standard uh, conception of this, particularly in a Westminster adversarial system, is that it is an alternative government. It's supposed to provide an alternative policy platform. Uh, its functions are around advocacy, grievance and, and, and voice uh, broadly defined. It's supposed to function in an educative function, um, sort of, you know, uh, uh, providing alternative information uh, to voters. Um, and most fundamentally, it is supposed to be a critical friend. Um, you know, it's supposed to affirm the regime. That is actually fundamental to, um, you know, any functioning democracy and, and fundamental to an opposition being called loyal, right, a loyal opposition. And this, of course, raises attention for any opposing uh, political party to balance the realities of not wanting to be a handmaiden to the government, which is likely to ensure that you'll never get to be the government yourself, uh, but then not sort of, I suppose, descending into the full depths of what I might call rhetorical opposition or, you know, a sort of very ferocious or negative based opposition that that isn't substantive. OK, and all oppositions have to sort of learn to navigate this and the conditions under which they the sort of broader socio-political context is, is going to affect some of that. So the, the Liberal Party's approach to, to opposition, um, you know, is different from the Labor Party's. One of the fundamental reasons for that is simply that it governs more and probably values Parliament less as a result um, because it's in control of Parliament. But, you know, one of the other sort of important factors was that the first time the Liberal Party went into opposition in the early 1970s was really the first time that that organisation had gone into opposition and there was a real concern that they wouldn't survive it, which all the previous iterations of centre-right parties had not. Um, and their, their sort of approach to opposition, because they had governed for so long, for 23 years, um, was quite different um, to, to the 1980s um, period. Like, in a nutshell, they didn't really accept Labor's right to govern and acted accordingly, which is why there were two elections based on blocking uh, supply, in a nutshell. The other thing that was sort of important, I suppose, was that unlike every other transition to opposition that the that these two parties have faced, that the coalition didn't hold. And uh, one of the more sort of amusing and trivial anecdotes from this time was the argument over who was the second most important person uh, in the coalition, the leader of the National Party or the deputy leader of the Liberal Party. It was decisively resolved uh, as the leader of the National Party, who got the second best office available to the opposition in this building, which is the size of a closet. So, um, you know, it was a fine prize. Uh, so 1983 was different. The, the, the opposition's approach to, to, to this role and this task was very much uh, shaped by the experiences of the 1970 uh, sort of period. Um, there was uh, a, a definite um, 
greater acceptance of the Hawke government's legitimacy to govern the fact that it had won an election. Though if you examine the hands from the time there and the archival record, there is plenty of rhetoric about dangerous socialistic governments, right, which which is unfamiliar to us um, um, today. Uh, and the other sort of, I suppose, important thing was that um, everyone was always saying we're never going to block supply again. You know, that was an important rhetorical dimension and certainly gave um, the, the, the Hawke government, I suppose, an, an element of uh, 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 what we might call institutional or parliamentary cover that the Whitlam government did not enjoy. Um, and of course, the coalition was maintained in this period of opposition for most of it, uh, which allowed for a level of, of I suppose, coordination, uh, but also for a level of conflict between the two parties that had to be managed. But in essence, the approach of the opposition during this time was a far more kind of balanced approach between the sort of handmade into good government and the sort of negative rhetorical um, approach that I discussed uh, earlier. So in terms of policy, uh, look, it's fair to say that this was the most policy focus that a coalition government really has ever had um, since the party's um, founding. Um, in part, um, there was like, several reasons for that. In part, that was to do with reacting to the legacy of the Fraser government and, the, and you know, for much of the Hawke, Hawke's time um, in, op in government and the opposition that faced him in many ways, it was sort of defined by how Andrew Peacock related to, to Malcolm Fraser, how John Howard had related to Malcolm Fraser, and of course, how Andrew Peacock and John Howard related to each other. They had different, I suppose, um, uh, sort of, you know, philosophical antecedents that were driving their ideas about how to react to um, the achievements and the perceived failures of uh, Malcolm Fraser's government, um, which uh, you know, provided a lot of the internal argumentation and disagreement uh, in terms of a policy direction for, for most of the 1980s and, and even into the early um, 1990s. But this was, I suppose, for the Liberal Party, the um, this period of opposition was the most uh, policy focused it has ever been. The, the reasons for that are essentially in part because it was um, opposed to a government that also had a very strong policy focus and opposition is inherently a reactive um, business because you don't have any power or resources um, comparatively. Um, and, um, and so much of what oppositions do is simply reacting to what the government is doing. And given the government was doing a lot, that forced the opposition to actually have opinions and to do things and to think about them. The other was simply that the times, uh, you know, like it's it's a it was a global phenomena that Western democratic societies were all uh, trying to work out how to deal with the end of the Bretton Woods system um, and the post-war consensus uh, that had sort of been smashed by the oil shocks of the 1970s, various other conflicts, breakdowns of uh, sort of shibboleths about how to run the economy. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it did matter that the Hawke government was not only interested in reform, but had, uh, you know, done that work in opposition as well, that had sort of provided a foundation base for them to, to be effective governments. And they were aided by an APS that was sort of very much willing to go on that um, reform journey, which is a subject of debate around the sort of successes or failures of the, the Hawke government. And the final dimension of why there was a stronger policy focus was also because it it was in part a reflection of leadership style of the of the sort of two sort of opposing um, uh, antagonists of this period, Andrew Peacock and John Howard. Um, you know, um, Peacock was definitely not as policy oriented as John Howard, but you know he was certainly more policy oriented than some of our opposition leaders that we've had in in more recent um, decades, which we can talk about in a minute. Um, you know, it's actually really important to understand that the, the, the Liberal Party, which is the dominant coalition party, is really a leadership vehicle. Like, it doesn't have the same um, internal structures and mechanisms that Troy um, sort of has just referred to um, in terms of helping it kind of govern. And Peacock and Howard very much 
um, argued over the right approach to win government. Uh, and one of those um, arguments was around how much policy focus there should be. And of course, we all famously know that um, when John Hewson took over the show uh, um, uh, in, the in 1990, that, that you know, he decided that, that there was actually more required there. But I think one of the interesting kind of legacies, I suppose it's a real success of the Hawke government, is that everyone wants to claim that they're part of the success of this government. And, um, and one of the common rhetorical frames in the last 30 years is for coalition MPs and leaders to, to claim their, their rightful role in the policy cooperation um, of the era. And, and it's true, they were certainly more cooperative than they had been with the Whitlam government and arguably that they were with the Rudd Gillard, Gillard government, but we still have an adversarial political system. They were still ferocious um, in their opposition to quite a lot of what we might call the signature policy um, um, uh, sort of reforms of this era. You know, we should never forget that the Liberal Party and the, and the National Party lost four elections in a row trying to undo Medicare, right? It's just one um, example. Um, you know, um, Professor Evans alluded to other, other areas where they, they were opposed to superannuation being another big one. Uh, they were opposed to various uh, tax policy changes, the assets, tax, the, uh, the assets test, which was the centerpiece of their opposition to the 1984 campaign. Um, sort of the gold um, attacks on 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 gold. Um, I can't remember where they landed on petroleum and um, capital gains. Like they were quite opposed to that, um, at least um, initially. Um, you know, um, the sex discrimination legislation was very divisive within the Liberal Party and sort of actually produced um, splits within that party. Uh, and of course, um, you know, as was previously alluded to, the Liberal Party at this time did have very different competing um, ideas about what constituted the nation, social cohesion, family life, multiculturalism, and Indigenous affairs. And I think what's important to kind of reckon with is it was not just that they, they were internally unable to agree, to be blunt, um, and, um, and many of those sort of dominant winning out positions were, were opposed to to what Labor was attempting to do. Now, you know, I mean, it's an adversarial system. Of course, they're going to oppose. That is literally the job. Uh, but it is, um, um, I suppose, uh, a great compliment um, that so so many people have wanted to sort of claim their part of success um, for the um, for the reforms of the Hawke uh, Keating government. And um, it is sort of, I suppose. Um, indicative of the ability of the Hawke government to govern from the centre uh, and to actually usher through a series of important reforms, some of which were obviously in line with the instincts of the coalition because they were market-oriented or dry, as uh, uh, Gareth Evans sort of explained. But yeah, they did produce a lot more policy um, work than they had in the past. Um, John Howard's Future Directions was... Uh, sort of, I suppose, the foundational sort of rhetorical steering project that, uh, you know, in many ways did guide his very successful government. Um, after the fact, uh, John Hewson famously produced Fight Back, um, which is uh, the, the supplementary materials for that is at over 500 uh, pages with extensive economic modelling and um, is essentially brought up every single time an opposition currently claims it's the most extensive policy document that they've ever had, which is always deemed false because John Hewson and his fight back package is unlikely to ever be rivaled or beaten. Um, and, and whilst, you know, some people have called that document the longest suicide note in political history, which I think is deeply unkind, it, it did like the work Gareth did with Bill Hayden it, and, 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 you know, and John Hewson's, sorry, John Howard's future directions. It did actually provide an important grounding for the the successes of the Howard government. Um, you know, it, it did prove to be a masterclass for the opposition uh, who later on went to become ministers in advocacy of complex ideas. Um, you know, it's hard to believe that the GST would have been successful in 19, um, in the, you know, in uh, 2001, if uh, key members of that government hadn't had some experience learning to advocate for difficult and complex policy, which is what they did at this time. However, you know, and I think another way to kind of demonstrate that 
it was a more policy focused opposition than compared to today is to is to sort of look at some uh, first questions from question time, um, you know, uh, from from a few snapshots. Like, and this, so this is, you know, this I wouldn't call this definitive analysis, but it is indicative. If you go and just randomly pick a question time day and compare it with a random one from um, more recent periods of, of of coalition opposition, you will see a distinct rhetorical difference in the kinds of questions asked. So, Mr. Peacock asked the Prime Minister, "What would be the effect of unemployment on a three to four percentage wage increase this year?" Fairly specific. Dr. Nelson, the first question he asks to the new Rudd government is is given the Prime Minister has led the Australian people to believe that under Labor, a Labor government would a lid be put on the price of groceries and petrols, what is the Prime Minister's plan to lower grocery and petrol prices? If we look at Mr Howard, the most uh, policy oriented of the 80s leaders, he asks, is it true that the Prime Minister's trilogy's promise is to keep taxation receipts to no more than 25.3% of gross domestic product in 1985-86? And so on and so forth, compared to Abbott, who asks, my question is to the Prime Minister, I refer him to the visit I made today to Arthur and Rita Clark at their fruit and vegetable shop in Queanbeyan, whose $6,000 month power bill will increase by $1,500. Why won't the Prime Minister be honest with the Australian people about the impact of, the, of her carbon tax on the cost of food? Or Dr. Hewson, um, can the Treasurer, actually, you know what, he did engage in a lot more invective than you might might think um, because there was a recession on, but you know, um, here's a good one. Can the treasurer inform the house of how he can stabilize our national debt with a current account deficit of 4.5%, um, uh, you know, and will it result in a deeper re recession compared to uh, Mr. Dutton from the first question time of March this year? Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister, can they confirm during the election campaign that he solemnly declared we will have no intention to make any super changes, given that now Labor is increasing taxes on super, you know, will the PM apologise? Why has the PM misled the Australian people? Isn't this yet another broken promise from a tricky Prime Minister? So we can kind of sort of see, like, I mean, again, I tried to pick comparable dates, tried to pick points in the year where you would expect a mix of policy and, and political rhetoric, we can kind of see that there has been a, rhetor a shift towards, I suppose, less information, policy-oriented questions towards more a more rhetorical um, kind of function. And it's um, not surprising that I think over 90% of Australians think question time is garbage, according to the latest review into that august session of parliament um, from a few years back. Okay. So the internal party management um, is the sort of final thing I want to um, discuss. And it's actually the thing we probably most typically remember from this time because it was a torrid time. Um, one of the core debates, uh, which in some ways I think is irrelevant, is was it a personality thing or was it a factional thing? In many ways, it actually doesn't matter. The point really is, is that the Liberal Party didn't have institutional tools to deal with conflict. Um, and the, the major failure of this period was actually a failure to develop such institutional infrastructure to help them manage conflicts. Um, you know, I think it's important to note that the findings of the 1984 Valder report uh, have not been implemented and many are still relevant to this day. It's also true that factionalism did increase in this era and um, is the gift of, uh, I suppose, some of the turmoil, um, particularly in New South Wales around pre-selections. Like, you know, this is the era when um, that sort of process of, of factionalisation was really beginning. Um, South Australia was already deeply factionalised due to the like the, uh, the, 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 basically the breaking of the gerrymander and disagreements over that uh, the decade previously. Uh, this period was famously a, one of ideological realignment across all political systems, democratic political systems around the world, affecting both left and right um, parties. And, um, you know, the Liberal Party was no different. Um, what's sort of important to kind of uh, remember actually is that the, the coalition is a, an alignment of sort of two competing philosophies that used to be government and opposition before Labor came along to terrify them into one party to, to, to defeat the, uh, you know, essentially the organised uh, Labor. And so um, 
and that uh, that sort of, I suppose, battle was very much um, on display uh, during the 1980s, which would kind of coalesce around the conflict between um, uh, John Howard and Andrew Peacock. And then you were protagonists like um, Jeff um, Kennett, Margaret Thatcher, of course, was, a, was a, a great example of how to make, I suppose, this new politics, this new right politics um, work. But of course, what is often actually overlooked is, um, you know, Leighton was also moving to the right at this time. Um, it, that, that was a process that had um, already been underway in the, in the sense of its uh, broadening its appeal to increase its coalition to include the educated middle class the coalition responded by moving to start uh, trying to work out how to talk to Labor's conservative left flank. Um, the, um, it didn't help when Joe Bielke peterson had the mad idea that he could run for Canberra and blow, blew up the coalition, um, uh, disabilised the National Party, created enormous uh, distraction and certainly would have been helpful in Bob Hawke's poll recovery in 1987 to have an opposition in complete disarray, completely dysfunctional, um, trying to um, put to bed uh, a, a, a political venture that... Um, had no chance of succeeding. I mean, I think, you know, I mentioned previously two things that the, the, the Liberal Party is a leadership vehicle and that there are two incompatible philosophies and this is the essential thing and it lacks institutional mechanisms to resolve disputes. The mechanism is leadership change and that is one of the reasons why leaders change so often uh, during opposition because the way that the way this party essentially functions is they can't actually resolve these philosophical differences so one faction will dominate the other in government it's easier um, to maintain discipline and to deliver spoils um, the party always works better when the dominant faction listens to the other faction makes concessions and they do deals um, but you know when that doesn't happen you get executions instead that's how the, that's how we get um, that's how we get resolution to policy outcomes and that's a pattern we have seen in the 1980s and and more recently as well um, you know perhaps um, you know in government as well so what might we kind of say? Well, you know, in essence, like they were all unsuccessful opponents of, of Bob Hawke. He defeated every single one of them, uh, every single um, iteration of um, Liberal leader, though, of course, he never did get a go at um, uh, John Hewson. Um, and in part, uh, the, the, you know, the instability of the Liberal Party at this time, its, its inability to work out its own clear idea about where it wanted to take Australia, um, which, you know, took it a long time to work out, um, would no doubt have reassured the Australian public that even at times they might have been disappointed with Hawke's government or, or uh, frustrated with, um, you know, the pace of reform or the slowness of reform or, you know, how long it takes for the fruits of those reforms to come about, that it would be the better party to manage what was a difficult and important transition. And of course, you know, fight back is often credited with being part of Hawke's downfall. But in, in reality, the fight back was a point of pressure, putting pressure on the Labor Party as an institution and the internal dynamics going on um, within that institution and, and the relationship between um, Hawke and, and KD. Um, it is it is an interesting counterfactual as to whether or not Houston would have beaten Hawke. Um, in some ways, again, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, he left the scene. Uh, but, you know, Hawke, as, as others have said, um, had enduring appeal. He had an appeal that the Liberal Party simply could not match at that time. Um, and um, it would be interesting, again, an interesting counterfactual to know if if there would have been a set of circumstances where they, they could have produced a victory uh, against Bob Hawke. They certainly came close a few times, um, but but never never quite got there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Maria. Those pictures of the Liberal leaders together make for fascinating viewing. Um, 
plenty of material right for psychoanalysis there, I'm sure. Um, if we could get a microphone ready for questions, uh, and we'll try and bring Troy back on the screen so that he can participate in this as well. Um, as the microphone comes around, if you could just state your name into the microphone and then and then state your question, that would be fantastic. Uh, both Troy. of you talked a little bit about factions. And my main question is really to Troy, uh, interesting issue for the, for the Hawke years was the role of the centre-left um, and, and if, if you like, a, a faction that wasn't a faction. Uh, I wonder whether you might have talked a little bit about that and also whether that's relevant today when, when you don't seem to have within the Labor Party, Labor government, other than Andrew Lee, uh, somebody who's not a member of one with the right or the left faction. Yeah. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Troy, did you hear the question? I did. I did hear the question. Great. Terrific. Would you like to answer that one first? Sure. Um, yeah, look, I think the centre-left was a unique creation. Um, there was some trade union support for it, which is often the basis of factions within the Labor Party, um, but it was very personality-driven, people who were sort of homeless, people like um, Peter Walsh, um, Susan Ryan, uh, Bill Hayden in, in particular, Peter Cook. Um, and so the faction was really important. I mean, it was a faction. It was more of a social thing, I guess, um, where they didn't have sort of a, a, a rigid structure or um, the same type of meetings that the left or the right faction had. Um, but it played a particularly important role. And so delegates to the party's national conferences, and there are a number of them through the 1980s that were, were called to resolve policy differences and confirm um, key policies. You know, there's only about 100 delegates at these national conferences. And so the centre-left grouping might have been small, um, you know, a dozen or two dozen or so, but they were critical um, in keeping that Hawke government on track. I mean, it's it's incredible to go back and read some of those national conference reports and see things like, you know, the float of the dollar, um, whether that should be, re, the dollar should be re-regulated. It comes down to, you know, 10 or 20 votes um, on the national conference floor or privatisation or other aspects of the economic agenda. Um, so the centre-left were really critical in aligning with the right um, to keep the Hawke government functioning. Um, I think it also speaks to your right that the Labor Party had much more tolerance for dissent, uh, for independence of views. I remember talking to Don Grimes uh, before he died and I asked him, you know, what, how factionally did he identify himself? And he said, oh, I was sort of in the left, but I wasn't really in the left. You know, he was sort of independent. Um, and there are others as well in that period who could be independent um, and were respected and given opportunities to be ministers because they were, they, they were good. Um, they had merit. They were quality, quality people. Um, who brought an intellectual rigour to policy discussions. So um, Hawke had a tolerance for that. And unfortunately, I think that the centre-left is extinguished now. Um, the factional system is very rigid um, and everybody in Anthony Albanese's cabinet is from the left or the right um, and they don't brook anybody else. I mean, Andrew Lee is kind of tolerated um, as a as a junior junior assistant minister, I think. So, um, you know, but, he, but he's outside of cabinet. And that's a shame. That's a shame that the Labor Party's become... Um, so rigidly, rigidly factionalised by it. But uh, the centre-left did play a very, very key role in, in the Hawke government's success. Maria, would you like to add to that one? Uh, yeah, is this on? Great. Um, yeah, I won't say much more, but um, it was interesting that quite a few advocates at the time argued that the Liberal Party should adopt a similar kind of factional system because, you know, in the 1980s, it was a very effective dispute resolution mechanism, which, as Troy has so well articulated, um, is no longer functioning in quite the same um, manner. You know, um, the whole point of political parties is to aggregate interests and then to resolve disputes. And so you do need forums to have discussions and debates, but you also need instruments to bring people together um, and, you know, blind, like authority or relying on the authority of a single leader um, often doesn't uh, work when the, the inherent power of that leader is um, weak because they are the leader of the opposition and not a prime minister. Um, so it's something to think on. Steve. Hi, 
thank you very much, uh, Troy and Maria. Stay the most to the end of your school of this day's meeting. And then again, thank you for that. God bless. God bless. Um, okay, it's coming on now. At last, belatedly, I'll say that again. Stephen Wilkes from the ANU School of History. Thank you very much, uh, Troy and Maria. I've got a question which is probably primarily for Maria. Researching um, Victorian state politics in the 50s, uh, it's extraordinary the way that Henry Bolte is a very, very inexperienced, nervous new premier. Sought and received wise counsel from John Kane Sr. They were very friendly and he said, any problem, I could discreetly go to Kane Sr. and he would sit down and say, son, this is how you do it. Now, whilst I very much doubt if Peacock or Howard would have ever have done that with Bob Hawke, is there nonetheless evidence that then or for that matter later, the Liberals consciously asked themselves, why is Hawke so successful? Why is it such a gold standard government? What can we learn from or even emulate? Uh, yeah, look, I would say that there were things they, they did admire in Hawke, but they also, you know, they also didn't like him. I mean, he kept beating them. Um, so, you know, I, I think I'm sure in private moments of, of, of reflection, there, there was that uh, dimension of uh, respect. But there are plenty plenty of people in that party who, who really disliked um, Bob Hawke and the sort of controversy around the age ta tapes, which was very bitter, um, is a sort of indication of, of some of that. Um, I mean, I think what's probably an important difference in the two periods that you're talking about is that after 1975 a lot of relationships across the aisle had been really poisoned um the the sort of collegiality that had existed prior to 75 born out of you know joint service in world war ii and a, a clearer sense of consensus around australian values and national identity made it a lot easier for um those i suppose friendships to to emerge and to be um meaningful i mean i i mean i don't think i need to tell anyone in this room that, that you know that especially those of a certain age that that 1975 was really divisive and um and um and, and really did test the bounds of um, the sort of institutional um, powers, which which is reflected in the fact that many liberals were uneasy with the actions of of what had happened and why, you know, for the next twenty years, people kept saying, like in their policy platforms, we will not, you know, fiddle with supply. So, yeah. I wonder if Troy wants to comment on that question at all as well. Yeah, just a brief response. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Hawke had a bit of a friendly relationship with Andrew Peacock, which was based on going to the races uh, in Melbourne, um, and they had seen each other pretty regularly. And, of course, Peacock had been Industrial Relations Minister in the 19, late 1970s, I think, so or early 1980s. Um, so they kind of had a bit of a regard for each other. Um, but Peacock was a pretty tough political opponent and uh, didn't really pull any punches at all. Um, John Howard was much more moderate in his political criticisms, um, but they both came to respect Hawke, I think. But that respect had to be earned, and it only really came after. Um, it didn't really happen at the time. Um, there wasn't sort of much, much at all cross-party, um, you know, social gatherings or, or, or things like that in during the Hawke period that had largely been extinguished, I think, as noted uh, by Maria from the dismissal uh, poisoning. Uh, Paul Keating said that the dismissal uh, injected poison into the political bloodstream of Australia, and I think he's right about right about that. Um, just a quick point too about, you know, I think Maria made a really valuable point about bipartisanship. You know, it was, you know, John Howard has repeatedly claimed that, you know, he he deserves some credit for the Hawke government's policies. I put this question directly to Bob Hawke a number of times, uh, and he would just sort of, you know, lean back in his chair and laugh and said, "I didn't need their support. Um, we didn't need it at all. I mean, they had the support of the Democrats in the Senate." Um, they won election after election, and John Howard was irrelevant to this question. So uh, he enjoyed me asking him uh, that on a number of occasions. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, we do have time for one or two more questions, if people have them. I suppose while we've got you, Troy, I might ask one myself. Um, you talked about the set of institutions that Hawke used so so artfully to govern. Um by the end of the Hawke years, what sense do you get that the balance of power between those institutions had changed? Thinking about cabinet, the outer ministry, the prime minister's office, the senior public service, how had the balance between those institutions changed? 
Um, look, I think it's an interesting question. When, so certainly the biggest change in any institute, any of those institutions I mentioned is the Prime Minister's office. You know, it started off with Hawke having, you know, essentially a dozen staff. And now I think Anthony Albanese has close to 50 staff um, in that same office, you know, up on the up on the hill there. So that's been the institution where there's huge change. Uh, and there's a lot of other ac great academic work uh, being done by a number of people identifying the sort of authority and power of the Prime Minister's office, which is sometimes used over the authority of Cabinet, you know, telling Cabinet Ministers what to do, controlling what they can say, and Gareth Evans mentioned uh, some of that earlier. So we've seen a more powerful institution emerge. Um, the Prime Minister's Department, I think, has gone back to playing more of a policy role rather than a policy coordination role, which is what um, Hawke wanted. Um, you know, cabinet is still is still the cabinet and still operates essentially in the same in the same way. Uh, it's interestingly that you know a number of the ministers, whether it's Anthony Albanese or um, Richard Miles, right right down to the bottom, they all say they're following the Hawke model of robust cabinet debate. You know, frank and fearless discussion, welcome advice, maintain that discipline and unity. And in fact, there's been very almost I, I can't think of any leaks from the Albanese cabinet. Um, so far on a on a significant policy matter, so they've certainly followed that model uh, much more than um, you know the Rudd uh, Gillard government did. Fantastic. Well, Maria, you've written about the rise of political advisors and the Prime Minister's office. Is there anything you'd like to kind of add here as the final word? Um, it, no, it's it's a good question, and I suppose it sort of uh, reflects the fact that because the role of advisors. And the evolution of PMC uh, sort of has sort of happened over time. That a lot of these things haven't been kind of um, codified um, in the sort of chain of delegation, or even in through the sort of norms, or been really bedded down in the way that the functions of the APS have. And um, because there is quite a lot of latitude in how these roles and functions can be interpreted, and in some cases um, in ways that. Um, clearly violate Westminster uh, principles, good princ principles of good government. Um, you know, it has called into question the efficacy of government, but also like the ability to really hold governments to account in a way that they they used to be able to. Um, however, you know, when you formalise things, you you create new risks, and so it it is it is a, a matter of sort of careful consideration about how you would actually approach this but i i don't think relying on on norms um over the last couple of decades has actually sort of served us well like we have seen a a degradation of the aps its capabilities um you know the notion of frank and, and fearless advice and and we have a rich crop of scandals um and maladministration to to show for it so um, it's a pity that Glenn Davis is gone because I, you know, I, I really hope that this current government actually really does grasp the nettle and think carefully about um, APS um, reform. Um, you know, I do, they don't need to do it quickly because um, I think that's actually important, but that they govern um, and, and seek to sort of amend some of these distortions. Fantastic. Well, on that point, I think we'll draw this session to a close. I think we've got half an hour now for morning tea and we'll reconvene here for the next session at 11.30, so thank you. Oh, I saw, yeah, I wonder what she dropped. I was hoping it wasn't something very important. Yeah, right.
Good. Great. Well, uh, friends, I'd say old friends, uh, I'm Peter Shergold, and uh, yes, um, Bob Hawke changed my life. Uh, I was an economic historian uh, quietly plying my craft at UNSW in 1987 when I was unexpectedly approached to establish an Office of Multicultural Affairs in his department. And it was with Bob Hawke's personal support that a couple of years later, a national agenda for a multicultural Australia was set in place, which I think was a key part of the public policy and which gained bipartisan political support, although not from the loyal opposition, but from Nick Greiner, uh, the Premier of New South Wales. And that was the same year, you remember, in 89, that uh, Bob Hawke took that wonderfully bold decision to let all Chinese students stay in Australia after he was so visibly moved by the brutal crushing of protest at uh, Chenaman Square. So it was those extraordinary years. And then in 1991, uh, I was asked to move across to, uh, from PM&C uh, to ATSIC where in the next year, 1992, I became CEO and it was the toughest job I ever had in the APS. So I was delighted when I was asked to introduce our next two speakers who in the Prime Minister's office played a far, far more substantial role in the Hawke Prime Ministership. Uh, Barry Cassidy, you know, is the chair of the Museum of Australian Democracy uh, he was a leading political journalist, is, and for 18 years was the host of Insiders on the ABC. He twice uh, worked as a foreign correspondent in Washington and Brussels. And of course, for four years, he was Bob Hawke's uh, senior press secretary. And Craig Emerson is today the director of the APEC Study Center at RMIT. He also runs his own consultancy business, he was, of course, an economic and political advisor to Bob Hawke, then entered Parliament in 1998 and was Australia's Minister for Trade in the Gillard government. And Craig was the architect 
of the white paper on Australia in the, in the Asian century. Now, my job's really easy now. They are going to have a conversation, or as academics like to say, and structured discourse uh, uh, together. And my only role with 15 minutes to go will be to say, stop, so that you can ask your questions. So, Barry, over to you. Well, thank you, Peter. Yeah, great. I think probably more unstructured, but in broad terms, we will get to a discussion around how Hawke's office operated, who were the key players, what the priorities were, and so on. But before then, we thought, just to lighten things up a bit, we might talk about the downside, the free time that existed in Hawke's life. And there wasn't a lot of it. Saturday was usually the key day, and there'd be a few hours set aside, usually for Bob Hawke to indulge his real passion, and that was horse racing. Now, Craig, you arrived in the office as an economist and uh, an advisor on the environment. I at least had some background in that industry. I just got the feeling you didn't have much at all. I had none. <laughs> and, and Bob unreasonably concluded that as an economist, I'd be good at probability theory, and that would give him an edge uh, in terms of the horses that he backed. Uh, I, I'd never had any association with horse racing at all. But one of the uh, very early races that we got interest in was, of all things, the Newcastle Cup. And the Newcastle Cup had a runner named the Brotherhood, and it was running at 15 to 1. And I, I didn't care about that. I just looked at, you know, its times and so on. And I said, I reckon the Brotherhood's a chance, Bob. Anyway, the Brotherhood won. And then at 15 to 1, this is just amazing. So he thought, this guy knows everything about <laughs> horse racing. Um, then we go to the Melbourne Cup a little bit later. And by this time, Barry and I were fully versed in marking up the names of the trainers that would Bob that Bob would ring. Um, but he'd do his own analysis. And um, we rang one of the trainers, Les Bridge, who trained the Brotherhood. And Bob said, oh, mate, what do you think about the Brotherhood? And Les Bridge said, it's got no chance. But I have a runner called Kenzai, and I think it's a good winning chance. To cut a long story short, we backed Kenzai. We went to the National Press Club. They have a thing called a Calcutta. So we bought Ken Kenzai, and then um, my job was to go from the Press Club to Bob's place. So I put some more money on the TAB on Kenzai and it won. So, <laughs> so we, that was it. The, our fate was sealed thereafter. So every Saturday morning, uh, whether we're in, in town or not, we would have to get together with Bob. Uh, he'd already have uh, all the trainers listed. He looked for horses that had come down in weight but had run fast times. They were his tests and uh, he'd make those phone calls. And Well, he didn't have time to do all of them. No. He would he would assign some of those yeah. phone calls. I got to ring Brian Mayfield Smith. Yeah, and I'd be ringing people like Jack or Bob Ingham, the Chicken Kings, yeah. who are horse owners. Yeah, yeah. Having never met them, no, and asking for the best tips from their stables. Um, he it was this went on for about two hours. Yeah, on a Saturday morning, whether it be Kirribilli or or the Lodge or or a hotel in Melbourne, and that was the routine. We would ring trainers and owners. Yeah, and get their tips before he would then go off to the in, races. In Melbourne or Sydney or Perth. Now, Barry uh, came on board. It was announced that Barry was coming on board when we were at Kakadu, announcing that we we're going to put Kakadu Stage, Kakadu Stage 2 on the World Heritage List. And uh, Bob said, oh, mate, um, Butch is coming on board. <laughs> Who's Butch? You know. <laughs> anyway, he used to call me the kid. So before long, it was Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And so but he did come on board, but one of his first experiences was in November of 1986. We're on the VIP flight. Bob's done all the marking up, all the training, all the ones he thinks are winning chances. And we're getting off the plane. I checked with Barry. I thought Bob said, look after these, will you? But he said, no, he just gave them to him. What do you reckon Barry did as a news press secretary? All the crumpled up newspapers, <laughs> look, threw them over his shoulder. Next morning, Perth time, we're ringing the trainers. They're trying to get their horses to the track. 
Bob's, Bob wants to ring them. Where's my sportsman? Says Bob, rings me. And I said, I don't know. And I said, did you give him to Barry? And he rings Barry. I said, oh, mate, you're going to get a phone call from Bob. Um, where's it? And he said, I left it on the plane. And Barry tells me of the image. He goes, I said, you better go and talk to him. He opens the door and Bob's there stark naked saying, where's me fucking sportsman? <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, we didn't do very well that day because uh, the trainers were very busy getting their horses to the races and we couldn't make the phone calls. But he, he put in two or three hours' work every Friday on, on this and he would mark up the form guide for weights and weather and jockeys and times and the whole bit, a lot of work, and I threw it all away. And I did hear later that uh, that he described me as an idiot. <laughs> he said, what sort of an idiot would do that? This is day one, right? I'd only just walked in the door. Anyway, after that, um, I started to get used to going off to the track on a Saturday. And uh, and he would have you go and place best, which was pretty annoying. And, and we had our, our polit chief political advisor there was a bloke called Bob Sorby. And Sorby was amused when he saw this going on. He wondered, you know, why we'd be so sycophantic as to do this. Then Hawke said to him, I want you to go and put on a Cornella, a, a trifecta, I think it was. And so he said, oh, yeah, right. And, and he gave him the numbers. And then he, he just wheeled around. He came back and he said, sorry, a trifecta, is that a winner in three consecutive races, right? Hawke said, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's first, second and third, right? So he goes away and he comes back and he said, do they have to be in order? And at that stage, Hawke turned to one of the federal coppers and said, oh, will you put this on? So he walked past me and winks and says, you'll never ask me again. <laughs> So you had to you had to have a strategy to deal with some of this because it really was quite quite obsessive. Um, but um, Craig, you had one incident where um, placing a bet was a bit uh, a bit tricky, and you recounted it at the memorial yeah. service. Yeah, the, the, there was a trainer named Ray Guy, and he was really smart because he would work out what he, he always wanted to put a horse in a race that he thought the horse could win. Owners like the idea of being in a big group one race and, you know, everyone dresses up and so on. But he just find a midweek race and we had a look at this horse um, and I, I didn't think it had any chance. And he said, well, we'll ring, we will ring Ray anyway. So we rang him. This is in the morning of a midweek race uh, before a cabinet meeting. And Ray says... I give it a good winning chance. Sometimes trainer said, we'll win. I thought, that's bullshit. I mean, no horse will win. No one, you know, knows that they're going to win. But he, when Ray said, I give it a good winning chance, oh, 33 to 1. So Bob says, can you put $100 each way on, on it for me? Like, yeah, okay, mate. So they have the cabinet meeting. A cabinet minister is really struggling with um, a submission. And uh, uh, I slipped a note because Bob said, let me know how the, this horse went. And I, said, and I said, the note came in while the cabinet minister still struggling with his colleagues. Bob looks at the note and says, that's all right, mate. Your submission is, is passed because the horse had won. And the, anyway, the CSIRO was forever grateful for, for, that, horse, for that horse winning. Bob came in and, and the advisors thought, gee, there must be, this is the public servants advisors, the note takers, someone must have enormous influence in Hawke's office because that submission was going to be defeated. And it was all because the, the, the Hawke's <laughs> horse had won. Bob comes out at the end of the cabinet meeting and he didn't drink at all alcohol um, through his prime ministership, but liked a cup of tea. Cups of tea for all. <laughs> Everyone come in, we're going to celebrate. I, thought, I don't know if I should go in. Um, and they all celebrated cups of tea all around, and I was still pacing around my office. What on earth am I going to do? Because I forgot to put the bed on. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I could tell him um, Bob would be unhappy, the steno secretaries would be distressed, uh, Barry wouldn't be impressed. So I never told him. And I like he didn't check his account very often at all. So it, it is. 
his memorial service, I confess that, confess to it. He just but goes to it. It was almost about the contest and not the money. Like yeah, that's he, right. He regarded himself as a very skillful punter. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and so if he had a win, he he took that very personally. It was just a demonstration of his skills right across the board. The um on the um on the running of the office itself though, and um I think we're basically politics started to lose its way a bit was when they kind of abandoned the idea of having a very senior public servant running the office. Um, and look, the, the political advisor was still a key player, but um, had a separate role, quite distinct. And with the senior public servant running the office, they tended to focus more on the policy than the politics. Um, I just heard on the on the radio on the way up that today is um, um, National Cliché Day. Did you know that? No. No. Well, apparently it is. But Hall's so favourite cliché it, 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 it was that... Um, um, if you get the policy right, the politics will take care of itself. And it wasn't just a cliche. I mean, it had a bit going for it, but that's kind of the way it operated when you had a, a senior public servant of a, you know, a Connie Bear or a um, um, Sandy, Sandy Holway, Holway um, Dennis, Richardson Dennis Richardson running your office, um, then that tended to happen. And and there was a bit of a there was that necessary distance, I think, between the political advisor and the and the public servant. Yeah, and that, and it's. I'm going to describe the role of the principal private secretary as also ensuring the paper flows to the prime minister. Now, that sounds a very pedestrian mechanical thing, but the paper was the departmental advice, right? So um, that had to be kind of filtered because uh, Bob was a good reader and he had this bag that he'd take home and an assiduous reader, but you couldn't just give every brief that came to the department. Uh, so that that was a skill, but more important than that skill was the fact that the advice of public service was taken very, very seriously. And um, it would only be if uh, we uh, challenged the advice, had a different view, for example, or um, if the advice was to tell the minister that his or her idea is not going to get up, that, you know, that, that that's when it became... Uh, a contest, I suppose, of ideas. And, you know, I think that was a really very valuable time. And, and you know, as you know, I'm former Labor Minister, but the diminution in the importance of the public service in the last few years up until 2022, I think has been very costly to the nation. Um, and I was doing a, a review just recently, this is an anecdote, uh, with some Treasury people, and they were just well, oh, but that that draft, you know, we've got to put confidential. It could be subject to FOI. I said, I don't care if you just go and give it to them. It's a draft. It's, but, you know, the psychology of of kind of secrecy and so on it had become very deeply embedded. But, yeah, those senior public servants were very, very important. And uh, I was just going through the list of uh, staff in preparation for this, and people like Rod Sims went on to be yeah. a Triple C chairman, Peter Harris, Productivity Commission, Ross Garno, who's an icon in terms of um, uh, environmental policy, Sandy Holway, John Bowen, both um, um, ran the Olympics together. Yeah, that's right. Uh, with, with others. Couldn't run the Hawk office, so went off and ran the Olympics. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, though, to you... Um, when you think back on those years, and we're going back almost thirty-five years now, but what what made you most proud to be to be a part of that operation? Well, it's interesting when you talk to leaders who have retired; um, they actually think of the environment. And uh, Wayne Goss, I, I worked for him for five years, and he was really he didn't like greenies, he didn't like this sort of stuff at all, but kind of thought it's probably necessary. And in his um, account. It was, you know, Cape York Wilderness Zone, Starkey, Fraser Island. That were the things that he mentioned. Bob was, um, he didn't need to be converted. He, they'd done, as you know, pre-election 1983, he said they'd stopped the Gordon below Franklin Dam and did so. Um, but Bjorki Peterson was in power in Queensland. Uh, we're, we're in a fair bit of political trouble when I came on as economic advisor two days later um, Bob Hogg said, who's going into that meeting with um, Rich Owen and Bob Brown? And I liked listening to Bob Brown. I said, I will. So I, I became Bob Hawke's environmental advisor. <laughs> and, uh, but we got through that. It took two years uh, of just brutal um, argument with the Grey government. Amazingly, and this is a very Hawke thing, 
You know who signed the World Heritage nomination for the uh, Lemon Time and Southern Forests um, nomination? Bob Hawke and Robin Gray. Now, Robin was the treasurer of uh, the premier of Tasmania, and through all that fighting, the communications and the respect just kept flowing from Bob. And in the end, Gray ca uh, co signed that. Mm. The environment movement had said to me, and they were very good because they were wanted to, achievements not just to say we're very you know outspoken um bob said i want just a very finite agenda that you need to go and negotiate with bob brown philip Toyne, and others and it was the tasmanian forests um kakadu uh world heritage listing uh the wet tropics of north queensland colloquially known as the dane tree and a place called Shelburne Bay on um, Cape York, which is a big, uh, beautiful sand area. And the proposal was to mine the sand and, and put it on ships, take it to Japan to make glass. Uh, and it was a very important Aboriginal uh, site. Anyway, we did all four of those. And uh, when Bob is asked about his greatest achievements, that's what he talks about. And yeah. then, sorry, yeah. one other, Antarctica. Yeah, where we thought we had no chance, but we had to try, and we had to go around the world that is to stop mining in Antarctica. Uh, yes, the, the the proposal yeah. um, from the public service was, it's better to have regulated mining in Antarctica than unregulated mining. And Bob and I, I said to Bob, it's better to have no mining than regulated mining, and that's what we did. We campaigned around the world um, with the French, but mainly in Paris, right? That's yeah, really what with um, Mitterrand and Michel Rocard. Um, with and Jacques a, Cousteau. And Jacques Cousteau, yeah, who, yeah. who we formed an alliance with him. Uh, and then uh, we went to the US. Uh, George Bush Sr. said, yeah, okay, but we're happy, happy for you to talk about it. But no, we're, we're going to sign the Minerals Convention. Yep. We'd met Margaret Thatcher. She said, um, we're signing the Minerals Convention. So we're given no hope, but we just kept pressing an, an in, interesting kind of political exercise, Barry, we then started contacting um, very small countries who weren't permanent members of founding members of the Antarctic Treaty and said, well, would you consider opposing the Minerals Convention? I said, yeah, sure. So we got two, three, four, but the French one was the really big one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, I mean, I think it was um, his absolute hatred for racism and bigotry of any kind, and it was so passionately and personally felt. And uh, the day that um, John Howard decided to raise the issue of discriminatory immigration policy, because that's what, what it was when he wanted to reduce the number of Asians, um, Hawke got people together in his office and he was advised, I won't say by who, but one, one of the advisors said, be very, very careful here uh, because he's probably got community... Um, opinion and support on his side. Um, and he listened to this argument and then he said, well, what I want to hear from you blokes, and we were all blokes at the time, what I want to hear from you is how do we turn that around? So it was never a question of buckling and, go and, and just trying to let it slide. He wanted to get back into the parliament that very day, and he did. And, and so that's what he did. He took it head on and within 24 hours, I think, John Howard had, um, had backed away from well, it. Well, so. he had to. Um, he, he draft, well, we drafted up a, a motion in the parliament which actually acknowledged that Harold Holt had begun to dismantle the White Australia policy. Uh, and then Whitlam uh, formalised that. Hmm. Uh, and, and, it kind of, and it said, we should have a policy that is um, non-discriminatory on the basis of race, creed and so on. It, it wasn't a poke the coalition in the eye. It was just something that most decent people would say, that's right. So um, Philip Ruddock crossed the floor uh, and others in the House of Reps. Um, uh, Steele, what was his name in the Senate? Yeah, Steele Hall. Hall. Yeah. And uh, another in the Senate. But it, yeah, it, it, the whole thing, they basically had to capitulate. Um, and yeah. I, I will point out that John Howard lost his seat in 2007. Um, and I think that 
in in his own seat, there are a lot like around Chatswood and so on. There's a lot of um, Chinese, Korean, Australians. I don't think they ever really forgot. Right. Yeah. And you know, they I don't think they forgot. Put it that way. Uh, the other um, related area to that was uh, the stand that he took against apartheid in South Africa. And again, it's another example of, but you can sit back and stay out of trouble, um, especially on foreign policy, if you want to, I suppose. Um, but his attitude seemed to be, as he was with mining in Antarctica, to take it on. And I know he was getting lots of advice that um, we're really not that relevant to that issue in South Africa and it's monumental and you'd have to beat Margaret Thatcher to get there. And I think partly that was what spurred him on. Um, um, I'll tell you very quickly a story about Hawke and Thatcher. Um, when he met, during Choggams, you would go in, uh, the, the, the leaders one by one would go and meet the Queen and Hawke's turn came up and I got to walk into the room, stand to one side with him and uh, um, the, the Queen said, you know, how are you? And, uh, uh, I hope I didn't drag you away from anything important. And uh, no, I finished the horse racing tips. <laughs> <laughs> and and Hawke said, "Well, Margaret Thatcher's just got to her feet, so you be the judge." <laughs> and she thought that was pretty amusing. Um, but anyway, back to apartheid. And again, like, could Australia really make the difference? Well, um, at a Chogger meeting, he he secretly, and nobody knew about this until well after the event, got Jim Wolfenson yeah. on board. And he put together uh, international um, investment sanctions, actually investment sanctions yeah. against South Africa, which the and and eventually the South African Foreign Minister at the time conceded that that was a significant yeah. blow um, on that issue. Yeah, because I think trade sanctions had been tried, uh, but it wasn't really making much of an impression. And was Jim Wolf Wolfenson? Uh, had he headed the World Bank, whatever? But yeah, he was. He, he was, and, and he went, bank. flew up to Canada. I think it was yeah. during a Chogger yeah. meeting secretly. Nobody knew that he was there, and they discussed putting. They this said so. No, no, no there would be a boycott on investment from a very substantial, influential group of um, global bankers, mm. and that's what really did bring um, the regime to its knees. So it's a little bit like we did on Antarctica. It looks hard, but how about we do something a little bit different? And Bob realised that just trade sanctions, particularly Australia, saying well, we're not going to buy any of your stuff, and that's how we, we don't sell you any stuff, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, tried another <laughs> approach, and it worked. Yeah. Um, you really can't sort of uh, discuss, uh, I guess, how the office worked without talking about how the offices worked, and that is the the, the Hawke and Keating mm. offices because it was they were so um, integral to the whole operation for so so many years. Um, looking, though, at the situation these days, and it emerged after Turnbull um, and, and, and Abbott and, um, and Howard and the problems, and, and then more recently Rudd and Gillard, but there, there was a level of cooperation, though, really yeah. at the height of it. And when both knew where each other was coming from, there, there was still cooperation going on. Yeah, at the, I would read from time to time, you know, that supporters of Hawke were pouring shit on Keating and, you know, Paul Keating was pouring shit on Bob in the media. But it was very easy, I know, for me just to walk around to Paul's office and say hello to Seamus Dawes and Tom Mockridge, Paul, if he was around. Keating would, even through all this, he'd um, bring some music around for Bob to listen to. And... Um, Bob said, oh, come in, Paulie. I mean, it's hard to believe, but, you know, when Bob was in his last year and a half, I organised for Paul to come and meet. And, you know, they just spoke with great affection. Um, you know, I get quite emotional about this because, yeah, you know, they just said, we're a great team. And I remember um, Keating saying, I'd go to the lodge after all the ERC meetings and have a private talk with you, Bob, about what the traffic would bear in the budget, you know, and Bob would say, yeah, that one's okay. Well, I'm not sure about that. And the cooperation, even though rivalry had by this time emerged, this after 88 and uh, Barry and I were ha happened to be in a room uh, in Sydney at the uh, at Parliament House and John o. Johnson had organised a big fundraiser this was after the tape telephone call where 
um, I think Paul gave Bob a free reference um, on an analog um, uh, mobile phone in those days, and it was intercepted. Um, Paul Malone, wasn't it? Got the got the tape and told us all about it. Anyway, they uh, gave each other some fairly robust character references on the phone, but uh, then agreed to meet later, which they did. I went up to help Bob with the horse racing on a Saturday morning and he and Paul were talking, but they then created the Kirribilli Agreement, which they didn't tell. Did you know about that? I didn't. didn't. I didn't know. Laurie Oaks told me about it. I didn't know anything about it, but they kept that really quiet. And then Bob even said in the in his last thing, he said, I should never have broken that agreement. I should have, you know, it was the right yeah. thing to do. Well, just following up on that Kirribilli agreement and the and then the Placido Domingo speech that Keating gave to, uh, to the press club, and then Hawke called him in and thought, well, it was time to, to have this out. And he started by saying that uh, what really upset me, Paul, was when you said that Australia had never had a great leader. And... Um, and he said, I'm not thinking, I'm, th I'm thinking of John Curtin. Right? And I think it's an insult to the Labor Party. I think it might have gone a little beyond John Curtin mm. in his own mind. Um, but, but, perhaps. but that's how it opened up. And then it went on for an hour, an hour and a half. And you could just look through that peephole and mm. see what was going on. You could see, but not hear. And the whole time, um, Bob had his coat off. And he was smoking a cigar, as you could in, back then. And Keating had the suit on the mm. whole time. But he was doing almost all the talking every time I had a yeah. look. He was leaning over the desk and going flat out. But when it ended, they walked out of the room and Keating looked at me and Jeff Walsh, who was the political advisor at the time, and he said, have you blokes got a minute? And I looked at Hawke and Hawke said, oh, away you go. He took the two of us around to his office immediately after that discussion and we sat down in front of him and he took us through the whole thing again, his version of events. And now imagine that. Mm at the height of a leadership contest with any other player over the last 20 or 30 years. It just wouldn't happen. But he was so keen yeah. that we understood what his grievance was. Yeah. And I remember, um, because as senior public servants, th that, that speech at the press club was scribbled just before the actual uh, event. And Chris Higgins, uh, who was the Secretary of Treasury, had gone for a jog and I th Paul actually said to me, I told him, because he'd been travelling a lot, and he said, take it easy. And um, Chris collapsed and died. And so this was a big kind of moment for Paul, thinking, well, what am I doing here? Am I ever going to be Prime Minister? And so he gave that speech, and the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah. They, they of course, didn't get off to the best of starts. But if you go back to, was it 84, when they had the, the um, debate around the GST? And and that was that that was a pretty nasty experience, yeah. certainly from Keating's point of view. Well, I thought people were talk uh, talking earlier about whether the centre left was a faction or not. It was a faction. I used to go to centre left faction meetings, um, and we my first job was actually with Peter Walsh. Talk about memory trip down memory lane. Ross Garno said you should get Emerson on board because you you want to introduce a resource rent tax. He's done his PhD under my supervision. So uh, Peter gets me over after many, many months. Old Parliament House, where we are, um, we're walking down the corridor for my interview to see whether I'm suitable. Peter said, that's your office. And I thought, this is going well. And, <laughs> and then he said, now let's adjourn to the um, members' dining room, So, which is just down there. We uh, talked about all the spivs of um, the New South Wales right um, and the... The Western Australian right, the tax, under, the tax avoidance, bottom of the harbour schemes and everything else, drank two bottles of Horton's White Burgundy, which <laughs> um, which he described as the elixir. So John Crawford had said to me, son, when you go over there, watch out. These people drink a lot. And he was right. Anyway, I got the job because I, I think I could drink a half of a, one of the bottles of White Burgundy. But I then became a bit of an advisor on tax to the centre-left and um, we had almost resolved to oppose the GST. In interesting because it's Bill Hayden's service, the memorial service today. It was at the Santa Lucia um, restaurant where we were meeting to determine this. I'd had the, um, what do you call it, the, the, the paper out where you do all, get all the crayons and all that, the butcher's paper. And they said, okay, we'll oppose it subject to Hayden. And Hayden had come late 
And he said, yeah, let's oppose it. Uh, but what they didn't, what wasn't known to Paul um, was that I was going around to the office all the time to the Hawk office and they'd say, comrade, how's the fight? How's the battle going? How's the battle going against the GST? You remember Paul saying, I, like, I get him in the cart and then he's out of the cart. He's in the yeah. cart and he's out of the cart. Yeah. And Bob didn't want to do the GST, but he didn't want to roll Keating either. And the centre left, I think, did play a role. We came up, the, there was option A, which is the uh, fringe benefits ca tax, capital gains tax, and option C, which included the GST. No one ever talks about option B. I developed option B. <laughs> so if you ever you want to promote it, you just, just develop it. Just develop. And, <laughs> and no one took any notice of it. Anyway, um, that, that's a claim to fame, option B. Right. Well, before we lose control of the agenda, I just wanted to ask you as a former economic advisor to Bob Hawke about interest rates, because we're only days away, perhaps, from, a, from an increase. Um, I think the government's aware of what, what your attitude is around this, but just give us a, a synopsis. Uh, uh, well, they shouldn't increase interest rates, but now I'm going to be accused of... Um, prejudicing the independence of the Reserve Bank. The only people who can comment on this, Barry, are those who say the interest, you know, the cash rate must go up on Melbourne Cup Day. Anyone else, you're interfering with the independence of the Reserve Bank. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're in the Reserve Bank, the monastery. Mm -hmm. You know, don't, you know, don't, don't upset the, the chanting at, at the Reserve Bank. Well, I'll upset the chanting at the Reserve Bank, you know, because there's... Um, 400 basically like four percentage points of interest rate rises in in a fairly short period a lot of that still to be um, felt through the economy there's no doubt the economy is slowing there's no doubt that if we didn't have half a million migrants we would or little doubt that we would actually have at least one quarter of negative gdp uh growth two of those is in the media terms a recession so we haven't been that far off a recession and if they keep going, um, given that the place is slowing down a lot, and one final point, you could t increase the interest rate to 100%. You will not reduce the price of petrol, right? And that's been what's been driving the latest rises. So, you know, horses for courses, going back to where we started, yep. um, it would be, in my view, a bridge too far and they shouldn't do it. So Excellent. I'm sure I'll get a phone call about interfering in okay. the independence well of the Reserve Bank. Because this could go on, but I know there are going to be people here yep. who would like to ask questions to both. So, over to the floor, Dan Barnes. Uh oh. <laughs> no, no, I don't... <laughs> Thank you. I'm just very interested in um, in both of your perspectives on. You touched on the dynamic between the Treasurer and the Prime Minister. I'm interested in both of your views about the importance of there being tension almost between the Treasurer and the Prime Minister. If we think about the two two of the most successful governments, the, the, the Howard government and, of course, the Hawke government, they're both characterised by a degree of competition and tension between the, the Prime Minister almost as the politician-in-chief and the Treasurer as the sort of policy person-in-chief. I, mean, I know they're sort of broad generalisations, but... We've seen politics since then uh, much more about uniformity of message. We talked a bit about this earlier. You know, everything's about the message discipline and talking points and so forth. And f and 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 treasurers and prime ministers very much on the same on the same wavelength all the time. And I'm just interested in whether you think that is a a, a good prerequisite that that idea that uh, there is some sort of um, authority centre other than the prime minister within the government. Well, I, I think that is right um, because the Treasurer is going to be, a, a, is the phrase, more gung-ho uh, than the Prime Minister usually. Um, what helps a lot, an enormous amount, is if you've got the same worldview. And uh, the worldview at that time was uh, we've got this heavily protected economy that's going nowhere. Um, remember the Banana Republic statement because agricultural prices collapsed because the Europeans, who again refused to um, embrace free trade two days ago uh, with Don Farrell. They were fighting the Americans on subsidies. And we, we everyone in the office and, and beyond, including in Treasury, said those tariff barriers have to come down. We have to make Australia competitive again. 
again, talking quickly about um, Keating and the car on the, he said two things to me on two different trips that, that um, stuck in my mind. And they're always simple terms, simple things. He said, mate, we're always trying. Every day that we went to work, we didn't think it was going to be an easy, an easy day. And it usually ended up not even being the day you thought it was going to be. Um, so we're always trying. And then he said on another trip, mate, we're always ambitious for Australia. And between Hawke and Keating, Dawkins, Walsh, uh, you know, all of those senior ministers, Susan Ryan, there was a common view. So uh, that tension is very valuable when there's that common view because it's the speed, it's the pace at which you can implement reforms, not whether they should be done or not. And so, you know, if you've got a political party that doesn't have a, a common view, then that could be very destructive. But if they've got the common view, it's just about speed limits. Um, I think Costello was treasurer for the entirety, wasn't he, of Howard's yep. Howard's years? I mean, that that's a remarkable a remarkable thing to occur when there were leadership tensions there. But it's with Costello, he was able to have policy victories, and that helped. He had people on his staff, as I understand it, who were saying, right, you've had your policy victories, now go for the ultimate political victory, and he hesitated. But the same with Hawke and Keating. It wasn't just about them. And and there were um, there were times that I'm aware of where key people in Hawke's office supported Keating's initiatives, supported him, um, but not in a way that they would undermine their boss and their own leader, um, but that was just reality. And, and so... The tensions are going to be there, and it's just uh, it's just how they're handled. And the fact that Hawke and Keating and Howard and Costello um, worked together for so many years and achieved so much between them, um, that, that I think the answer to that is a definite yes. It's a it's a good thing. The two two quick examples: the third runway. People might remember that Sydney Airport. I'd originally advised against it. I got some extra information. I had to come in Monday morning to Bob and say, "Mate, I now support the third runway," and he said. Yeah, right, oh, mate. And and I teamed up with Keating. He knew that that was what was going to happen. Same thing with the telecom debate. And Paul would say, Richo, Richo, Craig, he's on our side. He's on our side. We, we won the third runway so debate. So Richo, think, go off and brief the press gallery. Yeah. Um, we, we won the third runway debate and lost the telecom debate. debate. My name is uh, Russell McGowan. I was a public servant throughout the Hawke Keating government era here in Canberra, and I re re resigned in disgust when the coalition to the government was elected um, in 1996. Um, my concern is that you, well, was the Hawke Keating government in fact lucky? Uh, was it just good luck that they achieved this reputation or, in fact, um, um, was it good management? And in hindsight, what are the uh, things that are now glossed over in their failings as a government um, which are coming home to roost in the longer term? The big failing, before I forget it, was on uh, Indigenous reconciliation. And you don't have to rely on me for that, Bob. said that is my greatest regret. regret. Um, he did on the bicentenary year of 1988 want to actually engage in negotiations for what we'd call a treaty. The name was a comp compact. But at the very, and I've still got the handwritten note at home, he did want a referendum to recognise First Nations people as the original occupants of the land. He was advised strongly uh, from Western Australia to do that. We won't have any seats there. Also from New South Wales, so he didn't do it. And that was his biggest regret. Um, more generally, though, the um, you've got to have a story to tell. You know, the public don't understand what you're doing if it's bits and pieces, bits and pieces. We had a great storyteller in Paul Keating. I mean, he was better than, I shouldn't make comparison, but he was a master at telling the story. Um, and that's when people, I think, would say, look, I don't understand all this bloody, you know, industrial relations reform and all this stuff. But they seem to know what they're talking about, and that's why we hired them. You know, we hired people, you hire people to paint walls, they're good at doing that. You hire people to mow lawns, they're good at doing that. You hire doctors, you hire politicians, you hire politicians, you don't say, well, now I want to run the country. You say, that's your job. And if they can tell a story as to what they're doing, a lot can be forgiven. A lot of little, you know, aberrations and fights and missteps and so on. 
people say, oh, yeah, but they still seem to know what they're doing. And that's why I think uh, the government was re-elected so many times. Yeah, and Keating was the great uh, storyteller in the sense that uh, the interview that he gave to John Laws, um, where he wanted to have a go at economic direction, um, that could have been a story for a while, but he just threw in the banana republic. He just had that ability to know, uh, just to know how to elevate it. And and that's what gave it the the impetus that it had. But on, on the question of whether they were lucky or not, um, if that's the case, Hawk was lucky four times. Mm. Uh, Keating was lucky once. Um, Hawke was probably lucky that uh, Bielke Peterson blew up um, in and, and, yeah. Yeah, in, in 1987. And, I mean, you could argue that cost John Howard the election. It was certainly a major factor. It's so hard to run a campaign um, when part of your party has peeled away in that way. Um, so that's when Hawke got lucky. Um, but apart from that, I think uh, they earned their luck. Can I just uh, say, I know we're pressed for time, but the fact that Bjorki Peterson entered the race showed to me that there was a lack of confidence in Howard winning that 87 election. And then he finally pulled out with the horror that's going on in the Middle East. We got off the plane from visiting Israel and we've still got down there, if you get time, a photograph of Barry and me in my old office at the Church of the Nativity. And we went from Jerusalem to uh, Bethlehem, which is in the West Bank area. It's certainly not in Israel. Um, and it was just so such a huge time, you know, the whole thing. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, getting off the plane is when we were told that um, that uh, be occupied and pulled out. But by that time, we were clawing our way back um, because of that Banana Republic statement, because of a May statement that we subsequently released, whose title was Restraint with Equity, where we cut and cut and cut. They had some of the biggest cuts in government spending ever. And we went to an election on the back of that because the story had been told about how the rest of the world had taken a lot of income off Australia. Oh, thanks, guys. Um, you've both been involved in and around politics for, for many decades. Uh, one of the, um, I suppose, arguments made for why governments are struggling to do things now relates to complexity. You know, the world's more complex than ever before and so on and so forth. Um, you know, you, you've served uh, in the Hawke government, you've observed or served in government afterwards. Is this um, is this a myth? Uh, the China... I mean, the, the China story was then a good and easy story, really. Um, there's this big country that was growing rapidly, and guess what? Can I use another Keating statement? We got a continent all to ourselves, mate. We got kicked on the ass, but kissed on the ass by a rainbow. And here we are again, you know, what are we going to do next? We're doing all this restructuring. China's growing. It's interested in our iron ore. It's interested um, later in high quality, premium, safe, clean, clean, green food, those sorts of things. So that was just unambiguously good. And no one would say, oh, don't sell all that iron ore to China. See if Indonesia wants some. No, we don't think Indonesia needs any, you know. Um so it, it wasn't that hard to, um, in, in a complex world. Now it has become more, in terms of the level of complete, now it is more complex. But, you know, Elbow's going there um, tomorrow. And I was there two weeks ago and talking with the Foreign Minister Wang Yi and so on. Sometimes things are a lot simpler than you think. Just don't go out of your way to insult the Chinese. It's probably a smart idea. You can actually manage differences. They know that you are close to the US, but when you go and insult people publicly, they're going to retaliate and they're going to insult back and the 12 demands and all this. When we're on the high-level high dialogue, I was just walking down the Chinese side and a former, recent former ambassador uh, to Australia looked up to another person He said, much easier now. <laughs> and it's, it's put a lot of stress on them too. And I think just more broadly on on the uh, the practice of politics is more difficult than it ever was right now uh, because of the 24-hour news cycle, which didn't exist when when uh, we were in, in Hawke's office. Um, now through social media, everybody has a microphone and that again adds to the pressure. But I think um, over and above all of that is that the Murdoch media is now more partisan 
than it's ever been and so ideologically opposed to everything that progressive parties do um, that I think that's making uh, politics um, more difficult than it's ever been uh, for the Labor side. And Tony Abbott's just gone on the board, hasn't he, of News Limited and declared yesterday that um, climate change is a cult. So stay tuned. Sorry. Andrew Podger here. Just one. Going back to the, the issue of, of, of the office and, and ministerial advisors, is it possible to go back to anything like what was existing in the Hawke years, given how the advisor system is now part of the uh, career progression of politicians? So many ministers are former advisors. The advisor framework is part of the way in which uh, the two major political parties see progression in within the parties. Is it really possible to go back to a lot of public servants being advisors and smaller offices and so on? Is that at all feasible today? Uh, I don't think it's gone moved as far as you you um, might be assuming. In that, uh, I know in a lot of the ministerial offices there are key public servants, quite senior ones. Um, and in terms of advisor progression, when I got here in 1984, there were lots of political advisors who subsequently you know, probably entered state politics. I entered federal politics. There are others who did. Um, there's one thing I would not want to go back to, and that is there was only one woman advisor in the Hawke office. Um, and it was just the way it was in those days. Bob would say, where's the boys? because he wanted to have a bit of fun. And the truth is, we were all boys. So that's changed a lot for the better. But Andrew, I'm not sure that I, reflecting on it, that it's been, um, you know, a kind of removal of um, public service advice. I think there's quite senior people in the system now who are in those ministerial offices. Yeah, and I, I think an, another problem too is not just uh, the number of public servants who are involved but the it's the staffing arrangement I think Troy Bramson mentioned was 10 once and now it's 50 within 30 years or something uh, the same with the press operation more so um, at least four times as many people involved in um, in communications and uh, and propaganda and so on um, and and it, it probably started I think with Kevin Rudd but this obsession with the daily the daily presentation um, that you needed to win the politics every day, every day, because that was his response um, to this new concept of a 24-hour news service. And once you focus on winning the politics every day, then you've got even less chance of, of a policy being at the centre of, of what you do. Yeah, one final question. <clears throat> Barry, uh, and when are you bringing, coming back to insiders? <laughs> my, most, my, my most popular tweet, uh, and not everyone counts their tweets, but my most popular tweet was bring back Barry, David, and uh, Gerard. Yeah, Gerard, yeah, to make it entertaining again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I I don't like um, how it's um, gone in some respects with the um, influx of even more um News Corp journalists and and those who are critical of the ABC, you know, constantly. But then I had Jared Henderson on the program. Mm. My one counter to that is that he always had David Ma sitting next to him, <laughs> and and that gave a bit of uh, counterbalance. As to I, I chose a time to leave insiders. It was um, uh, just after an election, and as it turned out, COVID was just around the corner, and I don't think I would have enjoyed that uh, one little bit. I, I enjoyed the whole live studio and catching up with both people from insiders and offsiders on a, on a Sunday morning. Um, I would have struggled to get through that period. Well, thank you, Barry. Thank you, Barry. I do think I just want to finish this story, bookend it, with horse racing, because I ne need you both to know the day horse racing saved my emerging career. I had been a public servant for about six months, and Mike Cobb, that wonderful secretary of PMC, called from Parliament House. He said, Peter, you've got to get over here. The Prime Minister is radical now. I'd gone and said something publicly and it was in the press. He said, you've gone beyond government policy. I said, what, what do I do? He said, tell him you've been thoroughly reprimanded by your secretary. 
say you'll never do it again and you're thoroughly sorry. So I went over there at three o'clock. I waited. I was told, oh, the prime minister's just In listening to a horse race. <laughs> no, I don't do it. I worked in. I was all ready to go. I had my almost resignation ready. He said, come on, Peter. 50 to one. Can you believe it? <laughs> he said, cups of tea for two. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had this cup of tea with the promise, and I started to do my mere culpa. He says, Oh, yeah, he said, Yeah, yeah. He, he says, uh, Mike raise that. Yeah, go and sort it out with him. And so I left the door and said, 50 to 1. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, thank you very much, whoever was a point. Very great. Thank you. Thank you. I <laughs> 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 Where is the No, I will introduce you and then I'll show you Is the um, where is oh, hi, get it. Okay, everybody, take your seats. Kate. Hi, I'm Nicholas Brown. I'm from the School of History at the ANU, and it's my great pleasure to chair this next session. I think we've got a, a broad range of impressions coming out about the Hawke government so far today, but I think now we're focusing very much on some specific policy issues. But I still feel there are some really strong themes that have emerged in the discussion so far. So there's Glyn Davis's point about one of the one of the striking kind of tensions within the government was how do you build a bold reform agenda while maintaining intense public engagement, particularly when you've got economic reform sitting alongside what Gareth called rather moist social issues, but nonetheless, the power of that central agenda that the government was developing. Then I think Craig has just emphasized the importance of strategic direction. Uh, in, the question that I ask of, of Gareth kind of drew out that crucial issue of who is the Hawke government listening to? Workers, unions, uh, business. That, of course, brings us, I suppose, to one of the most symbolic achievements, standards, exemplars of the Hawke government, the accord process. And we have two eminently qualified people today to offer a reflection on that. First person I want to introduce is Bruce Chapman. Uh, Bruce is an emeritus, emeritus professor of economics at the ANU. He helped introduce the HEC system and worked as an advisor to Paul Keating as Prime Minister, and in many ways, as an economist, draws out some of that extraordinary expertise that that government was drawing on in unprecedented ways. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, thank you, Nick, and thank you, Frank, in particular, for allowing me to muscle my way in on to the program. I want to begin by acknowledging the original custodians um, of the land in which we meet and to express my sadness about concerning the result on October the 14th. I want to say a couple of little things about my experience outside of the accord process. I was not involved in the accord process until right at the end. Tim Pallas and I wrote actually Accord 8, which never came to fruition because uh, the government lost the election in 1996, of course. But one of the things that struck me as extraordinary about that cabinet 
and the leadership of uh, Bob Hawke was the importance given to evidence and to academic perspectives. And there were some people who were incredibly influential who came at the world um, basically driven by the conceptual basis of economics and empirical evidence related to the power associated with that. And the person I think of most is Ross Garno. And Ross Garno was a very important, a huge, hugely influential advisor to, um, to Bob Hawke in those first few years. And I think that some part of the economic reforms have been a bit hidden uh, with, uh, with respect to the input of people like Ross Garno. The other point I wanted to make is that managing the politics is not just about managing the opposition and the parliament and the media. In that particular, that particular ha cabinet had to manage caucus as well. And I saw this up front hugely with respect to the introdu introduction of the higher education contribution scheme, which was highly much more controversial within caucus than it was outside of the parliament. And that is because most of the, what I would call the old style left, were very passionately against the reintroduction of university tuition. And the cabinet was, uh, well, I spoke to Gareth Evans about this not long ago, and he said it, it took cabinet 0.03 of a second to believe and to understand that this was a good idea, but they always knew it was going to be a huge fight. And it was a hidden fight. Uh, that John Dawkins had to have with uh, with caucus. So there were things going on behind the scenes that were quite remarkable. And I think that one of the things that we all should think about is that it was the calibre of the people in the cabinet in particular. John Dawkins has rarely talked about it too much, but I, the way I saw him operate within the caucus framework to convince the party to change from so-called free to a system whereby there was a reintroduction of university tuition, hugely controversial, hugely um, intelligent and hugely consultative. Uh, so that's my kind of background on where I came from. I spent two years as an economic advisor with Paul Keating and my major job was to make sure that things went well with the ACTU. And I'd done a lot of academic work on the effect of the accord on particularly on industrial disputation uh, and um, the effect of the accord on wage inflation, the effect of the accord on economic growth. And I think it's basically, an un it's not really a very well understood or well remarked upon transformation of the Australian macro industrial relations system, which was radical. It was so significant in underpinning the changes and opening up the economy and to change the whole nature of the structure of industrial relations and what it meant for macroeconomic management. Let me describe to you what Australia looked like in the early 1980s when Bob Hawke first won his first election. The industrial relations system was such that about 87% of all jobs were associated with a minimum wage. If you go to the United States, and as I do sometimes, and uh, at that stage talk about minimum wages across the board, hugely regulated, no one could believe that an economy could work like that. That was one of the issues that mattered. We had one of the highest measured strike activity rates in all of the OECD, and the strikes were particularly big under the period, under the previous Labor government, 74, sorry, 72 to 75. They were astronomical, and this country had become known as very strike bound. It was very bad for its industrial, the perception of industrial relations uh, internationally. So back then in 1983, we had a price inflation. You think seven is high? It was 10.5, uh, and it had been 10.5 for a while. You think unemployment rate, uh, the unemployment rate at that stage was over 10%. This is a phenomenon, the mutual existence of high inflation and high unemployment, which economists refer to as stagflation. It is the worst of all possible worlds. We had a fixed exchange rate, which meant that we had no easy international 
price competition. And then, of course, because the government was setting the exchange rate, there'd be betting going on because a huge amount of money depends on what the exchange rate is. So the politics of this, particularly when it came to what was called the country party, was extremely important in determining uh, what was going on internationally. We had a huge tariff war. We had major industry assistance. Uh, we had a national wage case which set the agenda and the wages approximately for 87% of the entire labour force determined at the national level. So there was no weight given to enterprise bargaining. There was no potential for there to be the influence of profits on individual institutions, which we call enterprises. Paul Keating described this uh, place, as he used to use the word, as a rust bucket economy. And indeed, that's exactly what it was, Australia, in the early 1980s. And one of the basic problems with this economy was that the institutional arrangements were, were all wrong. There's an extraordinary piece of work done by two Swedish economists, Karnforst and Driffel, which will dis to describe the consequences of particular institutional arrangements on how a macroeconomy works. If you have weak unions or enterprise-based unions, this is a market that can work fine. If you have craft-based unions, as we did, or industry-based unions that give no weight at all to the general social good, you'll end up with a stagflation scenario as we had in um, the early 1980s. So if you've got a lot of union coverage and potentially uh, very powerful union institutions, the ACTU at that time was an extremely powerful institution, they need to be brought along for the ride. They need to be part of the of the transition process, which can lead to the eventual demise of the arrangements which have resulted in the stagflation. And there's two ways of doing that. You can do the Margaret Thatcher way. You can crush the unions, which crushes the economy. That will work. It is hugely expensive. Or you can do something conciliatory and constructive and work out industrial relations and institutional arrangements that will lead you to an enterprise-based system and away from and uh, from both the high existence of both inflation and unemployment. Australia had what is known in the literature as a tax-based incomes policy. Basically, taxes were used to trade off on wages and some extraordinary things happened. And this pact was basically driven by a generalised agreement between the leaders of the uh, ACTU and the federal cabinet that there needed to be a transition towards a more competitively based arrangement that would result in of the avoidance and the diminution of stagflation. What they did was, this is the most extraordinary thing you could say, actually, about a union movement. What they did in 1985 and 1986 with the leadership of Bill Coulty, the um, one of the great unsung heroes, in my mind, of Australian uh, economic reform, they agreed to take a real wage cut because of the importance of the devaluation. If you have a devaluation, then prices go up. If wages then respond to the same level, then you'll perpetuate the inflation level and you'll diminish the prospects of reducing unemployment. The unions agreed explicitly and formally to a real wage cut, and in return, they got tax transfers, family assistance, childcare protection, and more than that. These are amazing things. And... I've talked to Paul Keating about how, how did this all happen? Because if you read Accord 1 and then you read Accord 8, you can't believe how different they are. They're extraordinary. It's chalk and cheese. It's like it, it, you can't, cannot believe that the two major people writing the Accord every year, which was Paul Keating and Bill Coulty, would come to where they were. And he said, I don't know, mate, it just seemed sensible. We just seemed to work it out at the time. And it was modesty in that, but there's huge intelligence. Take into account the circumstances, see what works and what does not work. So what have we got now? Industrial di disputes in this country are almost unheard of. In international terms, we are one of the least strike-prone um, countries uh, uh, in the entire world. 
we had up until recently, certainly all through the 1980s, low inflation and up until the late 1980s, extremely strong employment growth. There were no cuts, uh, costs in the form of Thatcher type. Let's crush the unions as well as crush the economy or unemployment. They allowed and facilitated one of the great reforms that came through the Accord, which was superannuation, all done with exchange rate efficiency and other major institutions like the Child Support Agency on the back of, of course, universal health insurance, which actually helped quite a lot in the maintenance of the social wage. Uh, The removal of tariffs, the major diminution of deeply unfair and uncompetitive industry assistance, this place is an extraordinary place compared to where it was in the early 1980s. And I think it's the hidden and the nuanced and the sophistication of the accord, which was opposed by many parts of the union movement. They believed, quite rightly, that this would diminish their individual power Bill Colty cared about the place so much. He and Keating, and with that extraordinary Hawke cabinet, I think have achieved something quite remarkable. We won't see the likes of it again. Uh, We're in their debt. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. We'll take uh, the second paper and then questions on both, since both will offer complementary perspectives, or maybe complementary perspectives, on the accord process. Great pleasure to introduce Liam Byrne, uh, who is a senior official with the ACTU, the ACTU's uh, official historian, but also a, a, the leader of the Future of Work program within the ACTU, and that seems really appropriate as a, a, a leverage into this conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um... Sorry, everyone, if I'm kind of at an angle. I broke my foot recently, so I kind of might be leaning a little bit. It's an awkward archiving accident. Uh, uh, also, I have to apologise that I can't begin today with any uh, great horse racing stories. Uh, I, However, which, well, so everybody knows, I am accepting tips for the Melbourne Cup uh, on Tuesday. Now, in 1979, there we are, uh, President of the ACTU, Bob Hawke, uh, was invited to deliver the ABC's Boyer Lectures. Now, Hawke, by this point, had been uh, ACTU president for a decade. Uh, It was widely assumed uh, correctly that he'd soon be moving to federal parliament. And in the course of the lecture, Hawke made uh, this statement. This is for the speed readers here. Now, what Hawke was arguing, just to kind of give you a a blurb, was that the post-war economy of consistent growth premised on full employment was no more. It was over. The economic growth model had changed. This is a new era with new challenges, the most urgent being a way to find uh, solutions to the scourge of widespread unemployment. He argued that two factors had transformed the economy in particular since 1973 to 1974 and the crisis of that point, which is growing international economic competition and new forms of technology that were transforming work practices. Old methods uh, deployed by the union movement, Hawke was arguing, were not suited for these new challenges. uh, And most particularly that dealing with the challenge of widespread unemployment in a context of high inflation. And this is an argument he'd actually been making time and again since 1975 in a whole variety of union forums, most notably the ACTU Congresses. He argued that unions had a responsibility to find new ways to respond to this crisis, even if it meant overturning well-established shibboleths. Speaking in 1979 at the ACTU Congress, Hawke expressed the labour movement's dilemma. He said, we have to protect employment and we can't opt out of the world. It's an honour to be joining you here today uh, on Ngunnawal and Nambri country, and I want to pass on my thanks for that uh, beautiful welcome earlier today. I also just want to pass on my immense thanks to Carolyn and Frank for inviting me to uh, speak today. It's a huge honour to be able to do so. Uh, it's always a pleasure to visit uh, Australia's second capital city. Um, people may uh, be aware that in the historical profession, Frank and Carolyn are both well known for their generosity and support they've shown to younger scholars, uh, and it's certainly my involvement here today is a demonstration of that. I also just want to make clear today that I uh, thank you for that lovely introduction, but I am speaking today in a personal capacity as a historian um, only. I am on leave from work today, um, so I can be relatively open, but that this is, um, you know, this is a, a personal uh, capacity presentation. And so I'm talking, of course, about industrial relations in the Hawke era, which, of course, centres around the Accord uh, agreements between Hawke's Labor and the ACTU. Now, I'm aware that in doing this, I and uh, we are stepping into hotly contested terrain. Uh, I don't think there is any other period of labour movement history that remains as contested uh, as the Accord era. I do think uh, that in recent times, some of the, uh, say, polemical frame in which the Accord has been discussed has acted to undermine more meaningful analysis that it deserves. I mean, the Accord era is rich in historical lessons, um, 
really about the you know, considering the possibilities and the restrictions for progressive change and transformation in the context both of Australia's relationships to broader economic, the inter international economy, but also within the framework of institutions that govern our own societies. It's a rich and meaningful discussion that deserves more than simple polemicism. Former ACT Secretary Bill Kelty uh, once noted that the accord was not an objective in itself, but an instrument to achieve objectives. And I think the accord uh, era fundamentally should be um, seen you know, as a set of agreements between the political and industrial wings of the labour movement to navigate what was an economic transition uh, that was imposed by shifting international forces. It was framed by a context in which the economic growth model that had been sustained through the post-war period had crumbled under the pressures of global economic changes and the inability of governments through the 1970s and the early 1980s to devise an appropriate response to this that would protect living standards prompted a series of overlapping short-term economic crises and jolts that exhausted union strategies and demonstrated that a new method was going to be required to win union demands. The labour movement was forced to make history in circumstances not of its own choosing. And the Accord was a strategy to sustain labour in office to achieve these changes on as favourable a term for workers as were possible. It was a set of agreements that, changed, that evolved over time, and I think Bruce made that per, uh, point really fantastically, to reflect the changing circumstances, but with a basic intent to navigate this transition in a way that would protect workers' living standards, but crucially would also work to build new social institutions that would intergenerationally benefit workers, uh, benefit workers for generations to come. There's no neat delineation about in the Accord era between the industrial relations, economic management um, and social policy, which is one of the things that is so interesting about it. I don't have time in 15 minutes, of course, to narrate the Accord in its entirety in early drafts of this. I certainly tried. Um, but I just want to talk about some of the key dynamics. I will focus more on the union side. I was a bit worried about that when I was reflecting on this last night, but I actually think that may be, make kind of a nice compliment to looking at the broader dynamics of governance in the Accord era. And of course, you can't really talk about the union movement's history without talking about Bob. Now, the first accord, sorry, Hawk. Uh, the first accord agreement between the ACTU and the ALP was agreed uh, by the ACTU executive in February of 1983, of course, uh, just before the election. The accord agreement as a political statement uh, was the work of many. You know, Ralph Willis, uh, of course, played a very fundamental role. Uh, Hawke was also a pivotal uh, intellectual influence as ACTU president, uh, uh, then as Labor shadow IR minister and as Labor leader. Um, Jan Marsh at the ACTU played a really significant role. Uh, and Bill Kelsey played the fundamental role, really, of bringing the, you know, the diverse perspectives across the union movement uh, behind a practical program. Um, and I think that work and what he navigated really throughout his entire time as AC2 secretary uh, in the lead up to his time as AC2 secretary in terms of actually being able to find a mechanism through which to bring those divergent sort of perspectives together is a really, really sort of under-acknowledged act of, uh, you know, of union leadership, but also of national leadership in this country with defining consequences and something that should be, uh, you know, probably talked about a bit more. By me, maybe, who knows? Now, so the first accord agreement uh, while it was being a work of many, I uh, was underpinned by a number of significant factors. And there's five that I think that are worth uh, running through very, very quickly. So firstly, as Hawke suggested, uh, in a period after 1973, 74, this was a period of deep questioning by a number of union leaders as to the future of the industries that they represented. Unionists were forced by rapid changes in the international economy and new technologies to query the future of work and how unions could best intercede in these processes to represent workers' interests. In other words, there's an intellectual world in the labour movement at this point, which very rarely gets um, mentioned in discussions of the industrial relations uh, changes of, uh, of union leaders, union intellectuals, seriously considering how these trends were going to affect working people, again, for generations to come. Uh, and they had, as also should be said, they had direct experience in recent times of how certain industries being impacted by things such as the introduction of new technologies, uh, new forms of mechanisation, were going to fundamentally disrupt industries and change the natures of work. Containerization and stevedoring industry, which led to mass reduction of the workforce being one. I didn't write that down, that was a divergence, so I'll uh, try to get back on track. So what they were looking at this period was really the effects of the influence of international competition, the influence of multinational corporations, the introduction of new technologies, and of course, the fact that this is a period of stagflation in which unemployment and inflation were both high. Bob was talking about this. This is Laurie Carmichael, the, uh, the well-known uh, metal workers union leader, also a member of the Communist Party. This is Simon Crean talking about this when he was uh, General Secretary of Storm and a Packers Union, of course, a member of the Labor Party. It was across uh, the movement, these discussions were taking place. Union leaders expressed uncertainty about the future of their industries, and they were strategizing to protect workers in a context of rapid change. So the second major factor, of course, is the series of short-term economic crises that were overlapping and propelling each other in the period of stagflation, the recession in the 1980s, most notably. 
Third factor driving the accord was the memory of Whitlam's government and the sense that unions did not make the best strategic decisions uh, in pushing for uncoordinated wage increases at that time. Fourthly, there was the hostility of the Fraser government uh, and the challenge in particular posed by his wage freeze. And fifthly, there was the collapse of indexation uh, under the pressure of the bargaining rounds. All of these factors came together to inform the first accord agreement. Now, the specific intention of the first accord uh, was to develop a viable economic and industrial strategy to tackle unemployment and inflation at the same time. Recent years, it's been really, really noticeable in discussions of the accord that there's been a pronounced tendency to dismiss just how starkly this departed from the um, monetarist orthodoxy at the time. The accord agreement was premised on unions practicing wage restraint and reducing industrial disputation, especially the agreement to no extra claims. Wage restraint, of course, provided additional space for a more expansive fiscal and monetary policy than would have otherwise been the case. The first accord also noted that a return to full employment and maintenance of real wages remained the overriding union priorities over time, which was a really significant uh, factor because it provided space then uh, for policies prioritising economic growth, which is an obvious necessity amid high unemployment. In return for the union movement's undertaking for wage restraint, the Hawke government supported the return to centralised wage in, uh, fixation, and the government and the ACTU jointly took this proposal to the Arbitration Commission. The role of the Arbitration Commission is, again, one of the very, very underrated aspects of the uh, the history of this, era, of this era. And it's often sort of assumed that basically, you know, the ACTU and the ALP got together and said, let's do this. And then everybody just went, oh, of course, that's the way it will work now. But it wasn't. This was mediated and negotiated through other institutions in the industrial relations sector as well, the Commission uh, most of all. So it was promised that the wage restraint that was uh, that would be uh, that the unions would exercise would be compensated for by tax uh, concessions. I sort of mentioned the dynamics of that changed a lot throughout the different accord era, but it would also be compensated for by the social wage, which is the introduction of social support measures to sustain and support living standards without adding to the wage bill or inflation. And in the first accord, the uh, priority was Medicare. Now. The second priority that came in uh, the years after the first accords uh, was industry superannuation and then universal superannuation, which was, of course, alongside uh, a series of investments in welfare, training and education and industry support. But I just want to make a point about these two uh, measures in particular, because the social wage is often described in a relatively passive way and it's sort of like, oh, yes, and there was a bargain, there was an agreement or something, and there's not much history to it uh, that's sort of provided. Also, you know, particularly now um, over the last week, and I know that Carolyn's I'm going to talk more about this later, it's really sort of struck me just how important it is that we have a historical awareness of where things like Medicare have come from, why it's important we maintain them uh, with the universality with which it was intended. Um, and, you know, providing a sort of sense that these systems weren't always there, like they actually came from something, they were part of a contest. So the social wage, uh, I, I think, is one of the most significant contributions the union movement has made to Australia um, out of many. So Simon Crean, who was Secretary of the Storm and Packers uh, in the 1970s, made an interesting point that you may, may not be able to read on this slide. I can send it to you, it's all right. Uh, where he's talking about the issues that are animating his members and how expectations had been heightened quite significantly by the experience of the Whitlam years. Uh, and the people were, uh, workers were increasingly believing that issues that had previously been seen as non-industrial were in fact industrial issues that their unions should be taking up. Now under the Fraser government, there was insistence on private individualized insurance models. But the union movement developed an alternative strategy um, to secure and embed collective vehicles for protection against social risk. And very similar dynamics are actually evident in the campaign for universal healthcare insurance and industry-based superannuation, where unions became uh, champions of issues that were previously not described as uh, or defined as being industrial, industry campaigns that experienced some success in achieving these uh, claims in certain areas. This success was restricted to the better organised industries, meaning that many workers didn't gain the benefit of them. So we then see a united effort by the, across the union movement to make these schemes universal through new national frameworks, and the accord became the mechanism through which to achieve this. So, you know, I won't steal Carolyn's fun, I know she's talking about this more, but famously the unions in 1976, uh, Bob Hawke led a national strike action to try and protect Medibank when it was being dismantled by, uh, initially being dismantled by Fraser. After the system was done away with, unions in the petrol industry uh, included the claim for healthcare on their employers in a 1982 dispute. And Bill Kelty's recounted that this is a strategic move to split employer support uh, for private health and to build, uh, build momentum for reintroduction of a system of universal uh, uh, health insurance. In other words, basically saying to the employees, if you don't want to be paying for this, you better get behind a national scheme. Medicare became a fundamental social wage demand, of course, of the union movement in the first accord. But it's also worth noting that in the campaigns for superannuation funds, there were similar um, dynamics of industrial struggle. So the first industry fund, not the first union fund, but the first industry fund, which was BUS, with, uh, or today's CBUS. Uh, this was a product of an industrial campaign in the building industry in 1984, which gave momentum for super claims in other industries and eventually the, uh, the introduction of universal superannuation. So the strategy of the accord erased the arbitrary line that had been drawn between the industrial and the social in the protection of, of workers' living standards. 
Now, the first accord agreement was uh, a success on its own terms. Uh, we heard about the horrible situation that existed in the early 1980s. Under the first accord, the economy grew, inflation fell, and employment rose. But from the mid 1980s, the accord takes uh, on the accord agreements, I should say, sorry, take on um, you know, a less optimistic hue, and they start to be restricted a bit in scope. This is driven by the economic difficulties of the mid 1980s, most notably the uh, devaluation and the balance of payments deficit that resulted from the falling commodity prices. And this is a difficult uh, moment for the accord, and it was vital for the government's economic strategy to maintain wage restraints so that wages didn't chase the rising cost of imports. We saw this complicated series of negotiations over wage discounting, tax concessions, and other forms of non-inflationary wage deferral, uh, such as support for the 3% award based super in 1986. Now, the moment of economic challenge also caused a crisis mentality across government, but also led to it re-emphasising the need uh, for economic restructure. And so across the country, all of a sudden, you have resident galahs talking about microeconomic policy. Thank you. Uh, I can't be the only person who rewatched Labor in Power in anticipation of this event, but uh, anyway. So the government's reform agenda sparked tensions with the union movement, but it also sparked tensions within the union movement. As the movement sought to negotiate this era by accepting reforms that it deemed to be necessary to enhance the competitiveness of industry, but trying to do so on terms that were as favourable as possible for working people. So in 1987, uh, the ACTU released a document on future strategies for the union uh, movement, and it revealed the strategic assessment that was uh, being made by, uh, by unions. The first one was that unions had a responsibility to be involved in the processes of production rather than just seeking to distribute its receipts. Acceptance of responsibility of the economy's uh, growth and trying to get the economy moving. And it also stated that there are strategic advantages to working with Labor government, but there will inevitably be tensions due to different priorities. Effectively, what was happening was that unions were looking around the world and assessed the trajectory of change. They sought to negotiate these changes and their application in Australia to try and assure that as far as possible, they took place uh, on terms that were favourable to working people. So, for instance, when it came to uh, uh, productivity enhancements, the union movement sought to reframe these around things such as uh, education and training in the, um, the award restructure that was taking place in the late 80s. These dynamics also assisted in transforming union attitudes towards enterprise bargaining, which of course be one of the most significant industrial changes of this, uh, in this era. So the economic restructure was placing major challenge on an industrial relations system that had effectively been developed in the era of protective tariffs. The reform agenda and its emphasis on productivity enhancements at the enterprise level seemed to many to run counter to a heavily centralised wage system. So in 1987, the ACTU and the government agreed to a two-tier system that combined forms of centralisation and decentralisation through both a general increase of wages and a secondary decentralised increase that could be accessed after reforming work practices to increase efficiency and productivity. So this is a fundamental uh, change for the union movement. Many unionists felt that the system uh, as it worked, as a centralised system, wasn't tenable anymore for the circumstances. This is a quote, um, an overly long quote from the uh, Tom McDonald, who's National Secretary to Building Workers Industrial Union. And here he's talking about this one of the wage committee's meetings, a seven hour meeting, and how difficult it was to actually try to find uh, a movement that was going to be effective for people all across the economy, all the different awards, all the different schemes, and get something that was generally going to be workable uh, across uh, workplaces. Unions were also uh, concerned at this point about the rising threat of the political right, uh, and particularly the new right, and its plans to introduce de-collectivised forms of bargaining, including their plan for enterprise bargaining, which is very different to what the union movement was talking about, but also their plan to introduce forms of individual agreements. The movement's shift towards enterprise bargaining was seen by some sections of the uh, union movement effectively as an implementation of the inevitable, while political circumstances were relatively favourable. It was also conceived as a release valve, especially for the better organised workers who'd sustained significant real wage uh, reductions under the centralised system. And so famously, uh, amid the 1991 recession, ACTU and the Hawke government made a joint uh, uh, submission to the Arbitration Commission for Enterprise Bargaining to introduce a greater extent of enterprise bargaining into the system. Two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, the commission initially, I'm going to talk faster, initially refused uh, and said the parties needed to further develop their proposal and made the ill-judged statement that parties lacked the maturity necessary uh, for enterprise bargaining. Unions renewed threats to launch a campaign uh, of claims directly on employers, and a reluctant commission shifted in October to allow for enterprise bargaining, um, uh, but a fundamental shift had already taken place. Hawke's prime ministership ended in December 1991, and I think it's really striking to look back at really how much his career up to that point had been bound by his connection to and relationship to the arbitration system, while it was the reforms that he had unleashed as prime minister that would lead to its fundamental reconstitution in the ongoing and you know controversial shift towards enterprise bargaining, which is of course consolidated in a 1993 legislation under Keating. I'm not going to talk about that because I want to be invited back uh, for the second conference in 2031, so I don't give away all the good material. 
But I do think that, you know, truncated uh, sort of story about enterprise bargaining helps illustrate the dynamics at a time where the union movement is responding to circumstances not of its choosing, seeking to negotiate change as much as possible on its own terms through a relationship with political labour in a manner that enabled a painful but uh, necessary process of transition. To finish up, I simply want to say that the Accord era defies neat and simple conclusions. The original uh, Accord statement, and like a giant nerd, I actually brought my copy of the original Accord statement, um, concludes with the words, while the pace of economic and social reform will be gradual, it will uh, also be demonstrate, uh, demonstrable in its continual application that over time, economic and social aims can and will be realised. The Accord Agreement was made by leaders of a movement who were aware of the immense challenges but had no idea of what the future was going to hold. They were determined to find new ways to pursue the historic objectives of the union movement. We can uh, and we should debate and consider the outcomes, but the integrity of their purpose in pursuing this extraordinary challenge, changes in this extraordinary challenging time shouldn't be denied. And to borrow very, very quickly, well, to steal, actually just outright to steal uh, from a scholar who's far greater than uh, myself talking about a different period of time, uh, a nation that can throw up leaders of such quality would do well to honour them. Thank you. Thank you both, Bruce and Liam. Uh, extraordinary way of drawing a lot of themes that we've been talking in general terms this morning together before lunch. I'm sure there'll be questions or observations. Over to you all. I mean, you know, this is the period of the H.R. Nichols Society. It's a period where there's a kind of, there are some emblematic um, uh, sort of industrial disputes that are kind of used by the new rights um, to... I guess, push out the boundaries of industrial relations in Australia. I wonder what impact that environment had on the union movement on, I guess, just deliberations over the accord. I mean, does it sort of occur in a bubble or, or you know, away from that, you know, the kind of industrial relations club critique, for instance, that, that you, you find in the 80s that Jared Henderson claims as his own, um, speaking of our mate, um, Yes, I just wondered what, what the relationship of this is to, I guess, what was happening on the new right and industrial relations. I'm a bit nervous. Is this working? Yes. I'm always nervous when I start talking because I've got a, a loud voice and so I never want to, like, you know, speak straight into a microphone and sort of split everybody's ears. There's, the new right um, was a transnational phenomenon and I think the first thing to say was that basically throughout the entire era of the Accord, you can only understand the Accord and the union movement's thinking in reference to the union movement's conscious understanding about the shifting international trends in politics and industrial relations. So the new right really was, you know, in its Australian incarnation. And of course, it matters that the new right was talking about things such as the HR Nichols Society by, you know, the essence of its very name was attempting to talk about the arbitration system, what had established, uh, been established here. But it was talking about something broader, which is part of a, an international conversation, which is effectively the desire to re-commodify labour to the greatest extent possible and doing so by unpicking all as much as you could forms of collective bargaining and collective wage determination as they existed. That was the transnational project of the new right fundamentally. And so there was definitely in the Australian incarnation, but even before the Australian incarnation, there was a deep awareness uh, of that. And so, you know, Thatcherism and so on, like obviously these things play into accounts. But then once you start to see that the new right figures are starting to do things which had never previously been done, like using um, common law, very, very explicitly to undermine union, unionism and unionisation. You start to see very, very aggressive industrial fights which are taking place, as you, uh, the ones you mentioned. Uh, the other one, of course, would be, um, you know, cause I, the, seeing Joe uh, Bjorki peterson up there, I have to talk about the SEQEB dispute up in um, prison. Like, there is a deep, deep awareness of this. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of the time, it's hard to get the balance right in sort of understanding this because there's the union movement had an entire you know, realm of ideas that was interconnected with what was happening elsewhere. And so it's hard to say like, okay, so enterprise bargaining came up as an idea. The new right had this idea. The union movement had this idea. This must just be the same idea, right? That's the way it sometimes get presented in the, um, in the literature. But they were incredibly different ideas, as I mentioned, because the whole point of what the new right were trying to do, and the union movement was very aware of this because the new right did not hide it. They like, they have held symposiums on it and they published it. Like, you know, given the fair due, like the HR Nichols Society is obvious about what it's attempting to do. You know, like there's, yeah, it, it is an honest organization, let's put it that way. 
But the union movement was aware that what they were trying to do was to individualize bargaining as much as they possibly could. And to come to a point of, a, of agreements, which is what Howard did subsequently try to implement, where the, the negotiation, it'd be freedom of contract in the 1890s, effectively. It returns to that sort of idea that managerial prerog uh, prerogative reigns supreme and workers lose their ability to bargain collectively on the labor market. So even if you look at you know, the controversial introduction of enterprise bargaining, the union movement's position and what fundamentally you get is not just free for all enterprise bargaining it's enterprise bargaining in a certain context with a clear social safety net which had been constructed outside of the industrial system and then a safety net inside the industrial system which is the function the awards were supposed to perform how successful that was or otherwise that of course is a debate but the intention is incredibly different to what the new right we're trying to achieve and so thank you for that question frank so i think that you know in this context and also there's people who were technically, and I mean, uh, is John Howard part of the new right or not? You know, like there's all this sort of, he was clearly an odious little fellow, just like he remains. But, you know, like in terms of the actual, you know, politics of it, do you categorize him in that or not? I mean, Costello clearly was. All those sort of things are there. Um, but you can see that there is this culture and this dynamic which is beginning to shift. And I think it's quite interesting to sort of see the way the contemporary right has actually begun to lose some of the awareness of those things and it concentrates on um, other aspects of it. But um, yeah, I just really wanted to have a chance to take a shot at John Howard, who reminded us all this week of, again, what an odious little fellow he's always been. Bruce, did you want to add? Um, I wouldn't add much to that, except there was an acute awareness, as far as I can tell, that the alternative was the kind of, I don't know if I call it new right, I don't know much about politics, that's kind of, let's cross the unions. Uh, and that's what happened in, in, in Britain. And the costs to that were massive. And I think that that was completely understood. And it was, we're in this together. We've got a shared agreement about what's good for the country. It's not going to be a war with employers. The only thing that was absolutely clear for me from my dealings with the ACTU was that enterprise bargaining at a firm level, organised and facilitated with union representation, is completely different from individual contracts. And there was a big, there was a huge uh, incident in 1995 where um, uh, Rio Tinto decided it was basically going to introduce individual contracts and sack workers from the enterprise-based agreement. And it was very clear that the ACTU was not going anywhere near that. But what they, I think that they were just, I think they just got it. Um, and uh, the cabinet got it and Hawke got it and Keating got it. Although, but they kept on getting it differently and responding to, to circumstantial um, things that were happening. Like, for example, when the tariff walls started to fall, that would always necessarily change the nature of the power and the structure of unionism. And they took it. They all did it together and they learned by doing, as I said, quite extraordinary. Thanks, Frank. Um, Liam, I um, know you were pressed for time, but you didn't mention anything about the gender implications of the introduction of the enterprise bargaining principle. And of course, there was a intervention by women's electoral lobby and, and National Pay Equity Coalition and so on, on this issue, which succeeded in getting the introduction of that principle delayed by at least a few months. Um, but uh, I remember that Martin Ferguson, as president of the ACTU, did uh, say that it was hairy-legged Femocrats who were responsible for trying to deprive men who were in the position to get higher wages for, from, from doing so. Uh, so it was quite a big thing at the time. And, and uh, the Hawke government, of course, um, as a trade-off, did... Uh, fund working women's centres to try and, you know, counteract the the effects, the perceived effects of the enterprise bargaining principle in increasing their gender pay gap. Yeah, well, firstly, just in terms of the, um, you probably won't be surprised to hear, I don't have a huge amount of uh, kind words to say about Martin Ferguson in this or any other forum, uh, but the dynamics that you mentioned, I, um, I, I Again, I did hesitate to with this because I didn't want to um, go into the point of saying a critical assessment of here's what I think enterprise bargaining did and didn't deliver, but I was rather simply to capture those broad dynamics. I think you're right that it's one of the fundamental issues about the entire Accord era is that it was, you know, it was assist it, they were trying to devise strategies and means to advance workers' interests in a time of inequality. And the, those measures were all imperfect. And we see that there's a serious attempt throughout that to try and work out, okay, well, how do we actually mitigate the effects 
on uh, more vulnerable workers, which did at that time in particular mean women who were placed in more vulnerable places within the uh, labour market. And they were definitely imperfect strategies. And I think that, you know, you could sort of see that one of the things that has changed in the union movement since then was that at, that is a point where you begin to have more and more women leaders coming through like Jenny George and others who are actually able to, you know, pr provide or Anna Booth and, and so on, provide more of an aspect, you know, to really try and change that dynamic, what is being taken into account, how well it's being done and so on. So uh, what I will say is that the, um, in that era as well, there were attempts to try to mitigate some of the worst uh, inequalities of the labour market throughout the Accord for instance, when it comes to things such as the two-tier um, sort of system that was introduced, that the former supplementary payments were uh, those proposed were explicitly to uh, you know, to enhance those in a worse-off bargaining position, and these were mediated and changed a great deal by the commission as well. So that's what I think in terms of the arbitration, oh, sorry, industrial relations commission and its role that it played within mediating these agreements that also distorted a number of the intentions of what the union movement was trying to achieve which is a very incomplete answer to a, a wonderful and very, very long and deep question uh, and something that I think the union movement, um, you know, has been constantly, you know, questioning and talking about. And when we do come to that point of, as, you know, of assessing enterprise bargaining, uh, what its effects were and that longer discussion is something that is absolutely central to discussions they should be and they have to be, which is not a very fulfilling you know, thing I know to say in this, uh, in this context, but... I've got a bit of a sentimental attachment to Australia Reconstructed, and I saw you had a reference to it there on one of your slides. Was it completely irrelevant to this debate? Uh, so, it's, it's Trey, thank you. That's uh, not many people have a sentimental attachment to Australia Reconstructed <laughs> anymore, but uh, my copy's in my bag, actually. I've got a signed copy in the office as well. I can show you some sign, but I didn't bring that with me. But so people aren't aware Australia Reconstructed was basically a report that was devised. Um, I think Dawkins uh, signed off on it as well, but it was predominantly from the ACTU as in a, a trade so a, a visit that took place um, across across Europe uh, and looking at the social model countries, but particularly influenced by Laurie Carmichael, who was at the ACTU at that point and previously been at the Metalworkers uh, Union. And it was, you know, really, really considering the, the models as they existed in the European social market, but particularly Sweden. Uh, and, you know, that document has often been set, seen as, you know, earlier we talked about Houston's longest suicide uh, note. This is kind of seen as like the longest irrelevant um, report. I mean, that's completely unfair to it because the ideas did percolate through into a whole bunch of different um, areas. I think that the it's one of those points of tension between the union movement, the ACTU and this era is I think that there were, there were immense efforts made to restructure the education and training system, devise new forms of that system, um, how it could work to enhance productivity, um, but also build the skill sets and ongoing reskilling of working people throughout their entire careers. Huge amount of proposals in Australia reconstructed that, you know, very, very influential, but weren't necessarily all implemented. There's also things about restructuring of industry in there, which work out. But I mean, one of the fundamental points of it is that that report really, really proposed uh, industry planning on a way that clearly there wasn't appetite for in Australia at that time politically. Um, so I think that, you know, it's filled with ideas. It shows, you know, a lot of, you know, it, it spurred thinking, but in terms of practical application, I think that it was limited in that sense. But it's a wonderful document and I'm certainly not going to diminish it. I share your... <laughs> Thank you very much. We have run a little bit over time. Thank you both, Liam and Bruce, for, for those presentations and for this discussion. <laughs> and now we'll break for lunch out sorry, there sorry. Uh, and yeah. reconvene yeah. at sorry. 2 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you both. So please help yourself. There's plenty. There's plenty there. Yeah. Hold on, Bruce. Um,
from the study from the state here. We go to the place where we know this, where we know this. We always don't have both of those. We have this very child in the middle of that place. We do this with the two, but I like to say. What is my name? This is a big problem. I don't know why. This is the kind of same thing. It's a great thing. It's made up. It's a great thing. It's a great thing. Why 
So I think it's this, um, that green button there. So look, let's just test it. I'm um, sorry. Um, so this has been given a new title? No, it should, shouldn't have been. Press that green one. Okay. No, this is the wrong. Oh, I'm so sorry. This is the wrong, this is the wrong slideshow. Yes. Oh. Let me let me go and get my uh, phone. Okay. Yeah, that's all right.
What's that, sir? This equality at home is for a conference last year. Oh, right. Okay. So Mary can email the presentation. Well, I don't know whether I can. Can we just put it in? Oh, I see. Okay. I could send you the book symposium slideshow. Well, it should be. Here, should... So yeah, there it is. Is that, is that the one? That's the wrong one. That's not the right one. So that's wrong. No. Oh, okay. Um, let me think. How do we do this? So I don't have it at all. You'd need to. I suppose you if send I can. It to you two days ago. You know, that's the only one that I've got that I'm aware of. I would have just downloaded what. Mary could log into someone's. Office. So did you send a second one? No, I just sent one. I thought I sent you the book symposium one. But it must you must have sent that. Sword. Otherwise, why would I I wouldn't have that? So that's not it, no. obviously. Yeah. No. No, because that's the only one I have. Oh god. Because you wouldn't have sent me two. No. Uh but do you have it there? I don't it's in Dropbox, but I don't know how to get to Dropbox. Okay. Uh if if um, if we can get um so what we need, don't we can't we get Chenna to access it from her computer? Yeah. But there must okay. be a way of doing that. If it's but in your probably access Dropbox in here if um if yeah. you know you're logging. But but we need a do we have internet? We don't I presume so. Let's see, we may not have internet. Yeah. yeah. So we might need he he he'd have an internet connection over here. Oh, looks like we have internet. So we can go to Dropbox. And you can log in. Do you know your Dropbox details, Mary? Uh, no, of course I don't. Oh, okay. That's not going to, we're not going to ask no internet. Yeah. Um, to get into it, would need. Hi, Mary. Hi.
Leona Landis, for example, and Professor Bongiorno, I can't see. Okay. Um, yeah, we might get started then. I'm Carolyn Holbrook from Deakin University in Melbourne. Um, thank you all so much for being here today. Um, I One of the people we invited who was not able to come was Ian McPhee. Uh, Ian uh, has been quite unwell. He's been in hospital, but he's, he's recovering now. Um, and he apologised that he couldn't attend um, the symposium, um, but he's been sending through some emails. So if I can just read a little bit from some of the emails that Ian's been sending. I'm sorry that I can't join you on the special occasion. Bob and I formed a friendship in 1965 when he assisted me when I was advocate for the fledgling trade unions in PNG. We then worked closely when I was director of the Victorian Chamber of Manufacturers from 1970 to 1974, and we saw each other in private when he was PM. As my interest in industrial relations began in 1965 with Bob's assistance, I remained a supporter of trade unions. And when I became Minister for Employment and Industrial Relations in 1982, I sought to make reforms that increased productivity by mechanisms whereby employers and trade unions could work together to create improved work environments, jobs and increase skills and wages. I was trying to move towards negotiations between employers and unions at the work level and place collective bargaining second. After I left parliament, I joined Bill Kelty, then secretary of the ACTU to pioneer enterprise bargaining. Bill was among union leaders who joined me when I was minister to try to form a process with employer organizations to ensure that serious negotiations occurred without having to go to the arbitration commission. Led by Bill, the unions were most coordinated, but the employer bodies were reluctant to change the system in case it was more difficult for them to achieve what they wanted than was the case with the prevailing system then. Hence, I could not achieve as much as I wanted. When Bob won the, the election in March 1983, he immediately arranged the same process that I had tried to gain, and he was able to negotiate with employer organisations far more effectively than I could because they knew that they would not get any support for anything that was reactionary, whereas they were sure that enough people in the Fraser Cabinet would oppose my proposal. Bob had three years ahead of him and the employers had to face that reality. Hence, Bob gained the sensible accord that he had been determined to begin his prime ministership with. It would be an honour to... Oh, I'll just read something else that he says about a couple of other social policies. So I, I tested Ian McFeed's record of, of that um, scenario with my husband, who's a, an IR academic, and, and Anthony thought um, that Ian McFee was being quite modest and perhaps even underplaying his role in things, which seems to be a, a, a measure of the man, as everyone reports about him. Uh, he just says a couple of other things. This relates to what Marion Saul will be talking about. In the Hawke government's first term, I accepted Susan Ryan's request to help her draft the sex discrimination bill. When I was Minister for Productivity, I was also Minister assisting the Prime Minister on the status of women. That was why Susan asked me to help, and I was delighted to do so. I was the first male in Parliament to call himself a feminist. When Susan introduced the bill, the Howard opposition voted against it, and I crossed the floor and voted for it with the Hawke government. I also voted for the first motion in the new Parliament House in September 1988. Bob moved a motion asserting that his government would pursue policies that opposed discrimination, such as on gender, race or religion. The actual wording was similar to those used by me on many occasions when Minister for Immigration. Uh, and and we all know about this famous incident. I I, I think he let, he spoke in, in support of the motion. Howard assisted that the opposition strongly oppose it, uh, and he crossed the floor famously with Ruddick and and Steele. Paul, thank you. Um, and as we left the chamber, Bob almost embraced me and thanked me for my support. So he, um, Ian says it would be an honour to participate, but I'm not well enough to do so, especially with the travel. I'm sure it will be a great celebration. Please give my best wishes to Gareth.
Okay, so welcome to this um, session. There's been a slight change of plans. I'm going to present about Medicare um, now and then we'll hear from PTU and Marin Saul will, will be presenting in my slot a little bit later on. So um, Medicare turns 40 next year and I understand that the Labor government has some celebrations in mind. Um, Labor has benefited politically from its role as the founder of Medicare, so don't be surprised if you see Mark Butler blowing out candles on a green and gold birthday cake. Labor has also benefited from its role as the defender of Medicare, initially against its abolition and more recently against the introduction of co-payments and the privatisation of the payment system. While Medicare must be seen as one of the great and enduring achievements of the Hawke government, it's interesting to hold the mythology of its introduction, such as there is one, which is a whole other question for debate, against the reality of its introduction. So in this talk, I'll provide some background on the politics of healthcare before talking about the circumstances of the introduction of Medicare. So the renowned social laboratory of the early Australian Commonwealth was less bold in health reform than in other areas of welfare provision. The only health power given to the Commonwealth in the original constitution related to quarantine. From early on, there were promises of a national insurance scheme of the kind introduced in Germany in 1889 and in Denmark in 1907. In 1910, Alfred Deakin sent the Commonwealth statistician George Nibs on a study tour of Europe. Nibs was most impressed with the scheme being developed by the British Liberal government and the older German system, crediting the latter with explaining in part the rising status of that nation. The Labor Party was conflicted internally about how best to deliver health care and wavered between support for an insurance scheme to which taxpayers contributed and a scheme wholly funded through consolidated revenue like the old age and invalid pensions. The push for social insurance increased during the 1930s, led by the Age newspaper and elements within the ruling United Australia Party. Such a scheme was perceived to be a symbol of modernity and a rational socioeconomic order. National insurance was finally introduced by the Lyons government in 1938, but in the face of unrelenting opposition from country party backbenchers, the medical profession and private insurance companies, the Prime Minister used the encroaching international crisis to first curtail and then abolish the scheme entirely. And this is the controversy that led Robert Menzies to resign from the Lions Cabinet. Ambitious plans proposed by the Labor government of the 1940s for a national health service were thwarted, though it did succeed in a referendum to allow its pharmaceutical benefits scheme. And in the judgment of James Gillespie and Anne-Marie Boxall, Labor's efforts, quote, had profoundly altered the politics of healthcare. The public and politicians on both sides accepted there was a legitimate and necessarily necessary role for the national government in financing access to medical services. In 1954, after protracted negotiation with the medical profession, the Menzies government introduced a publicly subsidised private health insurance system. So the, the Whitlam opposition inherited much of the reformist spirit of the post-war reconstruction government of Ben Chifley. Whitlam took a universal health policy to the 1969 election. And as many of you would know, the intellectual impetus for Medibank came from two young health economists from Melbourne University, Richard Scotton and John Diebel. Medibank was introduced in mid-1975 after a very bitter battle with the medical profession, um, largely due to the work of Bill Hayden. Um, that battle was won and the opposition also of some of the states. The Fraser government made various changes to Medibank before abolishing the universal scheme altogether in 1981 and privatising Medibank. So in a changed economic environment in which similar countries were winding back government expenditure, the Labor opposition did not immediately recommit to a policy of universal health insurance. There was a range of reasons. Not only was the Labor Party reeling and riven by retribution and division following its dismissal in 1975, but philosophical differences on social policy that had long characterised the Labor Party continued. 
The party's first two opposition health spokespeople after the dismissal, both of whom were medical doctors, were opposed to a Medibank-style scheme. Moss Cass disagreed with the fee-for-service arrangement with general practitioners, preferring an NHS-style nationalised system of salaried employees. He bolstered Labor's community health program, which, which proposed community-based health centres offering comprehensive medical and dental care as well as health promotion. And this is something that Mark Butler is talking about very much at the moment. Health maintenance organisations, which were inspired by Richard Nixon's health policy, would provide comprehensive care for an annual payment delivered by a salaried medical service. Cass's successor, Dick Krugman, believed that Medibank was, quote, middle-class welfare and that government-subsidised health services should be targeted to low-income people. In 1982, Whitlam's successor as the leader of the Labor Party, Bill Hayden, decided to revive Medibank, uh, later renamed the Hayden Health, pa Health Plan, the Hayden Health Plan. The support of the Co Australian Council of, a of Trade Unions for a universal insurance scheme was crucial during this phase. After the failure of, tr of the Truman administration's attempt to introduce national health insurance in 1949, American unions began to negotiate health insurance with employers on an industry basis. This form of welfare capitalism, which removed a vital advocate for a, health a universal scheme from the scene, could easily have played out in Australia had the ACTU not held firm on the need for a national system. All that remained of Medibank in the platform was a sentence confirming the party's commitment to, quote, introduce a universal health insurance scheme financed by an income-related contribution. There was a dis disjuncture between the official policy and what the party's parliamentary leaders believed was politically feasible. The proposals for a community health program and health maintenance organisations would pit the Labor Party against the formidable Australian Medical Association and its desire to retain fee-for-service provision. Such radical change would be slow and very hard won. By contrast, a universal health insurance system could be rapidly implemented. The Health Insurance Commission, which had been established to administer Medibank, had survived the abolition of Medibank uh, in order to run the government's private health insurance fund, Medibank Private. It retained the expertise to re-establish a national insurance scheme. In addition to its political advantages, a revived insurance system had significant economic positives for a Labor Party that sought to distance itself from the legacy of the big spending Whitlam government. Labor's industrial relations spokesperson, Rolf Willis, had developed the idea of a formalised agreement between the unions and Labor and government, which was adopted as policy at the Labor Party conference in 1979. At the insistence of the ACTU, universal health insurance would be a part of the formal agreement. In exchange for a social wage, the union movement would refrain from demanding wage increases that threatened to increase inflation. The first prices and income accord was struck in February 1983, just before the election of the Hawke government. So the revival of universal health insurance was by no means certain when Bill Hayden was replaced as Labor leader in February 1983 by the former ACTU leader, Bob Hawke. Though Hawke went into the general election a few weeks later promising to introduce universal health care, neither he nor his Treasury spokesperson, Paul Keating, were ideologically committed to the policy. Ideological conviction came instead from the health spokesman, Neil Blewett. Blewett was an Adelaide-born scholar-politician with a PhD in political science from Oxford. His PhD was on Lord, Lord, Lloyd George's Liberal government, so he was well-versed on its introduction of a social insurance scheme in 1911. Days after winning the election in March 1983, the Labor government discovered a massive $9.6 billion budget deficit, which led to the abandonment or postponement of several spending promises. The force of the ACTU's demand, together with Blewett's advocacy, ensured that Medicare survived. Ultimately, however, it was Hawke, Keating and Treasury's growing faith that Medicare, as part of the accord, could indeed become an important part of Labor's anti-inflationary policy that ensured its introduction. So Hawke was in a rush to get Medicare launched after winning the election. He hoped to go to an early election in 1984 and he wanted key planks of the Labor platform in place before then. 
There was a vast amount of work to be done to get Medicare up and running in a very short amount of time. Blewett needed to negotiate agreements with the states on hospital funding. He needed to get the doctors on side after the notoriously acrimonious relationship with the AMA and the Whitlam government during negotiations over Medibank. The government needed to enrol the population in the Medicare system and issue them with plastic cards, which was a novel technology in 1983. It needed to organise a massive payment system and open Medicare offices around the country. And with the early election in mind, the government needed to manage the politics of this massive social reform. So Blewett commissioned research in 1983 from ANOP, uh, the Labor Party's pollsters, to help devise a communication strategy for the introduction of Medicare. One of the clear findings of the market research was that there was no popular groundswell for change in health insurance policy. ANOP claimed that there was no, quote, no strong groundswell for change because of a general feeling that there had been too many changes in health insurance systems over the past decade. Many expressed an attitude that, quote, things were okay before Medibank came in, though often what they were complaining about was one of the hybrid post-Medibank schemes under the Fraser government. ANOP declared, concluded that, quote, damage has been done to the overall previously favourable image of the original Medibank concept. The September 1983 ANOP report said, quote, the cynicism and distaste for politicians continually changing the system makes it essential that the selling of Medicare be seen as more a commercial marketing exercise than as another politically motivated situation. It was also clear from the ANOP work that economic issues were foremost in people's minds in 1983. The major concern was unemployment, which peaked at 10% in 1983, and people were also worried about inflation and levels of taxation. Health insurance was not even the most prominent of the social welfare issues. There was greater concern about pensions and social welfare benefits, followed by education. When ANOP asked people in September 1983 about the best things the federal government had done or is doing so far, it had only been in government for six months, unemployment fighting measures were top of the list, soundness of economic management came second, stopping the Gordon below Franklin Dam came third, and, Medibank, and Medicare came fourth. The ANOP research was heated in the government's Medicare advertising. Cheaper, simpler, fairer became the mantra, and Bob Hawke fronted a television campaign which urged Australians to register for, quote, the cheapest, simplest and fairest health insurance scheme Australia's ever had. ANOP polling showed that a sceptical public quickly grew very attached to Medicare, and you can see the progression from 44% in favour in 1983 to 71% in 1989. So those who were unsure about Medicare broke overwhelmingly in favour of support. Uh, here are some figures from 1989 and 1990. Hmm. Sorry about that. Here are some figures from 1989 and 1990 showing support at 71% and opposition as low as 22%. Okay. The ANOP polling from the 1980s showed that support for Medicare did not mean unconditional support. Many people believed it needed improvements. While Medicare remains very popular today, levels of dissatisfaction have also increased markedly and we're all familiar with the crisis in general practice, um, the disappearance of bulk billing, huge gap payments and the long waiting lists for elective surgery. And, and you might have noticed in the past couple of days that the government's been doing a lot of media about the, the increased funding for bulk billing for vulnerable populations. Uh, we have a fee-for-service fee curative health system instead of the comprehensive and preventative system that we need in an age of chronic disease. How we reorient our health system in a fiscally constrained environment is something that taxes the minds of our best policy thinkers. But what can we learn from the circumstances of Medicare's introduction? So it was championed by the union movement and conviction politicians like Blewett. It was not championed initially by Hawke or Keating. Um, Medicare was implemented ultimately because it complemented a broader economic policy of inflation control. So in a way, Medicare was a lucky reform. So in trying to reform and, and save Medicare, 
Um, we need a loud coalition of advocates, a convincing economic rationale, and probably a large dose of luck. Thank you. Okay, so now it's my great pleasure to introduce Peter Yu. Peter Yu is a Yaru man from Broome in the Kimberley region in Northwest Australia with over 40 years experience in Indigenous development and advocacy in the Kimberley and at the state, national and international level. level. Peter was a key negotiator on behalf of the Yaru native title holders with the Western Australian State Government over the 2020, 2010 Yaru Native Title Agreement. He was recently Chief, Chief Executive Officer of the Yaru Corporate Group and is the current and inaugural Vice President First Nations at the ANU. Thanks, Peter. Thank you very, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation, Frank. Another. Um, I uh, I first met Gareth in 19, uh, 1980, I think it was, Gareth, uh, during the Nukunbar dispute in Western Australia. <clears throat> I was a young field officer for the Kimberley Land Council, um, and uh, Gareth, I think, was just on holiday with a family driving through and came to Broome, and we caught up through a mutual friend and helped us to organise a fairly large demonstration of the Port Hedland turnoff, which is about... Uh, 20 k's out of Broome. Um, at that stage, uh, the Hawk, the sorry, the, uh, the the court government, of course, uh, was uh, pressing its uh, its might on on the Nukumbar community for drilling on a sacred site, P Hill, that uh, had a paramilitary escort coming up the west coast uh, with scab labour uh, for an American exploration company, Amex. At that stage, there's a very good movie made by Oliver House and. Um, uh, and 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 film Australia, um, it, it called on sacred ground, which is a very good depiction of what happened there. And uh, I had my first conversation with Bob Hawke during that time, as you probably know. His son Stephen was working with the Nukunbar community and living at Fitzroy Crossing. And uh, my role was creating the communication network uh, throughout the Kimberleys uh, with all the senior cultural figures. Um, during that dispute period, uh, we also had uh, at the same time happening the uh, development, the exploration for by CRA RTZ at that stage uh, for what was to become the Argyle Diamond Mine Rio Tinto's operation there. So I was working at two fronts at the community level, both uh, at uh, Argyle working with the uh, the Turkey Creek, the Mirama, the the sorry, the uh, Miron Gajarong, and also the Gija people. Uh, they thought it was uh, somebody who was duffing, mustering, uh, rustling their cattle actually. Um, they flew over. They didn't know, know that they just came across grand, uh, you know, highways in the middle of the of the bush, and there was a RTZ operating there. But my role was um, as a young uh, field officer, um, working to set up the communication between all of the senior, uh, all the communities and senior cultural uh, law leaders uh, in the Kimberleys at that time, and and uh, Bob Hawke was the still at the ACTU, and uh, it was set up that he would call me on occasions to basically get sort of intelligence about what was happening on the ground, uh, given the uh, presence of the scab labor uh, with the um, with the paramilitary force escorted up the West Coast and what was happening on the ground in the community. So that was my uh, first experience. Um, uh, it was a very successful campaign. I think they, I think it was called Section 10B or something, the West Australian Police Act for more than three people gathering at the same place. It was a public offense uh, I was about to be arrested, and uh, but the police didn't realise just how big my extended family was. <laughs> I surrounded the paddy wagon, and they released me. Um, but um, uh, you know, my re my reflections of the period of the Hawke government, like many who are so you know contributing here today, are uh, are deeply personal. But unlike others, I wasn't an insider in the Hawke government's power structures or a collaborator in public policy or a detached journalist or academic with fascination in how the Hawke government operated and managed to change at a critical period of Australian and global history. I was, as I say, a political advocate worker uh, who worked, found myself representing my community in the Kimberleys uh, at, a re at a reasonably young age, uh, which threw me into the big political ring during the Hawke government dealing with national land rights, the Aboriginal debts in custody, Royal Commission, the establishment of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, ATSIC, the reconciliation process to name some of the big issues during that period. 
uh, following my term as the uh, as the, as the um, first field officer of the Kimberley Land Council, I was uh, then elected uh, to the National Aboriginal Conference in 1981. Um, I was the youngest elected member in in Australia at that stage, with the highest majority, given the fact that I had been working with uh, most of those communities for the last the previous 12, 18 months, and and before that uh, elsewhere in the Kimberleys and other jobs. Um, uh, before that, I was a public servant uh, working in Wyndham. I used to, uh, I used to be, I was the first Aboriginal welfare officer. Um, they couldn't get any of the white uh, graduate welfare officers to come up from down south. And the talk in the department was that the Cambridge Gulf was the arsehole of the earth and Wyndham was 40 miles up it. So they, they, they couldn't get anybody to go there. So uh, I, I put my hand up because in those days they had AIDS for everything, welfare AIDS, teachers AIDS, police AIDS, health AIDS. Um, everything, and I, I thought it was an industrial question. I said that uh, you're, you're, you're employing me because I have a very specific skill. I know this community. Uh, you, you have these uh, contracted government officers come every two years and they leave, and I have, I'm the one who knows intimately what's happening in this community, and I provide the continuity. Yet, you, yet you're not paying me at, um, any uh, with any sense of parity at all. So my Irish social worker supervisor got got sick of me and said, "All right, you want to." You want a promotion, you can go up to Wyndham. And that was the reason why, because nobody wanted to go there. But Wyndham was a very vibrant town. Um, I uh, I worked there um, for two years. Uh, I was, had a very interesting situation. I worked with an old pensioner camp, old people, um, retired people, that the Anglican Church had set up a little community about 20 kilometres out of Wyndham, so these tin shacks, nothing much else. My first experience was walking in there and uh, finding an old lady uh, who was uh, probably about 60 or 70, but uh, completely uh, incapable of doing anything, lying on a um, on a on a st on a kind of um, wrought iron bed um, with ticks all over her and on the wall like carpet. And it was my job to get her out there, bring her out, and um, and so that was. But in that community, um, the uh, there was I, I noticed an old man called Ernest who lived to the side, and he had about 20 dogs. And Ernest was about, well, it must have been 70 something or 80, um, but uh, the, uh, basically people had the dogs that, to help them survive. You mightn't believe it, but the dogs go out hunting for those old people. But I started a program of, uh, of washing those dogs to keep them out so the old people wouldn't get any disease and stuff like that. And uh, But they're very clever dogs because every fortnight they'd know I'd come with the Asuntol to, to, I cut some, uh, got oxy and cut a, uh, 44 gallon cut in half and then they got old people to fill up with water and then I came with the sun toll and they had to wash the dogs but after a while the dogs got very clever so they headed bush <laughs> when they knew exactly the day that I was coming but the the point of this was uh was Ernest I found out was a police boy during the 26 massacre uh Forest River Mission and I was wondering why he was isolated living by himself uh on the side and and it then came to me, dawned to me that he was um, a bit ostracised from from that community uh, because he had been. Um, I tell you this because you know this is all very recent history. Um, not this is not ancient history. This is something that's happened in my lifetime. Um, so um, I was a member of the NAC uh, in eighty one um, and representing the West Kimberley, uh, and a, a little over a year, I think, before. Um, uh, Bob Hawke was elected Prime Minister and I remained in that role uh, during the heady period of the National Land Rights Debate under the Hawke government abolished the representative body in, in late 1985. Like many other First Nations people I have an ambiguous and sometimes conflicted relationship with the Australian state and the governments that rule this country. The recent referendum and its aftermath has for me brought that relationship into tense focus um, so my assessment of the Hawke government is through a First Nations lens, and I would like, and I should make the point that all First Nations people's relationship with any Australian government is fundamentally problematic, because governments inherit, and I quote, the legacy of unpardonable shame, unquote, as the High Court described Australia's colonisation history in the 1992 Mabo judgment. From our point of view, governments are judged on their achievements in dealing with the legacy of injustice and laying the foundation for building an inclusive nation. On that measure, the Hawke government promised much and delivered little. Having said that, it must also be said that the Hawke government was very busy in the First Nations policy development and discourse space. Hawke had three Aboriginal affairs ministers in his eight and a half years as prime minister. 
Clyde Holding was minister from 1983 to 1987. And whilst Minister Holding presided over the Hawke government's capitulation over national land rights, which I'll talk more about later, he also established the Miller Review into Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Employment and Training. The Miller uh, Report formalised the Community Development Employment Program, which enlarged an existing program of pooling unemployment benefits with additional funds that gave communities a level of financial independence to manage and sustain their communities. This program was the bedrock of many remote First Nations communities' economies until the Howard government savaged that program around the time of the Northern Territory intervention. The Hawke government's implementation of the Miller Report also set off an internal turf war between the Department of Aboriginal Affairs and the Department of Education, Employment and Training, of which bureaucrats had control of the funding levers for the First Nations development programs. Conflict between different levels of the bureaucracy at both Commonwealth and state levels and between different jurisdictions is a common feature of Indigenous affairs, and it was rife during the period of the Hawke government. Jerry Hand was the minister between 87 and 1990 and will largely be remembered for establishing ATSIC. Uh, Jerry, in uh, late, uh, late uh, 80, uh, I think it was 87, uh, dismissed the then commissioners of the Aboriginal Development Commission because they refused to, under Section 11, I think it was, of the Aboriginal Development Commission Act because they refused to follow his instructions in terms of the amalgamation of um, Aboriginal Affairs and ADC into ATSIC and uh, I was one of the people he appointed as the replacement commissioners with uh, Pat Dodson, um, Charlie Perkins, Loacher O'Donoghue, um, Terry O'Shane, uh, and a few and a few others. Um, uh, fairly heavy times. I think we went through seven Senate inquiries at that particular time. Uh, it was quite stressful. Uh, we were going to be hauled up in front of the Senate Privileges Committee in respect to what was going on with the politics that the public servants were dropping off. Uh, truckloads of uh, equipment of material outside a new parliament house uh, on a daily basis because they re refused to cooperate with the minister's instruction. ATSIC was at that time said to be a progressive reform and uh, be a progressive reform and a demonstration of self determination. It established an elected representative First Nations governance system at the national and regional level levels, and amalgamated the bureaucracies of the Department of Aboriginal Affairs and, and the Aboriginal Development Commission. ATSIC's creation was controversial, involving bureaucratic pushback, Senate inquiries and protracted parliamentary debate over the passage of the legislation. The ATSIC Act was finally passed in 1989 with 300 amendments in the Senate. Up until then, it was the longest parliamentary debate, debate over any legislation in Australian parliamentary history. That record was broken four years later by the Native Title Act debate, which was broken again by Howard's Native Title Act Amendment Bill in 1997 and 98. I suppose that tells you something, doesn't it? As we all know, the position of First Nations peoples arouses intense national and political interest from time to time. But for the most part, we and our people's history don't figure prominently in the nation in the nation's consciousness. During Jerry, Jerry Hand's time, the Hawke government, along with the states, established the Royal Commission to Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, which is still cited as the landmark report. Sadly, it is often referenced for the failure of governments to implement all of the 339 recommendations and the fact that First Nations deaths in custody continue at an alarming rate. It's interesting, I think the history of Royal Commission, there's been about seven Royal Commissions uh, that uh, refer to uh, uh, First Nations um, uh, matters in this country, and all of them, you, if you uh, have a look at them, uh, largely uh, make similar types of recommendations, and yet um, none of them have yet been uh, implemented. The third minister, Robert Tickner, will be remembered as the minister who established the statutory 10-year Aboriginal reconciliation process led by the Aboriginal uh, Reconciliation Council, chaired by now called Patrick Dodson, the chair of uh, reconciliation. Tickner con continued as Minister of Aboriginal Affairs in this Keating government through Mabo and the Native Title Act until the 1996 election defeat where he lost his own seat in the midst of the Hindmarsh Island Bridge cultural heritage saga. The period of the Hawke government was a noisy and busy period of politics and policy implementation concerning the relationship between First Nations peoples and the Australian nations. When the Hawke government came to power, there was the expectation, hoped by First Nation people, that serious reform and recognition of Indigenous rights and interests could be achieved. And First Nations people had good reason to feel this way. 
The Whitlam government had established itself as a genuine reform government that advanced the rights and interests of First Nations peoples. And it was assumed that the Hawke government would con would continue Whitlam's reformist seal after a seven-year hiatus under the Fraser government. In the early 1970s, Whitlam government took seriously the constitutional responsibility mandated by the Australian people in the 1967 referendum concerning Commonwealth leadership to address the appalling economic and social conditions of First Nations people. It established a National Department for Aboriginal Affairs. It, trans it transferred money to state governments to provide critical services to First Nations peoples. It established a system of funding for community control organisations to deliver services. It established a national consultative body of First Nation representatives. It invested in legal and medical services. It established the Aboriginal Land Fund Commission to acquire land and many other initiatives. The most important Whitlam First Nations reform was to establish the Woodward Royal Commission into Aboriginal land rights in the Northern Territory. And in the dying days of his government, Whitlam introduced the Northern Territory Land Rights Bill into the federal parliament. In the early years of the succeeding Fraser government, the legislation was passed with some amendments. There is some historical reflection that the Whitlam and Fraser governments represent the period of broad policy consensus concerning First Nations rights and interests. That is certainly not how First Nations political leaders saw the situation at the time. Fraser was seen as kowtowing to the states, particularly West Australia and Queensland, whose policies and practices towards First Nations people belong to the colonial era. Clearly, Fraser had shown no interest in asserting the Whitlam vision of legislating national land rights regime. And after seven years of frustrating inertia in First Nations policy, there was a genuine hope and trust by First Nations people that the Hawke government would honour its commitment to establish a national land rights regime. The early signs were promising when the Hawke government introduced the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Bill that became law in 1984. This measure enabled the Commonwealth to intervene and protect First Nations cultural heritage places where state laws and processes failed to do so. The Act was meant to be an interim measure in advancing uh, of establishing of a national land rights regime. In 1983, the West Australian Burke Labor government established its own inquiry into Aboriginal land rights, which prompted the massive scare campaign of resistance led by the mining industry. You might remember the map with the black hands with uh, putting up bricks across the across the centre of Australia. It's a bit reminiscent of what happened in the last couple of months, right? Um, which prompted a massive scare campaign. As the campaign intensified, the NAC pledged with the Hawke government to confront the misinformation and avert racism with a mass education promotion. We had good advice on this matter that something akin to the anti-smoking public health campaign could be an effective counter to the torrent of misinformation about the damaging economic impact that land rights would cause. This was refused and the backlash against land rights continued without any resources to respond. Public hostility against First Nation rights culminated in the Hawke and Burke government agreeing to abandon national land rights without consultation with First Nation leaders. Largely in response to the criticism of the Hawke government by First Nation leaders, the NAC was swiftly, swiftly abolished. It would appear that uh, Bob Hawke as Prime Minister felt a sense of failure about his government's failure to deliver on the national land rights. He verbalised his strong support for the rights of First Nation peoples on many notable occasions. In late 1987, he attended the Barunga Festival in the Northern Territory and publicly committed that his government would enter into a treaty with First Nations people before the end of the 1988 bicentennial year of European Settlement of Australia. It was a laudable pledge, which he withdrew from a few weeks later in the face of fierce criticism from Howard, John Howard-led opposition. One of his last decisions as Prime Minister was to ban further mining in the Kakadu National Parks, as if to make a statement about his genuine commitment for First Nations, and no doubt his interest in supporting First Nations peoples was genuine. Whilst Bob Hawke's governments may have fallen short in critical areas of First Nations policy, his government set up the infrastructure of ATSIC and embedded philosophical policy values that enable the successful Keating governments to positively respond to the Marbo High Court decision and to members of the stolen generation whose voices before then had been silenced. Thank you.
Good. <laughs> Just to get the ball rolling, uh, I had a discussion with a friend of mine, 50 years standing, uh, about the uh, at the results of the recent referendum, uh, before the referendum, actually, and we were good friends. We've been friends since 1972 when we served together in Turkey, and our friendship was broken by that debate, and I began worrying then, is this same discussion happening throughout Australia amongst people like me who are progressive, I suppose, and others who are less so. And it worries me a bit that uh, as laudable as our aims might be, should we be presenting them in a hawk-like way, in other words, more consensus-like way, than bluntly? And that's sort of what keeps me awake at night. Uh, I've heard many anecdotal stories about similar experiences you've had and, uh, you know, classically, um, as we all know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. But um, um, yes and no, I think, because the question is how long is 250-odd years now getting close to uh, uh, the level of capacity as a, as a developing and maturing nation that we aren't capable? It's probably more reflection on um, on uh, the situation. And I understand the, the, the political nature of the of the question, but um, um, yesterday I attended the same forum that the treasurer and the and the um, and the and the prime minister at we spoke yesterday at the uh, the uh, Melbourne Institute and also the Australian Forum in 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 and the, and the prime minister was very gracious in acknowledging what had happened, but also uh, reaffirming his commitment to ensure to to take advice from Aboriginal people. But I have to ask the question: When are we ever going to be? In a position where we can uh, are bold enough as a country uh, to, to be able to have this conversation and note well, that's my question. The question is, um, how can how long can we allow allow the unacceptable position to continue, where as the first peoples of this nation um, we are still the highest incarcerated uh, anywhere in the world of any Indigenous people? I, I you know we've heard ad nauseum the kind of um, the level of statistics and indicators that we've had. Um, something is dramatically and drastically wrong. Um, the question, therefore, uh, if to give a positive response to it, I suppose, is that if it's going to take longer to be able to to move in that direction, what do we need to do? And I was having a conversation with Gareth over lunch about this. Uh, uh, and what are we going to do other than just try and close the gap, which is ne we're never going to do? because of the nature of the structural and systemic impediments that we have in this very convoluted federated country of ours between the Commonwealth and the state. So how creative can we be towards getting a better return of taxpayers' investments to be able to deliver the social justice and equity that's required? Um, because it's a reflection on us as a, as a nation. And, and if we're not capable as a nation of confronting some of the truths, or addressing this in a much more creative way, and we keep putting it off and saying, "Well, it's not the right time because you know we're we're not ready for it. We're not ready for it." The question is, when are we going to be ready? So that what what do we need to do in the meantime? The closing the gaps not working. They've been going for a decade. Each prime minister in that period of time gets up and embarrassingly says, "Oh, we've only met 0.3 percent of the two or three of the targets out of the 20 we've set ourselves, uh, but we'll do better next year." You know, I, I use this. I use the example publicly. I, I talk about this, the situation of the the Pilbara, the epicenter of wealth creation and generation, not only in Australia but probably the world as as a, as a mining province. Uh, you know, Rio Tinto and BHP, seventy percent of their kind of uh, national revenue uh, comes from from their activities. Uh, yet you've got Robin Prism sitting right in the middle there, which is 90 percent, ninety nine percent of Aboriginal people in jail. So. Um, how do we juxtapose the kind of sense of that and the reasoning of it all? I don't know. But so I'm sorry that you lost your friendship with your friend, but I mean, um, you know, is that worth it given the kind of nature of the truth that needs to be told? That's the question I would ask. Thanks very much. Can I take you back to ATSIC? That did seem uh, an organisation that uh, the government at the time thought had immense 
potential. It was representational, but it also had real executive power. Do you think it could have been designed or protected in any uh, other way so that it didn't end as it did? Uh, I do. I think uh, I think that um, basically it was uh, the problem was it was kind of um, had competing interests in in terms of a policy provider and advisor to government as opposed to a program deliverer. It should never have been a program deliverer. Uh, it should have been just from policy advice that was as was being proposed in the voice. I think it had a conflict of interest there. And I think that uh, helped to corrupt it, certainly at the high level. I would say, though, that um, it took a while to get traction in the regions, but it, my observation was it was starting to become very effective, if I might use the term voice, in the local and regional level. People were engaged with state agencies, for instance, in dealing with prioritising the nature of um, funding for housing in rural remote areas. So it was the Aboriginal community themselves sitting down with the state. I was there. I was chairman of the Aboriginal Housing Board under the WA State Housing Commission. They provided the detailed kind of plans based on their consultation with the community. So they were making the hard decisions, uh, given the limited amount of investment in housing compared to what was required. They were making decisions about, well, we think this is where you should be going because of these reasons. Uh, we think we should also be looking at alter alternative designs and uh, more efficiency in relation to the nature of housing. So it was starting to happen. It took some time, um, but I think partly, you know, the reality is that that anything uh, that is going to be of any um, real benefit and substantially going to try and change the situation is going to take time. There are kind of unrealistic expectations that all of a sudden that the, these things appear and that it's, we're, we're going to, it's a magic wand, it's a panacea for everything that's going to happen. We've come from an extremely disadvantaged position. It's going to take a huge investment in developing capacity. But yes, I think ATSIC was conflicted at the national level between this kind of policy um, uh, responsibility and, and that of a, uh, a program deliverer. I think that's where it, we got it wrong. You've nearly answered my my first question I was going to put to you, Peter, about about ATSIC. Uh, just a comment on the service provision level. I think the framework of regional arrangements and local staff was terribly important, which we've lost as well. But I also had a question on Medicare, if I may. Uh, uh, I work with Michael Waldridge, and one of his comments uh, at the time when he, he first was the minister was uh, that the health department need to make sure that they had control of the policy debate on health and not to allow the central departments to have that and that he saw the issues in the Fraser government, and he'd done a thesis on that, the biggest problems was that the PMNC took hold of the whole thing and ignored the experts in the health department. I was wondering whether that might be also a factor for the Hawke government in that Blewett's role was so central. Yeah, I mean, uh, a couple of things. With... with um... With the, the changes to Medibank and the eventual abolition of Medibank, from um, I, I gather that it was Treasury that was making those decisions to initially to reduce it and then to abolish it altogether because Fraser had said that he was committed to keeping Medibank and I gather that he personally believed in keeping Medibank but um, uh, eventually it was Treasury people sort of crossing it out, diminishing it gradually and then diminishing it all together. So, that, so it was, yeah, the Treasury Department. Um, in terms of the Health Department, um, so, the Health, Commonwealth, so the Commonwealth originally in 1901 only had power over quarantine and there was no Commonwealth Health Department. Um, and there was a tremendous clash in 1919 over how to manage the, the Spanish flu pandemic and very similar to what happened with COVID. And the Commonwealth Health Department was established in 1921 um, with with Cumpston as the long-standing um, secretary. But I, because, because that bureaucracy is built on such a um, fragile constitutional power, I'm not sure... Um, of the extent to which the health department has been as influential um, as it might have been in terms of um, of, of directing health policy, um, reading the literature, there's quite a lot of criticism of the of the capacity of the health department over the decades. 
Um, I, I, I mean, um, Mark Butler seems to be a fairly activist health minister who seems to be, I've been it, looking at the history of Medicare and the, and the way that Medicare is regarded as a, as a sort of cultural um, icon or not is one of the things I've been interested in. And it's interesting to see the way that um, Mark Butler is referring to the history of Medicare and talking about it being a 1980s institution that needs to be brought into the 21st century. So he's using the history, but almost as a way of trying to build a momentum for reform. Um, so, I mean, my impression is that that it's the health department rather than those central departments that, that are driving what's happening now. Peter, um, one of the most distressing corrosive aspects of the Voice campaign, I think, was the characterization of Indigenous elites. Uh, and you've spoken about your own sort of generational experience of coming to a position of Indigenous leadership. One of the things, and this is a bit digressive, but one of the things that really distresses me is the ways in which this campaign inevitably is going to burn off a lot of your generation of Indigenous elites who might think, well, what's the fucking point, if I can put it that way, which then begs the question of where is the next generation coming from, given how formative your experience was with those new agencies, those new initiatives of the 80s, 90s and so on. When you look at a younger generation, they don't really have that same kind of experience to draw on, do they? It's been a very corrosive debate in many ways since that more open space of the 1970s land acts and so on. Where is the new generation of Indigenous leadership going to come from? One of the themes, I suppose, of today is how much the Hawke government drew on a distinctive generation of highly talented, mobile, aspirational people. Where are mm. they coming from now? Uh, good question. Very hard question too to answer. Uh, I'm, but I'm uh, I'm uh, eternal and I'm eternal optimist. So I think that there there will be leaders arising. I think um, a lot of the I've been co-hosting some of the, the discussions post the uh, referendum environment, and we. Uh, there's still a way to go, but it's basically focusing down on uh, essentially where there is that direct connection with communities um, on the ground in communities right across Australia. So not academics, not kind of um, the existing leadership that people might have been part of the referendum working group that they've established to uh, just negotiate this with the, with the government. Um, so that's a start. But I think where the leadership is going to come from, I think it'll be a different, more sophisticated kind of leadership, uh, if I might use that word, mainly because it's from more the um, the intellectual kind of educated class of Aboriginal people that are coming through the university systems and stuff now. Uh, I think um, there's going to be a lot more litigation. Um, and that's where the kind of battlefields are going to be drawn. Um, I don't know that, I mean, I, I would hope that we don't uh, entirely lose the kind of uh, the nature of the strength and depth of political leadership, but there's not many... Um, there are there are very decent people out there, but a lot of people post the um, the the land rights. Sorry, the um, the, the Native Title Act. Uh, you know, a lot of us were really buggered and tied out. We kind of retreated back to our own home turf and 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 had to just try and build capability in our own local communities. Um, um, uh, besides, a lot of other young fellows coming up, calling us dinosaurs and telling us we need to retire. Um, we um which which you know some people did and, and provided that opportunity unfortunately that it wasn't necessarily taken up i mean that's the truth of it i'm not uh but i'm not i'm not pessimistic i think that this is where the leadership will come from it'll come from those um more kind of um educated um intellectual kind of people you you you'll always have very strong community leadership uh will be there but i think it's going to take a while to um revitalize that but because you see people are this, the unfortunate relationship is that when you make some changes in a in a kind of developing or de decolonizing kind of process, um, people get very good at their le local leadership, uh, and they and and that's where they feel that they're needed. And a lot of people get dragged away and taken away into the cities for education, and other things, and you lose a lot of that local um, uh, potency. And uh, I think, but governments, what we haven't been we're basically getting sucked into the system. We, 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 the governments appropriate the nature of political leadership by the by the way that it develops its kind of programs. The the what we have to do is to go back to the grassroots and kind of um, you know start to understand uh, the the kind of how do we own that risk? 
And and so it that won't be only legal, but it'll be the economic area as well too. That we'll have a lot more entrepreneurial ships. We'll see people building their own businesses. We'll see um, that you know the future bodes well if we get the structures right. And that's why it'll be challenging for the Albanese government following the referendum. Or what are the alternatives um, leading up to the next election and after that? But the economic space. Um, the kind of whole question of Australia becoming a renewable superpower, most of the um, critical and special minerals are going to be found on Aboriginal land. Um, you have the right to negotiate under the Native Title Act. Um, there are existing agreements that are in place. There are substantial amounts of trust that have been established now over the last uh, 40, 50 years. Um, so, uh, but, but the question is, how are we going to move? Governments need to be supporting us to activate those assets to the extent that we become clear equity holders in local and regional economies. I think that's where that there will, there will and there should be a greater sense of purpose and attention to this because, as the referendum showed, there's still a long way to go in terms of our, um, our political leverage uh, to be able to get there. But, um, yeah, I think that's just some of the ways. Okay. Thank you so much, Peter. We better end there on that note of optimism. So thank you very much to Peter. <laughs> thank you. Okay, we're moving. Um, we'll, we'll just move straight on to our, our next session. Sam Murray. I think it may, isn't it? Yeah. I'll do this somewhere. There it is. Yeah. Mm. You good? Okay, thanks everyone. My name's Anne Marie Conde. I'm a senior curator of exhibitions at the National Archives of Australia. Um, but I'm about to shift from that role. I'm about to take up a two-year transfer to this building as senior curator. So um, I look forward to a role where I can um, interpret this building, its collections, and welcome people through the doors, which is going to be terrific. Um, so the, our session this afternoon begins with Professor Frank Bongiorno, who's been bobbing around all, all day. You know who he is, but nevertheless... I'll just remind you that he is Professor of History at the Australian National University and President of the Australian Historical Association. His many books include The 80s, The Decade That Transformed Australia, and Dreamers and Schemers, A Political History of Australia. Thank you, Frank. Great. Thanks so much, Henry. Um, and I'd obviously like to associate myself again with the um, acknowledgements of traditional owners. Um, I'm standing in, obviously, for Chris Wallace too, I should add. Uh, so I'm, I'm a ring in. I think it'd be fair to say Chris uh, was among those who had to uh, um, go off to, well, of course, to, to Bill's, um, Bill Hayden's state funeral today. That picture um, was taken by my cousin. Yeah? How Italian. You put your sort of your... He was a Herald Sun photographer for many decades, John Casimena, Joe, as we call him the family. And I've very deliberately chosen that um, because it, it's one of the themes that I, I, I just want to develop in the next few minutes um, is that we, um, I think, often forget just how electorally vulnerable the Hawke government was. And you'll see, I'm going to quote from some internal party research of the, along the lines of actually what to, um, Carolyn was just using, ANOP and so on, which I think will underline that point in a moment. Um, there's the two-party preferred performance of the Hawke government, or rather the, the Labor Party under Bob Hawke, and you can see there just how healthy um, 1983 was. A, a very high um, two-party preferred vote. Compare it to um, some of those uh, later ones, for instance, or even the early ones there, the Whitlam government. You, you can see there that um, it was a, a remarkable uh, electoral performance. Uh, it did um, decline, obviously, in the subsequent elections, and we've heard some of the reasons for that already. Um, but I guess it's this figure, isn't it, that um, is, is perhaps a more telling one for some of the difficulties that the Hawke government faced during uh, its period in office. 
And you can see there the decline of the primary vote with a very remarkable, I think, figure of 1990 in which um, a, a Labor government was returned with a primary vote of less than 40%, a primary vote that would once have seen you uh, sent into opposition for a very long time. And uh, that, of course, reflects some really important changes that were occurring uh, uh, you know, to the party system, I guess the greater fluidity um, that we've now become much more accustomed to, very much a feature of the 2022 election. So I think in a lot of ways, we can see the 1990 election in particular, and I think some of the signs were there in 84 and 87 as well, as elections that look forward to our own times and the way in which party politics and electoral politics works now, rather than back to that, that those um, those earlier elections mentioned up there. Um, what I want to do here is just to um, go through, you know, some of the, the, the key reasons, I think, um, that we might um, sort of point to for the success, the electoral success of the government. What I'm not doing here is, is looking at the broader performance. I mean, it's pretty obvious, and we've heard a number of papers today that have talked about the broader performance of the Hawke government. If you have a very poor product to, say, to sell, um, a divided government, bad policy, ineffective policy, um, a poor image, all those sorts of things, obviously you're going to be in trouble at election time. Um, and, of course, there's a whole literature within political science about the impact of the election campaign itself. So I'm not, I'm not going to talk very much about the broader performance of the government, but I accept the broad arguments that have been put today, that it, it was a largely successful government in office, that it was a government that had shown that, that Labor could uh, manage an economy efficiently, that it could carry out reform effectively, uh, that it was it had good process, uh, that it, uh, you know, it wasn't constantly divided. So all of that is clearly foundational for, for those election successes. So what I want to Focusing a little bit more narrowly here, I think, on a number of uh, reasons that I think are perhaps more connected with the period around elections and, and the ways in which the bid for re-election was managed at particular points. And the first one really I want to point to is, is Bob Hawke, um, his, his leadership. And uh, Troy this morning uh, referred to his incredibly high approval ratings during 1983-84 uh, Um Hawke as an asset, I guess I've called it there. I won't read that quotation. It's from uh, the political psychologist Graham Little, but I suppose it's the opening one, which I think I remember quoting in my own book on the 80s. Wherever success is, there is Hawke, his cup running over with the sheer joy of being among those who for a time have banished the fear that destiny is unreachable, or if reached, involves hurt, division, resentment and loneliness. So I guess this idea that that uh, Hawke chased success, success chased Hawke. And uh, uh, you know, um, that period, I think, particularly in 1983-4, uh, um, I mean, Hawke didn't end the drought, for instance, but uh, there was a kind of sense of buoyancy, I think, in the country, reflected in things like the America's Cup, with which he did identify very closely. And you can see there, uh, that's Canberra, actually, um, you know, very, very much a part of the image that Hawke was able to craft in those years leading up to the 1984 election. Now, again, I'm not going to go into all these figures in detail. This is just from the Australian election study. But this, these are remarkable figures. These are absolutely remarkable figures. Because the first one there, which has Hawke at 6.22, this is just a um, strongly, strongly dislike and strongly like. Zero strongly dislike, 10 strongly like. Hawke's at 6.22, but not 1983. That's 1987 when the Australian election study started. None of these other characters, even, you know, when first elected, comes close to Hawke on that scale. Um, and look, I mean, there's, oops, where are we going? Let's go back to Rudd. I mean, there's Rudd at his first election in uh, 2007. He just exceeds Hawke, but for, it's 2007, the great Kevin 07 election. Hawke's is, is his third. Okay, I think it emphasises just the, the, the extraordinary asset that he was to his party in terms of popularity. And there were calculations about this at the time. Um, I think there's one, I'll come to it later, for the 1987 election, which suggests about 1.4%, I think, was basically Hawke's leadership. Um, the second point I want to make is, is a broader one about the Labor Party, and I've just called it campaigning and the art of self-criticism. Uh, I'm just going to very briefly trace those sort of mid, um, well, there's the 1984-87 election in particular. 
Um, 84, as we've already heard a bit about today, the, it's the one in which Labor did perform poorly. It lost 16 seats, but in an enlarged parliament, so really very poor result. Um, yeah, the usual explanations, too long, Hawke performed poorly, had glass in, in, in uh, one of his eyes from a cricket uh, a, a cricket accident that the uh, family issue that Gareth mentioned earlier today. Um, internal party analysis um, was a little bit more sanguine in the sense that um, it, it pointed out it was a kind of similar result to 83 once you took out the very high informal vote. This is when they introduced the uh, above the line Senate voting for the first time, which arguably created some confusion. But nonetheless, there was also a lot that was criticised. And again, I won't sort of go into this in great detail. Um, but generally a sense that the party had failed to mobilise the kinds of excitement and support that um, had certainly been there in 1983, that it had lost support among younger voters. This, of course, is the period of the Nuclear Disarmament Party and Peter Garrett, you remember all that sort of thing. Uh, it was active at that election. Um, so nuclear disarmament issues were quite significant for young people. It lost some support among older voters. But in particular, that it had been a poorly executed campaign. Strategic planning, according to the report, um, internal party report, almost entirely non-existent. Um, so, uh, you know, generally a negative appraisal. But this one caught my eye when I read the report on marginal seats. It is imperative that a three-year campaign for these seats is developed immediately, commencing with those marginal Labor-held seats. And, of course, this prefigures exactly what happened in the 1987 election. So the argument I'm putting here is that this was a party that was capable of cool self-appraisal um, and it put it to work uh, in subsequent elections. I'll come to that in a moment, the 87 election. The third factor I want to point to, and we've heard a bit about it, so is, is just the sheer level of um, disunity. Um, like Menzies in the 50s, or the latter part of the 50s, um, this was a lucky party in that it faced a, a divided opposition. Um, you know, you had all the, 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 you know, you went from Fraser to Peacock to Howard, back to Peacock, but also don't forget John Elliott lurking in the wings as the great alternative. The, uh, what did they say? Oh, he's kind of the, he could be the rich man's Bob Hawke, I think, was uh, one of the commentary at the time. Um, Joe Bjocchi Peterson, we've heard about uh, that attempt, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, what the point I'm making here, and I'm not going to obviously take all these in turn because we don't have time for that, is not so much to talk about these as policies that were or were not popular with the electorate or as policies that were good or bad. I'm not interested in that here. The argument that I will put in the extended version of this paper when I write it is that this batch of policies and positions greatly disorientated Labor's opponents. And I think um, we've had hints of that in some things that have been said today. But, you know, you just go through them, things like the deregulation of labor of, of financial markets, something that had clearly been around uh, in the Hawke government, the Campbell Review and all that sort of thing. The, the very pro-US pro foreign and defence policy, broadly speaking, with the qualifications Gareth added, added this morning around particularly Hayden's, uh, you know, more clear-sighted view. You can just go through these one one by one. Um, uh, and, and, you know, on land rights, as Peter has just explained, it, it retreats. It retreats when it runs into trouble in 84, 85. Um, so around a whole range of issues like this, it's able to occupy the centre ground and, and, frankly, to wrong foot its, its opponents. And I think that's critical. It's critical also. I mean, obviously, there's a broader thing happening here as well. Um, we've just heard about this from Carolyn, so I won't I won't sort of um, labour this point. But again, you know, if we take one area where Labor is often seen to have great strength, you can see that it was both valued, regarded as important by the electorate, but also one in which Labor is seen to have massive massive advantages. So to the extent that Labor Labor is able to neutralise those issues on which it is, has been seen as weaker around national security, around uh, economic management, and yield these sorts of advantages on, on what you might consider its home territory, its home turf. I think it was in an enormously strong position to fight elections successfully. That said, look at this from October 86. This is a party that in the wake of the Banana Republic business believed it was headed for default, uh, for, for, for defeat. Okay. It was a party that felt it was in big trouble. This is internal party stuff. Okay. This is, uh, these are, this is internal party reporting. You know, our economic credit, uh, comparing to 75, you know, in 86, our economic credibility is only a little better 
than in 1979. A five, it's not exactly self-flattering. I would have thought it's exaggerated too, but, you know, exaggerated in a way that's clearly attempting to mobilise change within the party in the election that was uh, due coming up. Where are we losing support? The electoral coalition support we took years to build is almost completely alienated. This is 86. This isn't a, a, a you know, a party that's kind of coasting in any way. Um, and I think belies some of the images we have of the, the strength of the Labor Party in the 1980s in electoral terms. Um, conclusion, the government is in serious trouble. It will lose, sorry, lose, lose the next election unless there is a gradual improvement in the economy and a substantial improvement in our approach and application, application over the next 18 months. So the, the electoral mood in the middle ground is one of seething anger and resentment. Um, but what happened? I won't go into that one. What happened? Well, that happened. There's whinging Wendy. Labor managed to, to uh, fight a, a very successful campaign. Um, Howard, it needs to be recalled, the coalition won a, a swing in 1987 of one, about 1%. Um, but Labor won what picked up four seats, um, four additional seats. So it was basically able to pursue a marginal seat strategy that probably didn't win at the election because it had a two, about a two two point was it two point six percent buffer or something, which is larger than the the the, the uniform swing that Howard got, but nonetheless um, it not only protected its buffer it was actually able to add to it extraordinary achievement when you consider where it felt it was in nineteen eighty six that had a lot to do I think with this new ruthlessness and professionalism replacing the, um, its previous advertise with John Singleton, um, the highly successful Whinging Wendy ads where she'd stare down into the camera and ask, you know, um, where uh, Mr Howard was going to get the money from for his programs if he was going to cut taxes straight out of the Menzies coalition playbook of the 1950s and 60s. Um, really, you know, where, where's the money coming from? That kind of idea. The targeting of marginals, the use of computer databases, direct mail fax machines, Stephen Mills, the professionals, is really the best, I think, source for, for that. We've heard about Joe for PM. Very important, I think. I mean, I, I've written about this in a couple of places at, at, at some length. Um, you know, very important to consider the ways in which the whole JPM fiasco is related to that, the confusion on the right of politics. You go and there's all sorts of oral testimony from people involved in this. And one of the positions, the kind of logic, these Queenslanders, they're basically you know, white shoe types, some of them, others more Queensland elite. They're basically saying, oh, you know, Howard's not much good anyway. I mean, look at all that dreadful stuff he did in the early 80s around, you know, retrospective tax legislation. Uh, the government's not too bad. We'll, we'll have a go with Jockey Peterson, but if it all fails, who cares? I mean, that's basically the position that some of these characters were taking uh, when you look into the, the certainly the kinds of statements that made sense. But even figures like Mike Gore, who probably, if you remember, Queensland business in the period, who's centrally involved in this. And that stuff he was basically saying at the time, they don't have much of a problem with the Hawke government. And I think that's one of the, the, um, the drivers. So I'm going the wrong way, I think. Anyway, so... Um, that's the 87 election. You can see there, I mean, the, the results of it. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, what it doesn't do, I think, is sort of alleviate a sense of the stroppiness of the population. I mean, the September, September remember, the 87 election was a double dissolution election called over the Australia card. And almost as soon as the election's over, the Australia card issue emerges as the government attempts to implement it. In September 1907, you see a visceral, a visceral reaction of national stroppiness uh, over it, which basically leads to its abandonment. And I think um, John Howard is, you know, he, he is tempting to plug into that sense of stroppiness with a, a nostalgic vision. And again, this future directions is late 1988, the end of the bicentenary year, um, often remembered for the ridicule that people heaped on the, the cover, which looks very 1950s. But, I mean, I looked at the internal Liberal Party material. You may have seen this too, Maria, um, in the National Library on this. It was getting a much better reception, they believed, with the public than it was getting at the hands of journalists. Um, they believed they were onto something, and perhaps they were. Uh, but, of course, what did the Liberal Party do next? They removed John Howard um, and replaced him with Andrew Peacock. Um and I think I'll just end on this note because I think I've probably taken up uh, as much time as is necessary. But you can see there the 1990 election. I've called that a stroppy nation. Um, and, you know, I, again, it's the one with the, the, the lower than 40% primary votes. 
And you can see there, you know, the ways in which it's prefiguring the kind of fragmentation and fluidity of our own times. I mean, yes, it's you've got, obviously got the Peacock Howard thing quite, and also the Hawke Keating stuff uh, versus Keating stuff. The lack of credibility on health policy was absolutely critical in, in, in this one with Peter Shack, the health spokesman, basically getting up at a media conference saying, you don't trust us on health and I can quite understand that. Not exactly a great way. Um, the, the, the the politics of race. I mean, again, we you know we've heard today about John Howard and the politics of race. Let's not forget Andrew Peacock. He tried it on twice, 1984, uh, back in the Blaney debate. It was it was Peacock who was trying to you know, um, and he tried it on again here over the multifunction polis. Um, but you know, Labor does win this election. Um, but you know, it pointed I think to the fragility and frailty of Labor's electoral position. And so just to, to conclude, in many of the major themes of the Hawke era, election success, as well as those frailties, I think are represented there. And they're my conclusions, uh, at least out of what I've been talking about today, the importance of leadership, certainly policy of campaign professionalism and pragmatism, and of a divided opposition, and obviously a dose of luck. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so it's Josh. Um, okay, thank you, Frank. Uh, we'll move on to Josh now, uh, who, as you may know, is a historian of Australian politics and culture based at the ANU and the University of Canberra. His PhD thesis completed this year. Yes. Congratulations. Uh, was a history of the political memoir genre in Australia. Joshua is a casual lecturer and tutor at the ANU and is the administrative officer for the AHA. So let's welcome Josh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie, uh, and thank you to Carolyn and to Frank for, for the invitation to speak here today. Um, I too want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and extend my respect to Elders past and present. Um, I, I won't say anything about the day-to-day -day relationship between the Hawke government and the media today. Um, Michelle Grattan is here to do that, so it would be pointless for me attempting to, to emulate that. Um, but the power of the media goes well beyond its capacity to shape the daily headlines. It can also be a place where history is made. And what I want to do today is revisit one very specific and I think influential instance of the media's efforts to make history out of Hawke and his government. Labor in Power was a five-part documentary series about the Hawke years broadcast in mid-1993. It featured a stellar cast of ministers, staffers, public servants and pollsters. Um, the series was renowned for the astonishing frankness of its interviewees, who mostly expected that their testimonies would go to air after the following election, which they anticipated losing, or so it was said. But of course, Labor was re-elected for a surprise fifth term in March 1993, and when the documentary was broadcast three months later, it offered, in the words of one political scientist, a post-mortem on a living, breathing government. Like most post-mortems, it was less than pretty. The proposal for Labor in Power uh, emerged in September 1991. Hawke was still Prime Minister, but rapidly losing his grip. The popular Gulf War was over, Paul Keating was smouldering on the backbench, the opposition had, it seemed, a new leader and a new agenda, and the biggest issue of the day was the recession. In that context, one ABC reporter, the astute Philip Chubb, asked his bosses to fund a documentary about what, se what seemed to be the Labor decade. He secured Hawke's patronage and an agreement that the Prime Minister would speak frankly and ensure reasonable access, on the condition that the documentary would not go to air until after the following election. Chubb began conducting background interviews and he formed a talented production team to take on this ambitious project but events quickly overtook them. On the 19th of December, 1991, Paul Keating took the top job and the Hawke era came to its dramatic conclusion. 
Chubb and his crew were on hand to record Keating's, sorry, to record Hawke's final day in Keating's first. Um, they even took the step of asking Keating to reenact his first walk into the prime ministerial office because the first one wasn't sort of, didn't have enough gravitas about it. But several weeks had to be spent salvaging this series from the leadership wreckage of that week. In those circumstances, Labor in Power became a far more ambitious five-part retrospective. It also became, I think, one front in a much larger contest for control of the political past. The journalist Paul Kelly was already on the cusp of producing his very triumphal account of the Hawke government and its renovation of the inefficient, protected Australian economy of yesteryear. Paul Keating fared particularly well, I think, in Kelly's book, and when Hawke saw this, he promised to correct that manifest literary absurdity with a book of his own. Therein, I think, lay another new phenomenon. Every minister and their drover's dog were in the market for a tell-all memoir by the mid-1990s. This was an unprecedentedly crowded historical field. Putting this series together was an enormous task. It involved many hands. It involved a panoply of voices. Hawke sat for multiple interviews uh, at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Sydney, where he was being uh, hosted free of charge, I understand. Uh, and Paul Keating sat for two. Chubb enlisted the help of a friend and legal journalist, Gary Sturgis, uh, who quickly returned from Washington, D.C. to work on this program and on the Hawke memoirs simultaneously as well. Liza Taylor worked with Sturgis to conduct a formidable research effort which involved more than 120 background interviews, 60 of which Chubb then repeated on camera. There were more than 4,000 pages of interview transcript material um, and there were hundreds of hours of archival footage uh, as well as raw interview footage that needed to be edited. There was also extensive location footage. Uh, the, you know, old Parliament House and new Parliament House had to be cleared so that the ABC crews could come in and sort of shoot their dramatic uh, shoots down the corridors and have doors opening at the right time to show that this was getting inside the centre of power in Canberra. There was a wonderful soundtrack produced for the for the series, and Kathy Boland provided a spare but I think very incisive narration. And what kind of story was she telling? Um, rather than offer a blow-by-blow -blow account of this series, which would take literally five hours, um, or deliver an impossibly partial synopsis, I thought the best thing might be to curate its, its key stories into five categories. The first, and I suppose the obvious one, is the category of success. There are some really striking themes that run through the success stories of the Labor and Power program. There was celebration of the modernity, the modernising of this new Australian economy, which came in the form of floating the dollar or leading the global charge for freer and fairer trade, uh, and certainly in, in respect for having avoided the bad style of the, Whit the Whitlam government, about which we've heard much uh, already today. And above all, the series dramatised, I think, the very personal sense of success and triumph that involved the journeys of both Bob Hawke and Paul Keating separately to the Lodge. And these are, I think, some examples of the, the positive stories, the success stories that characterise the program. There were stories of failure here too. Um, they, were, they were numerous. They weren't just stories about sort of accidents or blunders, although the, the MX missile crisis, I think, is one example of that. These were criticisms that, um, I, th I think we can group them broadly, that Hawke and Keating had failed in the end to manage the economy. Think of the refusal to provide relief to struggling mortgage holders during uh, the early period of the 1990s recession or that they had failed in, in moral terms. Um, I'm thinking here of the failure to pursue Indigenous land rights about which we've been talking already today. Or that they were driven by opportunism. Uh, that 1984 election story is fascinating. Bob Hogg, working in Hawke's office at the time, sat for an interview and said, we meandered around Australia for eight weeks, wondering why we were having it. Um, it was seen to be a, a cynical, political, opportunistic uh, endeavour. So there, I think, is an example of a list of, of negative or failure stories that come out of this program. Then there were some that were mixed. Uh, these were important stories, dramatic stories. Um, 
generally caught between the need to modernise the country and the need to nurture the traditions of the Labor Party. I think there was some dramatic tension between those two imperatives being played out in these particular stories. The entry or the licensing of foreign banks in 1984, debates about Tasmanian forests and whether or not they should be logged in 1986. I think these were debates where that tension meant that the story could be both positive and negative or ultimately mixed. Then there were the tragedy, the tragedies, the tragic themes. These were I th largely personal in nature. They involved men, generally Hawke himself, suffering the harshness or the pitfalls of public life, whether that was in the form of uh, a leadership showdown, the personal disasters that happen alongside a public life, uh, or the delegitimization of a meaningful reform. The image at the bottom right there comes from his 1987 um, election speech in which he famously pledged that no Australian child will be living in poverty by 1990. Um, and the, the, the narrator of the documentary makes the point uh, that this overshadowed what was a significant reform in social welfare, the Family Allowance Supplement of 1987. And finally, I did want to make this point. There is a, a significant range of stories that, that didn't make the cut that were researched, studied, interviewed for, but did not make the final program. Um, and perhaps they tell us something about what, what could be taken for granted in a Labor program uh, by, by the year 1993. Things like public health insurance, laws against discrimination, uh, and that good international citizenship that was so characteristic of Labor's work in foreign affairs in the 1980s and 90s. These are the kinds of story threads, I think, that were, were either missing or, or not particularly prominent. What held the entire story together, as journalists noted in their reviews, uh, was the dynamism in the relationship between the two men, Hawke and Keating. Sometimes the relationship mattered in policy terms. I'm thinking here of the National Tax Summit and the treatment of that story in the program. But just as often, as you can see here, it was dramatised entirely for its own sake. So here Hawke is describing Keating's fascination with French empire clocks. He had me over to look at his clocks. They were handsome objects, but I didn't have any intellectual orgasms about them, he says. Keating wasn't particularly generous in reply. Bob had an easy ride through public life, he said, shoehorned along by many other people, and he thought it was all because of his great understanding of the Australian people. Um, the sarcasm and the mood lighting go together very nicely here, I think. So what are the consequences of all of this? Or what were the consequences when the program went to air? Well, for the protagonists themselves, the leading men, uh, it was pretty bruising stuff. Hawke wasn't all that happy with the series by all accounts. Um, certainly he felt that it was dishonest and biased. And once again, he felt that it was largely biased in favor of Keating. Hawke's critics were quick to decry his political narcissism, a phrase that we've already heard um, bandied around today. The Sydney Morning Herald declared that in the legacy contest, Keating won hands down. But there was a lot of discomfort here for Keating as well. Having just beaten the coalition's proposed consumption tax in, in uh, March 1993, the reminder in this program of Keating's earlier advocacy for such a tax left him looking opportunistic at best, perhaps hypocritical if we were being a little more cynical. The series was personally distracting for the Prime Minister. Um, there are accounts of him being really distracted in a hotel room in Melbourne um, in the middle of a fight with the states about native title. Um, his advisors and public servants are having a meeting about native title and Keating is in the corner watching Labor in power, um, as Don Watson puts it, like a bird with a mirror in a cage. The program reopened the wounds of Labor's leadership struggle in a very real way, um, and Labor's opponents loved this. Uh, Bronwyn Bishop told reporters, um, I was going to try the voice, but I won't. Um, I have to say I'm enjoying it, she said. The ABC did very well for itself out of this program. The early episodes in particular won the ratings for all of the Tuesday night time slots they were screened in. Um, the, the later episodes struggled, it has to be said. One of them was beaten by Mr Bean. <laughs> Uh, Philip Chubb and the producer and director Sue Spencer both won Walkley and Logie Awards for this program. They both won promotions within the ABC itself. There was a book, there was a VHS, which was available for purchase, just $59.95, a bargain. Um, the ABC did quite well. 
Labor in Power contributed to larger developments in Australia's political culture, and I want to close by gesturing to a few of those here. First, I do think it exacerbated the cynical regard in which many Australians were holding their politicians after a decade of economic reform. The series portrayed Labor MPs, their advisers, and certainly economic bureaucrats as part of a, a, a class of people that were far removed from the concerns and the, and the needs of ordinary Australians. Deputy Prime Minister Brian Howe's remark in this program that good government had been suspended for a period of time while we fought out a leadership struggle was, I think, a particularly damning assessment of where government landed in, in 1991. For the columnist Les Carlion, uh, there would be many references to Labor in Power in his columns for several years. He'd often liken it to the film, the mafia film Goodfellas, um, none, none too charitable a reference. In letters to newspaper editors, some viewers criticised what they saw as the isolated and unaware behaviour um, of this decade of, of policy making. The series also contributed to a much wider discussion about the transformation of the Labor Party itself. In a telling passage at the end of the series, the narrator says that Labor had been caught in the discordant clash of two overwhelming ambitions, that Australia suffered miserably, again her words, and that the rank of the true believers became thinner as a result. When Robert Mann compared this documentary with Paul Kelly's book in a review, he found that the ABC's version was an altogether darker interpretation of the 1980s. Debates about Labor's failure were acute in this program, particularly in that closing episode. Uh, Brian Howe and Peter Walsh argued on screen effectively about whether high unemployment or the balance of payments deficit uh, was the real failure of the Labor years. But that was the terms, that was the nature of the debate in the closing episode. Although the transformation and then collapse of the Australian economy during the 1990s recession were the main focus of the late stages of the program, I think the program ironically reaffirmed uh, a very strong, powerful trend in Australian life toward it, the emotional expressiveness and self-revelation, certainly in Australia's politics. The personal characters of Hawke and Keating seemed to be at stake in every policy debate that was rehearsed and re-narrated in this program. Keating was ferocious, zealous, uh, Hawke, less charitably, it has to be said, was called Old Jellyback uh, in, in the second episode. The participants objected to the very personal, emotional terms of this documentary's framing. Um, Keating confident Don Russell wrote an op-ed in which he criticised the series. He said that the, the filmmaker, Philip Chubb, was the Ophra Winf Winfrey of Australian political journalism. But in fairness, the ABC was working with the terms in which the interviewees themselves uh, had spoken. The whole thing flew in the face of uh, older conventions of, of confidentiality and reticence. Alan Ramsey, I can, I've, I've put the quote here on the screen, made this point. He basically said that once upon a time, the 30-year rule would mean that a debate over something like Coronation Hill would be secret for 30 years. Now you can get it basically 18 months later on the ABC. One more minute. Well, let me finish here then. Um, Finally, Labor in Power helped to sharpen a, a growing tendency in Australia's culture to treat leadership as a subject in and of itself, I think distinct or regardless of its policy imperatives. And I suppose I'll give the last word on this to um, John Clark and Brian Dore, who in the months after this was aired, did a wonderful parody of the Labor in Power program. So here, um, Brian Dore is pretending to be Philip Chubb and John Clark plays the roles of both Hawke and Keating. Uh, and you can see here, Chubb is asking, what was happening to the country during all of this? To which Keating is replying, well, hang on a minute, I was talking about myself. Uh, later, Dor asks Hawke, well, what were you doing about the recession during all of this? To which Hawke says, well, hang on a minute, I'm telling you what I was doing about Paul. Um, I think I'll end it there. Fabulous. Thank you, Josh. Okay, um, we'll move on to Michelle. It's a great privilege to, to welcome her today. She's been a member of the Canberra Parliamentary Press Gallery for more than 40 years, uh, during which time she has covered almost all the most significant stories in Australian politics. She's currently has a dual role with uh, as a prof professorial 
Fellow at the University of Canberra and as Associate Editor Politics and Chief Political Correspondent with The Conversation. She is co-author and author and editor of several books. Please join me in welcoming Michelle Grattan. Thank you very much and for the invitation to be here today. I also want to pay my respects to the uh, custodians of this land and excuse me sitting down due to some vertigo. The Hawke government uh, and the media, I think, is a, a fascinating story. And I'd like to start with two anecdotes that reflect those very different times of the 1980s. One comes from Paul Kelly. He remembers Keating saying to him during that decade, if I've got the top five journalists in the press gallery supporting a policy, I've got the country. The other story, the other story is from a journalist who was working at the time for one of the Fairfax bureaus. He recalls, he thinks more than once, going to see Peter Walsh, who was resources minister at the time, at his motel in Canberra. And Walsh opened the safe in the room and shared a cabinet submission or two. Now, I don't think you'd find anything like this uh, happening today on uh, either of those uh, fronts. When we're considering the Hawke government and the media, we have to start with the basic differences between those times and now. The media cycle had already sped up, there's no doubt about that, but there was no social media. TV was supreme, print was centrally important, and radio was big with key presenters such as John Laws. The media had none of the fragmentation of today's scene. So a government had many fewer alternative routes to the public than are now available when politicians operate on multiple social media platforms. And that made the Canberra Press Gallery more important than it is today. Before Hawke became leader, the press gallery journalists were rather ambivalent about him, although, of course, he had strong followers among the industrial relations reporters. Prior to his entering Parliament, Hawke was the unreformed um, uh, public figure and his behaviour, his drinking, his womanising made many of us in the gallery think that uh, he really could never be Prime Minister. And then, of course, he uh, was elected and was only in Parliament uh, just for one term when uh, Hayden was pressured to hand over the leadership. Probably... Uh, Opinion was still among the journalists somewhat divided about him, but views changed after um, he became leader and he was immediately, of course, uh, propelled into that election campaign uh, in which he performed so strongly. So he arrived in the prime ministership a few weeks after replacing Hayden on a wave of media goodwill. He was charismatic, he was knockabout, in, and he was, of course, a contrast to the aloof Malcolm Fraser, whom he replaced. And I think the uh, a point is worth making that the unpopularity of an outgoing leader can be quite important to the reception of a new one, and indeed we saw this phenomenon with Anthony Albanese. Derek Parker, in a book called The Courtesans, the press gallery in the Hawke era, sums up Hawke's journey with the gallery thus, and I quote, if the 1983 election campaign was the affair, then the marriage in which the gallery was the bride was duly consummated on 5th of March, 1983. When Hawke assumed office, the press gallery president wrote to him, and I quote, 
We would like to thank you for your early decision to abolish the doorstop interview, a practice which we as journalists found both unprofessional and uncomfortable. I think it was a somewhat uh, naive letter, but there you go. In those somewhat simpler times, Hawke had two press secretaries. Albanese has five or six. Up to 1988, of course, the parliament, the executive and the gallery were all in this building before everyone moved up the hill. And that move had implications for the relationship between the gallery and the government. Although still housed together, where this old building fostered intimacy, the new one with its vastness fostered a degree of distance. In this building, people bumped into each other, either coming and going across King's Hall or around the corridors. And, of course, there was the non-members bar. Such a bar was indeed initially set up in the new house, but it soon disappeared in part for lack of interest and probably also a more uh, disciplined, uh, somewhat at least more disciplined approach by government officers. It seemed too far from anywhere. And it's now a childcare centre, which I think says a lot about the changing times. Whether the discipline uh, is better or worse is a moot point. Hawke did not do anything like the number of media conferences that prime ministers do now, nor were ministers out in the media filling the space all the time as they are these days. On the other hand, press conferences were more in-depth, sit-down sessions, and they could last an hour, especially the Keating ones. There were times of discontent over the number of Hawke news conferences and attempts to limit the topics at those conferences on occasion. But I don't recall that limit on follow-ups and additional questions from an individual reporter that uh, Anthony Albanese imposes, which can in fact be a potent myth, a method of controlling a press conference and, and stopping uh, really in-depth probing of a particular issue. Hawke could be moody, he could be difficult, emotional and inclined to let it all hang out. There was that famous news conference where he cried over his daughter's drug problem. Under pressure at one point when he was overseas and things were blowing up at home, Hawke declared what was dubbed the London Convention that he would not talk about domestic matters while overseas. This ban, of course, faded, but many years later, some journalists who had not been reporting in the Hawke era would speak of the London Convention as though it was some sort of constitutional provision. <laughs> These days, Anthony Albanese seems to use it pretty successfully. We knew a great deal more about the internal dynamics of the Cabinet in the Hawke days than we do now, when actually we know virtually nothing. This was even when there weren't problems that brought more dramatic leaks. The Cabinet was just more transparent and it wasn't hard to find out from ministers who'd said what. Senior correspondents had close relationships with particular ministers. Also, this was still a time when senior public servants talked to the media. Since then, both sides of politics have shut that down. On overseas trips, there were a lot more detailed official, official background briefings on talks, certainly um, compared with today. Everything was on a smaller scale, a smaller media field, making what individual journalists wrote more significant. According to one former staffer, the weekly columns of senior journalists were carefully watched to gauge how the government was travelling. There would be sensitivities, however. I recall one incident quite early on when, after I'd reported in a column about a briefing on the Cabinet agenda that we'd been given, a Hawke press secretary actually arrived at my house at a weekend to express his outrage 
On the following Monday, however, Hawke was apparently delighted with the weekend media in general, so it turned out not to have been such a sin after all. The government attended to its attack skills with a media monitoring service, the National Media Liaison Service, dubbed the Animals, that followed what opposition figures were saying and made sure that journalists had transcripts of all the gaffes. Now, I just want to turn to Keating's media pitch in particular. Keating, of course, had been made shadow treasurer by Hayden near the end of Hayden's time as leader. He was previously resources spokesman and uh, had been quite hesitant at making this move. Peter Bowers, who worked for the SMH uh, and was close to Keating, was overheard on one Sunday night on the phone exhorting him, just effing do it. <laughs> Keating was very astute in his use of the media. He was a compelling character who starred in Parliament, even if his cutting wit did not translate well to people's lounge rooms, and I think he understood this and was that was one reason why he was uh, opposed to televising Parliament. He um, was able to weave together a policy narrative rather in the way that I think Jim Chalmers is at the moment trying to... Uh, to imitate. During the economic reforms of the 1980s and early 90s, Keating as treasurer tried to educate the public through the media, particularly through the gallery. He had an eager staff that bent themselves to the task, especially during the great tax debate of the mid 80s. There were lots of briefings and of course the famous whiteboard. By the way, and apropos of nothing, Keating would only have journalists enter the treasurer's office in the, the new building by the the back door, not the front door, the so called the tradesman's entrance, as it were. No idea the reason. Many in the media, including in the gallery and at the executive level of the main newspapers, were very sympathetic to the reform agenda of those Hawke Keating years. And this helped Keating and the government. Editors had more clout in those days and more interest in policy. I think there was less of a culture of complaint also than there is now, which helped in the reform process. Because of, of course, there were always potential losers, but I think that the balance between the argument for reform and the stress on losers was rather different in the reporting of those days. Keating would use the media also in his battle against colleagues. For instance, there was a huge dispute at one point between him and Kim Beasley, who was communications minister at the time, over telecommunications policy. Keating wanted everything opened up. Beasley favoured a more restrictive change. After the Beasley people apparently leaked a paper, Keating had Treasury prepare a submission essentially just to be leaked to the Australian Financial Review. When unhappy with someone's reporting, Keating would ring up, especially on Saturday mornings, because Saturday was when the main columns came out from the senior correspondents. He never minced words. I remember one Saturday after a long lecture, he said, well, can't talk to you anymore. And I learned on Monday that everybody else had got similar calls. <laughs> and there was a mention too of the... Um, the GST somersault that uh, he did, well, there was a call after that uh, when I'd read uh, written a, a critical column. Keating as treasurer lived in Canberra and was often to be seen at the Monica shops. And I recall one morning after we'd all produced uh, critiques over something or other on the Saturday morning, he came bearing down on me at the shopping centre yes. and I groaned inwardly expecting the worst. But he just said, did you see what that bastard Craig McGregor wrote about me today? <laughs> so I was spared. <laughs> Parker in the courtesan said, and I quote, Keating undoubtedly took the view that the media should operate as an arm of government. 
the Hawke government's media strategy was aimed at drawing the press gallery into the process of corporate government. In personal relations, Keating was quite trusting, I think, of senior journalists. He believed they'd keep his confidences. On the other hand, perhaps he just didn't care if some of his blunt assessments of colleagues got back to them. I remember leaving his office after one discussion. It was quite um, late, I guess, in late 80s some, or early 90s when things were not going well uh, in, between Hawke and Keating and thinking that if I actually put into print what he'd just said, it would create a huge political explosion. But, of course, it was an off-the-record discussion and I maintained the confidence one confidence that was predictably broken was Keating's 1990 Placido Domingo National Press Club dinner, his address there, when he reflected negatively on Australia's leaders through history. It was supposed to be an off-the-record occasion, but was reported by people who were not present and hence not bound by the rules. And, of course, this caused a massive blow-up with Hawke, as you know. Keating that night was in, a, in an emotional state because uh, the Treasury Secretary, Chris Higgins, had uh, died just before. And I happened to be gallery president at the time and was sitting beside him as he made notes before rising to speak. Uh, and the, this note making went on and on and on and the whole thing was running very late. But when I talked to him immediately after the speech, I had the impression that he didn't actually realise the impact that it would make when it got out, as inevitably it would. During the Hawke years, there were always ups and downs with the media. There were many big scandals along the way, as well as policy fights that attracted um, attention from the government, that uh, attracted attention unwelcome attention from the government's point of view and negative headlines. So while we tend to look back on it as some or some people tend to look back on it as, as all very smooth and organised, it was actually quite a, a bumpy road with, with lots of potholes, Paddington bears and other, other uh, uh, spy scandals, the whole gamut of uh, problems. Inevitably, internal things, uh, internally, things frayed uh, badly at the end as Keating was increasingly pursuing the leadership and Hawke, who'd gone back on his word of the Kirribilli deal, tried to cling on. But if we stand back from all that, I think for the most part, the relationship that government and the media had notably the press gallery here, was a positive force in the country's pursuit of change through those years. Thanks very much. Okay, we've got 10, we've got 10 minutes for, for some questions. Do, do we have microphones still? Um, so this, we've got one over here, Andrew, I think. Thanks very much. Uh, Frank, a question uh, about in elections, the importance of environmental issues, particularly in 1983 and 1990. Yeah. Yes, and, and um, I mean, I, I didn't really have time to, to sort of delve into the 1990 election in particular, but they're critical, aren't they? The, the um, ways in which, I guess, Richardson, um, Graham Richardson had managed relations with the environmental movement and a range of environmental issues at the time uh, was the basis, really, the foundation for the kinds of preference flows, really, that, that benefited Labor at that election and meant they could win a, a contest with uh, such a... Um, you know, weak primary vote by the standards of those times. Of course, forty percent these days looks like a, a marvelous primary vote, but not in nineteen ninety. Um, yeah, and and yeah, obviously eighty three. Um, the the Franklin Dam issue was, um, you know, I think very important in um, 
uh, mobilising a degree of enthusiasm and support for the government, particularly among urban middle class people, I think would be a fair comment. Um, it probably wasn't the sort of uppermost um, issue of that election by any means, but it, it certainly um, was a way, I suppose, in which the government was able to brand it, brandish progressive cred credentials at, at, at a time when, you know, the, the, the country's... It, it, you know, in a pretty depressing state on the whole, given the state of the economy. Um, and, you know, I suppose it also was an emblem really of the, the, the political difficulties and failures of the Fraser government, who tried obviously to persuade the, the Grey government uh, to, uh, to to abandon the, the proposals, but it failed, failed to do so, yeah. Right. Thank you very much, everyone. A question, uh, particularly for Josh, a predictable historian's question, I guess. Um, those, uh, that massive body of transcripts and unscreened film, um, I'm presuming uh, they, this has all survived. Where is it? Is it being used? And what are some of the great hidden gems amongst them? Thank you, Stephen. That's a great question. Um, I've seen bits and pieces. I've not seen the whole collection. Um, I'm assuming that the ABC has copies. There's there's a lot of material at the National Archives, um, a lot of audiovisual records at the National Archives, which I think are basically the un, the unedited, um, un, uncorrupted original interview recordings from from start to finish so that's that in itself I think is a really rich archive um the, the the materials that I've come across are kind of spread through a bunch of other people's archives actually um Hawke's papers in in Adelaide include large um transcripts large numbers of transcripts from the the, the series uh which were then kind of given to him as he was working on his memoirs the following year um so yeah they, they kind of got around those those materials um but i haven't seen the full original suite of them at the national archives thanks everyone for for three really great um presentations um i I want to ask you, Michelle, a bit more about um, the relationship between the media and the and the APS and the sort of dialogue that you mentioned that was kind of going on. So I guess what were the kind of ground rules around that and um, when did it get shut down and, and, and sort of was it gradual or sudden? Uh, well, when I started in um, Canberra in the early 70s, basically you could ring up senior public servants. There was a physical Commonwealth directory uh, with their office numbers and, uh, well, I don't know whether – wouldn't have had home numbers, I guess, but nevertheless one didn't seem to have much trouble getting them at home. Um, and if they came to trust you, they would talk to you on a background basis. I'm not talking about leaks here, but I'm just saying, you know, a policy comes out, you don't really understand it very well, you get on to the – second or third level person or the person who's in charge of it in the public service and they would um, give you the the background to it. And um, that I'm not exactly sure, Andrew might have a better idea when when governments closed it up. I presume it, it wasn't sort of on one day as it were, but... Uh, governments became, I guess, in the 90s, um, increasingly uh, ministerial offices, of course, had strengthened over the decades, but more and more stuff had to go through the minister's office, the press secretary, uh, public relations parts of departments sort of expanded but were pretty useless and terribly cautious and slow, et cetera. Um, and this just represented the increasing control that ministerial officers have imposed on, on the gallery. It, I guess it's a subtle sort of process, uh, but there's more of everything um, and, for example, uh, under the present government, you, you get a, a list at the crack of dawn 
of ministers who are appearing on all these programs in the mornings uh, and what they're doing during the day in terms of media appearances, but the sort of less access, as it were, so more more and less at the same time, and not that um, not that policy background in any sort of um, general sense. I mean, people obviously know some senior public servants and if those people have confidence, they will um, uh, talk to you, but it's few and far between. It's very hard for young journalists coming into the gallery to uh, build up those contacts because uh, the, the basic system is different. I think we've got one. It's handy, wasn't it? Thank you. Um, maybe this isn't the best question to ask in a you know an event looking at the 40th anniversary of the Hawke years and it's maybe slightly putting a pallor in things, but I was kind of thinking, you know, Frank sort of mentioned that remarkable figure of popularity that Hawke had still as late as 87. And I think about, you know, four years later that he's, um, you know, defenestrated politically by Keating. Obviously, in that time, you have the recession, um, you have, you know, factors like that. It's a long-term government. But, you know, what is it that really kind of, like, that explains where Hawke began to fall down in terms of popularity? Is there, like, an automatic sort of response between those two things and his own personal appeal? Or, like, one thing I'm not actually sure is, did he actually maintain that amongst the public, at least, actually quite far until 1991 when the challenges were happening? Or was there, like, a noticeable decline? And if so, why? Oh, we must have had him considerable difficulty by 1991. I must confess, it's not sort of in my head at the moment. Um, um, I guess Maria talked a bit about this. Um, I mean, the coming of the recession obviously uh, undermines Hawke's authority. Um, it's one of the great ironies, isn't it, that, you know, it obviously benefited Keating, who was his treasurer. Um, so that that's an issue. I mean, I think fight back... I mean, Maria's right. I think it was more a trigger than anything else. But I mean, the sense of um, of a of a prime minister flailing at that moment was absolutely extraordinary. And, and yes, it was partly because of what was happening inside the party. The fact that you know Yed Keating uh, sitting there stewing on the backbench, John Kerrin had become uh, treasurer, and uh, was back, was obviously struggling in the role. I think all, all of those things. Um, you know, told against Hawke. But I, I would have thought the the, the the change in economic fortunes were, were critical. I mean, um, yes, there'd been a, a, obviously an economic crisis, a balance of payments crisis in the mid-'80s, but not a recession. And and the sense that the country... Well, the, the fact that the country uh, was back in a recession, which, you know, were the conditions, of course, that it had, uh, you know, essentially formed the basis for Hawke's victory in, in 1983, I think, really did sort of leech um, uh, authority and legitimacy from from Hawke with with the public. I mean, it's a very tragic uh, sort of um, conversation in the uh, the Button papers between, uh, in fact, it's reproduced at least in part in Button's, um, what's it called, as it, as it Happened, his memoir, where Hawke is still talking about his love affair with the Australian people and Button is trying to get through to him that it's all over, that, that you know, the government is in disarray, your polling is shocking and all the rest of it. So he's kind of become a bit of a, I guess, a captive of that particular narrative about himself, despite the fact that everything had changed. Yeah. We've got time for one last question. It's, re it's really a follow-up question and a bit to Michelle. Uh, you mentioned Frank the 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 uh, John Kerrin Treasury issue, and his demise was very much from a press gallery attack over him getting the wrong words about well, gross, gross operating gross. surplus, uh, and one wonders whether the press gallery attack on him was actually part of a support for Keating behind the scenes. Look, I think it was more complicated than that, and I remember that press conference. And I also remember that when we went out of that press conference, most of us thought uh, Karen had done all right because this thing when he couldn't answer this question about the gross operating surplus was uh, 
the the television cameras had moved right in and uh, it was played that little bit, which, you know, when you're in a big press conference, you don't necessarily uh, focus so strongly on on just a tiny bit of it because, they, as I say, they were quite long. But this, when this was played on television, on the news, over and over again, it sort of magnified the whole thing. So a press conference that, that looked at the time okay, focusing on that minute part or small part, just took on a different um, complexion. And there was another incident around the same time of... Um, Brian Howell leaving a press conference and walking uh, walking into a cupboard. My former colleague, Tim Colbatch, used to always tell me it wasn't, he didn't walk into the cupboard, he'd open the cupboard door. But anyway, it, when that was played over and over and over, that seemed to be a metaphor for the government losing its way. So, so many of these things are context. If these things happen in a, a more favourable environment, they mean nothing. Right, if somebody opened a cupboard door now, um, it wouldn't mean much at all. But when a government is sort of struggling and things are going wrong, those little things become blown out of proportion. Now, you can blame the media, but that's sort of the way it happens and probably that's the way it happens in a way in the public mind as well. And I think... Um, just going back to the earlier question, that a leader sort of has a a life. Like they don't, Menzies was an exception, but they don't go on forever. And however popular they are, they use up the capital. The, and if there's a pretender for the throne in the background, they get undermined. People, people get over them even if they like them a lot. And I think that was a factor with the hawk, uh, the hawk fall, and these other smaller things and mistakes, and his failure to deal with fight back, especially his failure to deal with fight back, which appalled and frightened the the colleagues. All those things contribute to, you know, it all ended badly. Because remember, it almost always does end badly. Unlike this session, which is ending beautifully. So would you join me in thanking our three speakers this afternoon? Do we have a cup of tea? Yes, I Give enough time? Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Cool, thank you everyone. Thanks.
Hawke government. So I'm going to start with that. It's hard to remember what a difference the Hawke government made in terms of equal opportunity for women. When it was elected, it was still perfectly legal to reserve jobs with a career structure for men, despite the increasing number of women who had been able to go to university thanks to the Whitlam government's abolition of tertiary fees. The pages of classified advertisements that appeared in newspapers like the Sydney Morning Herald continued to be divided between those for men and boys and those for women and for the female and male voters, according to AMOP. And this was seen as a key to its electoral success. Susan Ryan, as the incoming Minister for Education and the Minister assisting the Prime Minister for the status of women, was not slow to take advantage of this electoral leverage. A sex discrimination bill modelled on the original private senator's bill, but without the affirmative action provisions, was introduced into Parliament in June 1983. CEDAW, the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, was then ratified in July. However, at this point, there was a bit of a public furore, um, and Elaine Nile was particularly active in organising busloads of protesters to come to Canberra to protest against um, the Ryan juggernaut and so on. Well, the sex discrimination bill finally passed through both houses in March 1984 after 53 amendments to placate seemingly implacable opponents raising the spectres of communism and, and Bible burning. In global terms, the Sex Discrimination Act was a pioneering piece of legislation the first to have specific provisions covering sexual harassment. Women's Electoral Lobby organised a large celebration party uh, on the day that the bill passed the House of Representatives. So you can see supporters of the bill, including Ian McPhee, who as Shadow Minister, was strongly supportive of the sex discrimination bill and also had co-authored with Susan Ryan the previous year the new government guidelines on the portrayal of women in the media. Newspaper and other job advertisements could no longer specify men only to apply. And increasingly women believed that they had the right to the same range, sorry about this, same range of employment opportunities as men. In this new era, women became increasingly visible in public life, for example, Sorry. Oh, that, that's still the party celebration. <laughs> Sarah Dawson, that's ours. This is the uh, Commonwealth's first female sergeant at arms, leading in Joan Child as speaker, new speaker of the House of Representatives. But despite the champagne and cake, the Sex Discrimination Act continued to have a precarious existence. In 1986, only two years after its passage, the Expenditure Review Committee of Cabinet decided to abolish the Human Rights Commission, the body responsible for implementing the Act. The Commission had been established in 1981 by Fraser with a five-year sunset clause, perhaps unique in the world for human rights uh, legislation. 
Uh, Pam O'Neill, the first sex discrimination commissioner, had to engage in a major campaign to ensure that legislation for a replacement body was passed in time before the end of the year. This is Pamela O'Neill. The new Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission was still in danger, despite being much reduced in size. John Howard's 1988 Future Directions, which we've just been looking at, um, promised to abolish the commission immediately on taking government. While John Hewson's Fight Back Manifesto of 1991 listed it with other statutory bodies that, quote, derive little or no revenue for the services they deliver. As noted in public policy analyses at the time, the legislative advances of the Hawke government were frequently put at risk by subsequent cost-cutting exercises and administrative reorganisations inspired by the private sector. Now, I'm just going to very briefly talk about machinery of government because this was another area where the Hawke government made important strides forward. Um, it was elected with a full suite of commitments to introducing a gender lens into government policy making, including the return of the Office of the Status of Women to Prime Minister and Cabinet, and the setting up of a Secretary's Task Force, which was to play an important role in the introduction in 1984 of one of the best practice innovations of the Hawke government, the cross-portfolio women's budget process. This was intended to increase awareness of the gender impact of budget items previously assumed to be gender neutral and to ensure that they did not inadvertently increase gender gaps. Anne Summers, the newly appointed head of the Office of Status of Women, showed off what became known as gender responsive budgeting at the OECD in 1985. And the OECD became one of the strongest promoters of this, this Australian contribution to good governance. By 2022, over 100 countries had introduced some form of what was now called gender responsive budgeting, including around half of OECD countries. All began with the Hawke government. Another interesting machinery development was at the parliamentary level where Senator Pat Giles established the Caucus Status of Women Committee still exercising some feminist muscle on the reform agenda today, despite a couple of attempts over the years to streamline it out of existence. What happened in the Hawke period was that each member of the Caucus Days of Women Committee was allocated two ministers to shadow, uh, one supporter of gender equality and one not so much, <laughs> and uh, they were uh, called to account by this committee and this still happens now so long lasting uh, machinery innovation apart from the anti-discrimination legislation and the machinery of government innovations the Hawke government also introduced a substantial range of policies and plans directly aimed at improving the status of women I'll just draw attention here to the Aboriginal Women's Task Force, uh, which in 1983-84 conducted the first nationwide consultations with Aboriginal women, raising issues including the status of women as traditional owners and custodians of land and sacred sites. I shall briefly refer as well to one policy area, that of violence against women, where very significant advances were made under the Hawke government when the first comparative study of violence against women policy was conducted, covering 36 established democracies, Australia, together with Canada, was to have the most found to have the most comprehensive suite of policies relating to domestic violence. While the funding of women's services, including refuges and rape crisis centres, dated from the Whitlam period, it was only in 1984 that it was put on a secure footing. By mid-1988, 193 refuges were being funded and a national community education program had begun. In 1985, 
the New South Wales Premier, Neville Wran, had declared that his was the first government in the world to proclaim in 10 languages that wife bashing is a crime. This message appeared in billboards at railway stations and on buses and trains. When Helen Lerong moved from the position of New South Wales Women's Advisor to be Commonwealth Women's Advisor in 1988, she brought a wealth of experience in this area with her. The National Break the Silence program was launched by Prime Minister Bob Hawke in 1989. Oh, sorry, if I'd done that again. Oh, that's what I want to show. Um, can't slide, should be there. Okay. And what if I want to look at the one before? Uh, yeah, or just sit down. Yeah. This is just there. Okay, so it's better to use this. Okay, so um, uh, this uh, Greek woman, of course, is saying, I ran into a door, but thinking he beat me up again. Uh, and here is the country version of, of this, this program. Many uh, forms uh, were used to promote community awareness of domestic violence at this time. Um, and almost every soap opera on commercial television uh, had a session, had an episode featuring violence against women. Um, so these are all very positive things which happened during the Hawke government in advancing the status of women. But one thing constraining the advance of gender equality policy was the increased influence of neoliberal policy frameworks, including the trilogy commitment taken to the 1984 election. The trilogy commitment being that there would be no increase in tax or public expenditure or the deficit as a proportion of GDP. This resulted in intense struggles over expenditure during the remainder of the Hawke government including expenditure on childcare, which had been a major commitment of the 1984 election, but was described by the finance minister as a bottomless pit. This policy framing also brought a focus on increasing the labour market participation of women. The 1987 mini budget, for example, included the phasing out of widow's pension B and cutting off sole parents from the widow's pension or supporting parents benefit when their youngest child turned 16. The Department of Finance had wanted to lower the threshold to when the youngest child was 10. The activation of single parents into the workforce uh, through various forms of workfare has, is often described as a key characteristic of neoliberal policy regimes. In the case of single parent payments, this direction was taken much further by the Howard and Gillard governments before being wound back by the Albanese government. While there was a continuing focus on violence against women, by the late 1980s, feminist policy actors were justifying such expenditure by commissioning the cost of the problem to the economy. Australia did the way in this respect of presenting a business case for programs against domestic violence, followed closely by Canada. The use of a business case to justify spending on programs on violence against women indeed became standard, with consultants used to calculate the manifold direct and indirect costs estimated by Access Economics at $8 billion a year by 2004. Um, and of course, there have been more recent uh, studies of this kind published in the last two years. This kind of business case was already being applied by feminist actors to justify spending on childcare. One good example was the response to the savage assault on childcare expenditure mounted by Finance Minister Peter Walsh, which resulted inter alia in the amendment of the Child Care Act to save money 
by removing the requirement for employment of trained childcare workers. Mari Coleman in the Department of Community Services and Health commissioned a paper from the Centre for Economic Policy Research at the ANU that estimated in 1987 that taxpayers received a net gain from current Commonwealth expenditure on childcare because of the additional tax revenue, savings on the dependent spouse rebate and savings on social security that the expenditure made possible. The employment of such economic discourses by feminist policy activists may be extremely important in defending gender equality expenditure, given what has been called the evidence hierarchy in evidence-based policymaking. There is a downside, however, to adopting economising discourses in order to sell gender equality to decision makers. The focus on labour market participation may distract attention from subjects such as the recognition and valuing of non-market work and its more equal sharing. In the next section of the paper, which I won't go through here, um, I talk about the ups and downs of policy on uh, policy to support more equal sharing of non-market work, specifically ILO 156 on equal opportunities and equal treatment for men and women workers with family responsibilities. The Hawke government was elected in 1983 with a commitment to ratification of this convention and OSW immediately started to promote it. Um, with this not very successful poster. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, the, the Swedes had really shown how to promote this kind of sharing of care and household work. This is a wonderful Swedish weightlifter. This um, poster went up in the Metro in 1976 <laughs> to promote uh, uh, daddies taking up parental leave. Um, there were many delays in ratifying ILO 156, but after determined advocacy by fem Labour feminists, the Hawke government took a commitment to ILO 156 to um, the 1990 election again. Uh, the 1990 parental leave case uh, concluded soon after, um, and in principle, enabled the existing right to 12 months unpaid maternity leave to be shared with fathers who took on the role of primary carer. In other developments, a work and family unit was established in the industrial relations portfolio and OSW was funded to conduct the Sharing the Load community education campaign. It's notable that a similar campaign has been uh, run in India now since 2015. Uh, funded by a laundry detergent brand <laughs> and has won many uh, advertising awards internationally. However, the Australian Sharing the Load program was insufficient to achieve the more equal sharing of household and care work. Paid, paid parental leave remained out of reach for another 20 years and even when introduced was focused more on maintaining women's workforce attachment than on gender equality. Flexible work arrangements did become more available, but in practice were seen as something for women rather than for men. Women's increased participation in paid work was not balanced by a reduction in their share of unpaid work, which was still 70% according to the pilot time use survey conducted in 1987. Okay. One consequence of this work family strain was the increased levels of stress reported by women. It's notable that one of the gender equality indicators included in the Hawke government's national agenda for women was the consumption of analgesics. So this is perhaps a suitable note to end, in, end on. on. I'll just show you that Australia is finally catching up with Sweden 50 years later, <laughs> showing how to promote <laughs> The, the sharing of, of, of household and, and, and care work. But um, the Hawke government ended, I suppose, with an increased range of employment opportunities for women matched 
by unresolved problems relating to the care economy and gender-based violence. Thank you. very much, Mary, and it's now my pleasure to invite um, Professor Emeritus, Professor Meredith Edwards, who uh, is now at the Institute for Governance and Policy Analysis at the University of Canberra and was a senior public servant throughout the Hawke years, working on many areas of social policies including Ausstudy, HEX, child support and housing initiatives. And she went on to become, of course, a senior um, officer in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Carolyn and Frank, because I had a really good time up until now, having worked through the whole of the Hawk and indeed Keating era in the public service, as you just heard. I'll start by outlining a little how I was involved to give you a bit of a context into what I'm going to say. When Labor came to power in 1983 and Hawke announced that there would be an economic summit in April, I was seconded from academia to the Office of Status of Women in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet to work on papers for that summit. After the summit, I'd actually gave up academia for a while and joined the public service and worked on simplifying youth allowances, which eventuated in Ausstudy. And that was followed because I had a request at the beginning about this by time off at ANU for six months, where I researched issues relating to child support as well as financing higher education, which led me to join the Department of Social Security to advise on child support policy before becoming head of the Social Policy Division for four years. I was also, while in that job, uh, on the RAN committee that led to Hex. And toward the end of the Hawke period, I became director of the National Housing Strategy in the Community Services and Health Department. So I'm going to draw on those policy development experiences uh, and point to three main themes. And that's the second and only other slide. Um, which will enable, I'm going to try and assess whether there, this was in fact a golden social policy era. So first, the importance of economic context. The Hawke government came into office with an ambitious economic and social agenda, but faced, as you've heard, a major budget deficit. So I found out that an understanding of the economic context was essential for any social policy reform in this period. So to be successful, social policies needed to explicitly link to economic reform strategies or show how they're going to lead to budget savings. Hawke in his policy speech before the 1993 election gave a lot of attention to youth issues, in particular to low school retention rates and high unemployment. And he argued that national productivity had to increase through improved education and training if Australia was to compete in the world economy. When Joe Dawkins was minister at assisting the prime minister on youth issues, he used a similar argument in relation to youth income support reforms, which he saw contributing to a more competitive economy. And becoming, so these are some examples of this tying of economic and social policy together. After becoming Minister for Social Security, Brian Howe soon realised that a high priority had to be given to low-income families with children and especially to the issues of child poverty after a very serious decline in the real value, as he said, of child payments. Hawke made it clear to Howe at the outset that the pressure was on the government to reduce the growth of expenditure rather than to add to it. So Hawke's great, sorry, Howe's greatest challenge was to pursue reforms to alleviate child poverty in a period of fiscal restraint. Howe's strategy, I quote, was to ensure that the least harm was caused by expenditure reductions while seeking to make room for policy initiatives. The 1987 budget brought in a families package designed to improve income adequacy for low-income families. The key component was the Family Allowance Supplement, FAS, Hence Hawke's misstatement that no child will, he should have said, need 
be living in poverty. Importantly, as the family's package to address child poverty was being developed, uh, so was the child support scheme. Child support was an innovative policy, like X, the first in the world, uh, because it relied on the tax office to assess, collect and enforce payments from the non-custodial parent. Despite its complexity, it succeeded in getting ministerial support because, unlike some US state schemes at the time, it benefited sole parents as well as being a revenue-raising measure. As Howe put it, I quote, child support was the hard stuff to counter the soft stuff, the family allowance supplement. This was the way to get through to Keating and Walsh. That's how it's quote. Its ability was to deliver savings which eased the fiscal and political path of the family allowance supplement. Influenced by the OECD, Howe moved social security policy away from incremental increases in payments towards a more active labour market strategy of employment and training initiatives, initiatives that addressed the transition to work for more disadvantaged people making them more competitive in the labour market, sole parents, people with disabilities and the unemployed. And Dawkins also saw HECS in an economic context, contributing to Australia's economic performance and international competitiveness. There was a need for um, more higher education places that needed to be funded without adversely affecting access, and hence the innovative policy that Bruce is so well known for, HECS. Um, so reliance, the second theme that I have is reliance on reviews and evidence. It's probably no surprise that a cabinet with three Rhodes Scholars and three quarters with university degrees would want to seek a research basis for the policies they pursued, and that certainly was the case. Heavy use was made of international evidence to, uh, to put Australia's performance in perspective. For example, one of the first actions of the Hawke government was to invite the OECD to come to Australia to review and advise on existing programs for young people and which led to the establishment of the Office of Youth Affairs. Later, child support policy development relied heavily on overseas data, uh, particularly in working out what the child support or formula should be. An innovative program for sole parents, jobs, education and training, JET, was a derivative of the education and training, ET, program in Massachusetts. And the RAND Committee report that led to HECS devoted a chapter to summarising practice, practices in several countries. Crucial to many social policies emerging in this period was the result of comprehensive review processes. Maybe Albanese's got that idea as well. The most notable being the Social Security Review, led by Professor Bettina Cass. Numerous research and discussion papers were the backbone of the many, many social policy reforms of this period. How used a similar review process for the national housing strategy and for the national health strategy, both started towards the end of the Hawke Prime Ministership. So um, onto the engagement of outsiders as my third main theme, related to the policy research focus was the engagement of outsiders informally, as well as formally on advisory committees at conferences and as individual experts. There was regular interaction between public servants and academics. I, did, I as an academic, interacted a lot with people like Andrew Podger uh, and also with business and union leaders and other lobbyists, and more broadly, those potentially affected by government decisions. Many trusting relationships developed across sectors, particularly, particularly from the public service to academia. The Social Security Review was innovative in that it situated a well-respected well academic patina, Cass, inside the Department of Social Security to work alongside social policy experts, a model not much used then in Australia. And there are many other examples I've witnessed of experts coming into the bureaucracy for a short time as lawyers to assist on child support policy, academic economists like Bruce Chapman to help the RAND Committee, and Judy Yates, who worked on the National Housing Strategy. The Social Welfare Policy Secretariat at the University of New South Wales was a big player in assisting the policy process, as was the Australian Institute of Family Studies. The ACTU and ACOS were on the whole great allies of the social policy agenda of the time, especially the families package. And we were fortunate in this period to have journalists like Michelle, with specialist knowledge, who closely followed our policy work 
and who we tried to keep on side. And largely, I think we did. Public consultations were regularly part of the policy process. It's to be noted that Hawke himself became personally involved in his attempt to relate closely to young people in International Youth Year. And before he put out this priority one statement for that year, uh, he held wide ranging consultations, including a phone in hotline with young people. He encouraged them to give him ideas uh, to tackle their concerns. So was this a golden era of social policy? So there may be some golden threads here. The outcome across some of, or many of those social policies speak for themselves and deserve a gold star. There is a doubling in the school retention rates in the Hawke period to which our study contributed. The families package may not have eliminated all of child poverty, but it dramatically increased the incomes of low income families with over a million children being brought, brought above the poverty line by 1990. Before the child support scheme was introduced, only 30% of sole parents received payments from the other parent, but 10 years later, that was 70%. And by 1990, revenue had already offset the scheme's administrative costs even before it was fully implemented. By the end of the Hawke period, student contributions through uh, fees and, uh, and tax were significant and evaluation showed no significant adverse impact on enrolment for this period. And finally, by 1990, employment had increased by 26% and unemployment declined from around 10% to 5.6%. The next few years, unfortunately, would reverse that. A contributing factor to these successes was, in my view, the common use of comprehensive policy processes. As I've written elsewhere, this was a period of a good alignment of policies, politics, processes and people. As we've heard today, leadership was strong and courageous. Um, Hawke's exceptional ability to communicate and negotiate with his emphasis on consensus really paid off. Treasurer Keating was just not just a good communicator, as we've heard, a great storyteller who, who brought the public along, educating them along the way. And together, Keating, Keating and Hawke made tough decisions which demonstrated, I wish we could see it today, political courage to stay the course. And on, in their case, it was on economic restructuring. Many other ministers were also strong-minded and courageous. The ministers I worked with were heavily involved in reform processes. They were astute, determined reformers, sophisticated in the use of processes, encouraged innovative ideas, uh, and ran hard with their policy proposals. However, the above record of achievement was significantly marred by the fallout from the excesses flowing from opening up the economy a fast rate of deregulation and related microeconomic reforms manifesting in the economic recession Keating said we had to have. This was a big black mark on the Hawke Keating reign. The consequences, the consequences, the social ones I'm talking about, which were seen for many years to come. Having achieved such a high employment growth rate toward the 90, end of the 1980s, unemployment was back at 10% by the end of 1991 and still rising with a sharp rise in long-term unemployment. Older workers were particularly badly hit, but so were young entrants to the labour market. And there's not been, there wasn't enough action early enough to bring in necessary labour market programs for these vulnerable groups. Overall, the biggest deficiency that I perceived was the dominance of the economic agenda over the social policy one, which meant there was insufficient attention paid to the full social implications of the economic change. There was a great retreat from universalism towards targeting of income support payments, such as family payments and youth unemployment benefits, understandable in a fiscally restrained uh, environment, which had its downsides, however, especially discouraging labour market participation. Yet there were strange anomalies, such as the retention of the dependent spouse rebate, which went to tax paying husbands regardless of income, even those without children. There was a redistribution of income in this period away from low to middle income taxpayers, which Anne Harding called the suffering middle. And the economic policy dominance over social policy meant that some courageous reforms, like some form of wealth tax, hello, I still haven't got it, was held back. Throughout Hawke's leadership, the strong tide of economic reforms was countered with the accord and other worthwhile social policy reforms in what was a remarkable period of reform. But the, at best, you could argue the government held the line 
in the face of dramatic change in the decade. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's now my pleasure to invite Andrew Podger, who's an honorary professor of public policy in the Research School of Social Sciences at ANU, and was a former public servant during the Hawke years, where he worked mostly in the Department of Finance, initially heading the Social Welfare Branch and later the Education and Employment Division. Thank you, David, and thank you to the organisers of this fascinating day we've had. Uh, can I start by just a comment about Bill Hayden? Uh, we had that at the very beginning, and I'd like to make a comment again at the very end, uh, because he was such a major player uh, in preparing the Hawke government. Uh, I had the privilege of being the Social Welfare Commission when he was the minister, and uh, it was always a, a pleasure to work with him, even though he was the architect for getting rid of the commission. Uh, but uh, his role in that 1982 period uh, was enormously, well, 1981, 1982 period was enormously important. Let me see. What's the best way to do this? Just this one? Uh, okay. Um, I'm talking about the, the policy processes uh, and, and the lessons from the Whitlam government uh, Gareth Evans was particularly involved in the 1982 Labor and Quality of Government paper. Uh, it set a scene for the, the management, including the size of cabinet, having an outer ministry and an inner ministry, the use of committees of cabinet, the links between cabinet and caucus. But there was also the collective response was helped by Hawke's own personal style of chairing. He was chairman of the board. He wasn't the central driver, though, as others have said, he kept up, up with in, enormous detail. He was a very good listener. Uh, my anecdote about Hereford was, uh, you got to remember, I'm a finance officer. I'm there trying to keep the spending down. And uh, Hereford had come forward with this proposal to spend a lot of money uh, on public housing, to give money to the states for public housing uh, when it was getting towards the end of the financial year. And he wanted to give this lump of money. And I presented these, these numbers to the ERC that the states hadn't spent the money they've already got. Why would you give them more? They're just going to put it in the bank and use it for whatever else they want to do, not for public housing. And uh, the uh, Hereford and his advisors said, oh, those numbers must be wrong. And I was able to say, well, even if they're wrong by 50%, they've still got this money that they haven't spent and they're not going to be able to spend it by the 30th of June. Why would you spend this money? And I was sitting there feeling very pleased with myself and thought we'd have sorted it all out and waiting for the ERC to decide that Hereford should go away and lose this thing. And... Hawk turned to Hereford and just said, uh, well, you've heard this, mate. Uh, I think it's now time for you to go away and think about it. And you can come back next week with a somewhat revised proposal. But you've heard the debate. We won't make a decision now. I was furious. But that was typical of his approach. And with hindsight, I could see how good that approach was and how it made that ERC work very well. Others have said about the quality of the Cabinet, about individually strong but they're collectively balanced with an interesting range of skills around the table, other than only having one woman there. But in many other respects, you can't imagine a, a cabinet today having such a range of people with such a range of backgrounds, farmer, doctor, all these other things. I mentioned earlier the role of the centre-left. I think it was enormously important. Hayden, of course, had led that, but you had people like Joe Dawkins, uh, Walsh, a whole range of them were the centre-left, and I think that they were a very major moderating influence for the government. Other process, the machinery of government. The 83 First Minister, First Ministry, nearly every ministry, minister had a, had a, uh, had a department. Uh, uh, sorry, they all had departments, but 15 were in Cabinet, and the Cabinet included nearly all the major departments. But you, because you had every minister had a department, you had a very large number of departments. Uh, interestingly, health wasn't in the cabinet originally with Blewett, so it came in the second ministry. Uh, and indeed, originally finance wasn't even there, but they were called to every meeting. So Joe Dawkins quickly persuaded them that he ought to be there on an ongoing basis. 
By the time we got to the third ministry, this was after the 1987 changes. This was a huge change. We mentioned earlier that uh, Mike Codd was a key player in this, uh, but it was an enormous one which has remained. The introduction of portfolios. So every portfolio had a portfolio minister who was in the cabinet. There were a couple of, like BFAT had two, uh, but it meant that cabinet therefore covered everything. But the portfolio would have a portfolio department and then would have some assistant ministers or parliamentary secretaries to, assert, to, to help them. So it allowed all departments to be represented in the cabinet without adding to its size, it was 17 cabinet ministers, but allowed more business still to be left to the portfolio ministerial team. So it reduced the work of the, of the, uh, the cabinet. It was also hoped to, in, to, to lead more stable uh, machinery government arrangements, uh, which was true for a while, uh, and, but that's been lost uh, quite a lot more recently. The next thing about the process is about the fiscal discipline, uh, strength and role of the forward estimates that was brought in in the first term. Uh, there was a big debate between Treasury and Finance about publishing them, and Dawkins was very keen on publishing, and with the Finance Department support, Treasury resisted it. The government decided to publish enormous in influence of, of publishing, not only on the government process, but on anybody else, the opposition or anybody else putting up proposals were required to say, well, what would this do with the forward estimates? So it's a discipline on the overall public debate. There was a strengthened role of the Ministry of Finance. The finance had come out of the split with Treasury by, under the Fraser government, uh, drawing on the Canadian experience. It was proving to be a very successful split, but the Hawke government made a lot more use of finance and, and the using with finance having briefs on all proposals that came forward uh, to ERC. And the role of ERC was mentioned earlier as being a very dominant uh, part of the system. And the finance also had full control of the estimates. So while the departments were putting views on the assessments, in the end, the finance department. So it was a very disciplined approach. The ERC practice, there was, the authority of ERC was also assisted by not just having the economic ministers. There were always a couple of other line ministers which uh, did uh, uh, soften the, the arrangement. Uh, Willis in, in the early days and Howe in the later days was an important part of making it credible and accepted by the caucus. Uh, the spending ministers were nonetheless expected to offer savings or they didn't have credibility. So this was a pretty tough line. Uh, my anecdote about Susan Ryan was an amazing meeting that I was on um, where Joe Dawkins had put forward proposals to mean set Aboriginal student allowances. The proposals he had were actually pretty stupid, and we in the finance thought, look, they're unmanageable. And in the in the ERC meeting, Susan Ryan turned around and said, how, I won't use the words, terrible they were and how are they a waste of everybody's time and shouldn't be put there. Dawkins turned around and said, well, I wouldn't put forward such proposals if you came up with anything to give us the savings you know, if you came up with things for savings well then we wouldn't come up with these silly proposals it was an interesting example of the expectation of a tough arrangement there was also the introduction of the program budgeting framework it wasn't a pure program budgeting framework but there was a process introduced in that early 80s period uh, of the articulation of program objectives having measures of performance and having more systematic evaluation. The systematic evaluation was strengthened in the 19, early 1990s, but it came in during that 80s period. There was a trilogy mentioned that uh, arrangement that uh, Marion referred to. Uh, I, I can understand the criticism of it, but I also think it was an important part of the economic and budgetary discipline at the time. Uh, the portfolio framework in post-1987 brought in a new budgeting arrangement around the portfolio budgeting. Uh, it also required this full genuine offsets for all new policy proposals. It had a big weakness in that it did each portfolio on its own and you couldn't look as easily across the, the, the whole process. There was systemic evaluation process, as I said, came primarily in the uh, late 80s and then in early 1990s. And the performance budgeting framework that came in with a portfolio arrangement. So every budget, you had a portfolio budget statement with either the programs or the money or the objectives or the targets. And then you had later on annual reports on the results achieved. It was quite a disciplined 
approach around that. There are a whole lot of public service reforms also which were important as part of the arrangement. The Minister for Finance was also the Minister assisting the P on public services. It's interesting that that's what the Albanese government's now got as well. Uh, Dawkins was made a great use of that in those early days. Walsh a little bit, but not so much. But Dawkins in particular made a great deal of having the finance and the public servicing together. There was clarification of minister-secretary relationships. I should say that Gareth Evans' paper actually uh, advocated a politicisation of the SES, that there were going to be a certain percentage of the SES would be political appointments. Fortunately, uh, with some careful consideration, he drew back from that and you had the ministerial advisor system and the MOPS Act for a regulatory arrangement around that, which I think was a much better, though it was uh, it now probably needs a, a major rethink. Uh, the public service and financial management reforms were closely linked. There was a financial management improvement program. There was a lot of devolution of financial and HR controls and the emphasis on management for results was going on in that. There was also work on the clarification of structures and accountability. You had the 1986 Walsh rules, which set up the accountability arrangements for GPE, which were linked to company rules. So you had uh, shareholder ministers uh, and boards, which would be held accountable the way a company would do it. That paper also gave a preference for ministerial departments over statutory authorities uh, to retain responsibility for tax funded services. But statutory authorities was also made clear that they were accountable still through the system of ministerial responsibility. The 1987 restructuring abolished the Public Service Board, further strengthened finance and PMC. They got some powers out of the old board, and you got this portfolio departments and secretaries coming through. Um, Meredith mentioned use of external expertise, Hawke's consensus approach. Uh, also, the 83 summit, the tax summit arrangement as well. Uh, there was a mention earlier also on that um, by Craig M Emerson about the, the debate between options A, B and C. Uh, interestingly, the, the public perception is that it was all a political debate that the ACTU came in. The facts are there was a huge debate within the government between interestingly, between Walsh and Finance and Treasury and Keating, as well as Howe and, and Social Security being opposed to option C. Uh, so it was a big debate going on. Uh, the government used controlled use of inquiries. Merit's right about lots of inquiries, but they're often led by an external expert with known sympathy towards the government. They felt some uh, confidence what we're going to get they were, they were willing to live with. So it wasn't just go for somebody who's an expert, there was a sense of control around it. Um, sometimes led by the public service. I was involved in the museum's review, which didn't go down particularly well with a lot of people, uh, led by finance. But I won't go to the story on that. We can, if it comes up in questions, we can do that. Um, there were tripartite negotiations for restructuring reforms. So a lot of the process of open engagement for, for the reforms. Um, but there was also continuing influence a lot of the previous major inquiries that still had a big influence on the policies of the time. And the ones that I can think of here are Asprey, Campbell, Public Service on Coombs, but even the Henderson Poverty Inquiry was still quite an influence. People talked about people under the poverty line. It was the Henderson Poverty Line that was being used. What were the underlying ideas and the philosophies behind this? There was liberal economics. I mentioned here Castle's 1984 ANSAS lecture uh, which we published a couple of years ago, again, because it hadn't been properly published before. This was a lecture based on looking at uh, 18th and 19th century liberal econo economists who were being portrayed by both the left and the right as being terribly conservative, the right saying, and rightly so, and the left saying, we mustn't go there. And, and Castles was demonstrating how, in fact, these were the radicals of their day and using economics properly could be used for social ends, good social ends. And I think that's what the message he was trying to convey. And I think behind the scenes, that sort of thing was lying behind a lot of the, the thinking of the, the Hawke government. The, the floating of the dollar, the free trade loans are very classic uh, liberal economic lines and the increasing use of competition even within government. Another area of social idea, ideas and philosophies is social equity and the mixed economy. It wasn't rolling back the state, 
there was a view that we could have equity and efficiency, and we had a whole series of equity measures coming, coming through. On federal relations, there was continued expansion of the Commonwealth influence, less aggressive than the Whitlam era, a bit more shared responsibilities. But of course, the, one of the contributors to Hawke's downfall with Keating was Keating used his uh, more cooperative approach on federalism as a bit of a stick, saying we should have a stronger Commonwealth government. So what are the legacies? Well, I think the legacies are that a cabinet process works, that you have full coverage of government in cabinet, but a manageable size. And I think that has still remained even right through to, to now. Uh, perhaps the current cabinet's a bit big, but the idea is a, is a good one and was introduced by the Hawke government. Uh, and that the cabinet works had authority while still retaining the confidence of the parliamentary party, the caucus. So the, the, who's on in the cabinet and the way they operate doesn't lead to major arguments with the rest of the party. Another legacy is budget process control, the use of the forward estimates of aggregate controls, the role of ERC and the finance department as has continued through to this day. The portfolio framework is based, for machinery government is basically still there. The strength and role for ministers and ministerial staff, that's certainly still there. Uh, external engagement, we'll come back to that a bit and the importance of liberal economics of growing the pie as well as redistributing it. But there is probably some unintended consequences which we need to acknowledge. The shift from economic liberalism to broader what Mar Marion calls neoliberalism, I don't like the term because it's just used as a pejorative, but a sense that some things were taken too far. The public choice distrust of government institutions was something that happened after Hawke, but it was uh, built on some of these economic liberal ideas. And a willingness to accept efficiency and equity trade-offs, so we're losing sense of the importance of equity by efficiency being given too much emphasis. So there's a failure to recognise the downsides of some of the reform approaches. As I say, efficiency at times at the expense of resilience and careful ethical processes, over-reliance on regulation of emerging markets for public services, and inappropriate, that is, we, we give it to markets and we assume that regulation will work, but some of them doesn't work all that well. And the inappropriateness of some private sector managerialist measures we've seen in the public sector. Arguably, there's also been excessive parsimony and reliance on, on this portfolio process. We've had constant efficiency dividends, increasing focus on compliance measures for savings. Robo-debt, in part, was uh, around this continued pressure and forcing departments to find compliance measures and they've been doing it for decades but at some point it was going to come badly unstuck uh, and the, this portfolio arrangement had these problems of, of failing to look at cross portfolio issues as well as they should and shall I say about the, the family allowances one that Meredith talked about uh, I still think that that portfolio approach requiring the social security department to have a choice between do we have indexation of age pensions or do you have universal family allowances was an unfair request. It should have been much more broadly thought of as family allowances, universal being part of the tax system, but the system we're looking at portfolio only got that badly wrong in my view. I'll leave it there. Oh, sorry, sorry, I, I did have it. Can I? I've lost it now. May I please do a couple more? From right down here, right down to the second last one. So I was going off my 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 printer version, not the the one up here. That one's this one. I went. What's that one there? Go right back. That's still not come up. <laughs> Look, I'll I'll talk to them. I, the the other uh, unintended consequences, I think that the politicisation of the APS was not a big issue in the uh, Hawke days, but some of the framework of setting up the ministerial staff and a whole range of other things has since been built upon 
ministerial staff are way bigger than they ever were in the Hawke days. They're not nearly as much reliant on the public service. Uh, you've got much more control of polit political control of communications, a whole range of things which have, over time, built on what happened in the Hawke years and gone much further than they should have. Uh, the beginning of moves to reduce tenure of, of, of departmental secretaries, uh, diluting merit-based processes began at the in, in the in the in more under the Keating than Howard than uh, Hawke government. An extensive externalisation, while it was a good idea to have the external, we've gone way too far on that and it's caused big problems with consultancies and contractors. So my conclusion is overall there were good processes and they contributed greatly to good policy. The key process reforms have largely been sustained. Uh, though there have been some backtracking on cabinet and portfolio structures. With hindsight, some facilitated later regressive moves, and there is now a requirement for a major correction for this government, I think, to rebalance government, market and civil society, to rebalance, rebalance politics and administration and reinvest in the public sector, essentially to return to the better balance that existed in the Hawke years. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I now invite questions and comments. Henry, you spoke about the excellent cabinet. Can you just tell me, because I've forgotten, when Hawk came in, did they still have caucus ballot for the selection of cabinet or the ministry? Yeah, or, or it was just the traditional Labor way of... It was only Rudd who interfered with that. Where, Yeah, so they... In Labor, um, the caucus elects, uh, the, if you like, the ministers, um, and then the allocations are done by the Prime Minister. So, under Rudd. Yeah, Rudd, Rudd insisted on making all the appointments himself, as I understand it. Yeah. I mean, one thing I was going to ask, um, well, perhaps relevant to any of the speakers in that session. I mean, it's very interesting that the, the left is an incredibly weak position in, in the ministry, well, certainly in the cabinet in the early years, aren't they? I mean, um, there was only Stuart West in the cabinet. And then, of course, he he um, he resigned too. I mean, he kept his ministry uh, of immigration, but he resigned from cabinet over uranium in, in, in 83, 83, I think. And I wonder what the, I mean, did it matter? I suppose maybe it's for Meredith because when I mean, you were talking about Brian Howe, um, who, I don't know, when does he go into cabinet? Is it about 87 or something? I mean, he's a minister, but he's not actually in cabinet during that period. Does it actually affect the, the way in which there. these, yeah, sorry. He was there in 1984. In cabinet? Oh, in cabinet. <laughs> Yeah, he was he, he was there for what so from uh, basically early eighty five essentially would that be right or or was it later than that? Well, he had defence support, on, so was he, yes. Oh. But eighty five did he go? It must have been eighty five. I haven't got. I can't tell you exactly. But I was working with him toward the end of nineteen eighty five. Mm. So he's a minister, um, but not not lot, but like. You know, Blewett, for instance, in 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 uh, that early period, he's not a member of cabinet, is he? He's not not actually a part of the the cabinet. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Expression neoliberalism. I'll say, patronize. <laughs> 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 that, 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 that's really wrong. Uh, he, what is it? Uh, it, it was an issue. He was, he's 
extremely concerned for the for the poor. I mean, genuinely concerned for the poor. Uh, yes, he had his particular prejudices in things. I've got no doubt about that. But uh, you wouldn't see in any of the things that he was putting, trying to take money away from pensioners or beneficiaries, he would have supported all of that. He would have supported all the stuff on sole parents. All of that would have been very much a Walsh line. It was not a Thatcherite, but he was certainly, uh, I think, partly from his farmer background, small business type background was very strong on on free markets and so on well in parts of language the um i think the difference um so it said almost nothing about state government. In fact, there's four uh, state Labor governments sitting there, except Burke, I suppose, in relation to the Aboriginal issue. But, you know, there's a long tradition, obviously, of support for free trade from Western <laughs> Western Australian um, politicians. And, and I, you know, I wonder to what extent Peter Walsh comes out of that kind of tradition too. Um, yeah. Well, indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Down on middle class law, but yes, he was yes. a student. So, interestingly, he was a daughter of a universal family house, mm. but he decided that he couldn't win the battle and the, 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 the budget was more important than the family house. He told me quite correctly mm. he would have preferred to keep a universal family house. Mm. But in the division of dry and moist, virtual moist, and national living, where did he put it? I'll probably give a, a tip to the first and the last and leave saying you need to define the second one more carefully. Mm. Right, and he uh, he took a, an electorally pragmatic position, as I think someone pointed out, on the on option C. I mean, he he was very hostile to a consumption tax. Yeah. 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 Mm. Dennis. What was the budget for a severe offence? I have a blissful memory of Hayden giving away hundreds of millions of dollars in the aid program and paid it by a couple of senior taxpayer personal savings personnel. Eventually, they paid him, put his hand on, I don't know more, he's kind of spoken to Steve Ross with him to this point, but I'm not giving him any more until he gets some from the company that's shooting the Republic. Is that the number five budget? Sorry? The 87 one was the number five. 87 was the number five. Was it? We had a second round budget, which went right through the budget. Well, it'd be 86 then, I guess, 86. They had a second budget, and the second budget, every minister had to come up and make it all those things. Mm -hmm. as, as we then did the following year. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Time for a final question by anyone? So, Andrew, to what, um, to what extent do you think all those processes that the Hawke government put in place, processes of government and financial rectitude, um, were a response to the lingering legacy and the, and the shadow of the Whitlam government? Should wind up. I think we'll leave with that last question. Yeah. We'll thank the three speakers very much for our uh, talk. <laughs>